Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Highlander's Pirate Lass by Heather McCollum, narrated by Timothy Campbell. Chapter 1 27 June, 1547 At Inmore Isle, in the Sound of Jura, Scotland. Do you need help, lass? Beck Macquarie yelled as he cupped his hands around his mouth. He held his arm up to block the sting of the sideways gusting rain and stared up at the woman standing above him on a storm-swept rock jutting out into the sea. Waves shot upward on the far side behind her. The wind threw her long hair into violent disarray, hiding her face, tendrils lifting into the air like Medusa's snakes. She looks like a witch, Rabbi MacDougall yelled into Beck's ear, and backed up to stand near the rowboat that tossed in the wild surf, pummeling the small, usually deserted isle. Beck did not take his eyes off the mysterious woman who had waved desperately to him as he watched from the deck of the Calypso, his three-masted Carrick ship. Despite the incoming storm, he'd ordered the sails lowered and dropped the rowing boat into the choppy sea. If it had been any later in the day, without the muted daylight, he would have sailed right past the one square mile island on his way home to Wolf Isle. Lightning split the sky, making Beck's brother Drosten curse. Help me get the boat up the beach, Drosten yelled over the thunder. He was right, there was no rowing back out to Beck's ship in this tempest. Bewitched isle or not, the three of them were stuck here until the storm blew out. Beck helped drag the boat higher, where his brother tied the thick rope around a tree at the top of the beach. Where'd she go? Rabbi asked, and Beck's gaze swung past the swaying trees to the empty rock ledge. Bloody hell, he murmured. Had she been swept out to sea? There, Drosten pointed toward the trees farther up the rise. The woman stood in the shelter they offered. She wore a long blue gown that rainwater moulded to her body. Her hair fell to just past her shoulders, framing a serious face. She could be a bloody siren, Rabbi said, or a Kelpie come to steal our souls. Beck marched forward. Then you can stay out here. His father's old friend cursed and trudged forward to follow. The woman studied them as they drew closer, passing judgment. High cheekbones sat in an oval face, and her full lips parted as she breathed in the sea air swirling around them, as if she were part of the elements. Mettez-vous français? she called out, and lifted a sword in her hand. Damn, Drosten said. She's French. The woman's gaze went from Beck to Drosten. You are Scots, she called out her accent scrubbed clean of every hint of French. I Beck replied against the wind. Turning, she beckoned him to follow, and he marched up the shifting rocks to the stable tree line. She could still be French, Rabbi said, leading us into a trap. Drosten's voice was heavy with frustration. If you're frightened of everything, you shouldn't have left Wolf Isle. Tis getting too crowded there, Rabbi said, making Beck snort. His home, Wolf Isle, had two inhabited dwellings for abandoned children and desperate lasses. No one lived permanently in the village, and their clan castle was occupied by his brothers and his eldest brother's wife and bairn. Besides that, no one else lived there. No one yet dared. Not with a curse that threatened their clan. Maybe we should leave you here with the mermaidens, then, Drosten said. The woman stopped to make sure they were still behind her. She continued to hold her basket-hilt sword, did she know how to use it? His sister-in-law Lark certainly knew how to throw a dagger. Bright green summer grass spread out under the pelting drops before them as they crossed a meadow where rain-heavy wildflowers bent over. Ahead stood an old stone chapel, alone and abandoned. Its glass window panes were broken out, and half the roof lay toppled with grass growing on the half still aloft. The lass ducked inside the open door. Beck drew his long dirk, stepping up to the doorway. With a missing roof, light filtered inside as he followed cautiously. She stood in the middle of the dry side of the room, which held a table, two trunks, and a fairly large bed. They're Scots, she called out. Her strong voice held a musical quality. Maybe you are a siren. Out from the corners came three children, the oldest being almost a man, and the youngest little more than a bairn held in the arms of another woman. The middle child was a lass of about eight years. "'Are you a pirate?' the lad asked, his hair falling into his eyes, making him blink over his scowl. He also held a sword. "'Eh?' Beck answered. 
Jostin and Rabbi stepped inside behind him, and the two children backed up. What are you, then? asked the young girl. You have a ship. I'm a pirate hunter, Beck replied. They kept their frowns. Do you work for the English? the woman in blue asked. He met her stare steadily. I work for myself and my clan. The Macquarie clan of Wolf Isle, Jostin said, using the English version of the Norse name Dial. Tis also called Ulva Isle. She squinted her eyes. No men live on Wolf Isle, she said. They do now, Jostin replied. What do you know of our isle? She ignored him, looking to Beck. We request passage on your ship over to the Isle of Mull. I can pay. Her lips clamped closed. My price is high, he said. Her chin tilted upward, her free hand going to a medallion she wore on a chain around her lovely young neck. Tell me your price. Beck let his frown melt to a half grin. Your name. Rabbi snorted. He should have found out what she has in them trunks first, he raised his voice. And are ye a bastard? Hold your tongue, Jostin whispered. Her gaze remained on Beck. Eliza, she said. Do you have a family name? Hardly. She answered. How did you find yourself here? he asked. Is my answer part of the price of passage? He glanced at their meagre possessions. I need to know if I will be bringing criminals to Mull. Chief Tor McLean wouldn't appreciate it. Three children, an old woman, and a lass? she asked. Do we look like criminals? I am only two score, the woman holding the fair haired bairn said. She swayed gently as the little one clung to her neck, staring with wide eyes out from a bounty of blonde curls. The lad frowned fiercely. And I'm already thirteen years. The wind and rain blew in from the back of the structure, scattering a few old leaves. Your name and your circumstances, Beck said. That is the price, or we'll leave you here. Could she tell he was bluffing? She glared but gave a nod. My name is Eliza Wentworth. Her fingers rose to touch the medallion. We were taken from our ship and stranded here by pirates. I waved you down because we have run out of food and we cannot live on daisies, hares, and the few fish we managed to catch. She sheathed her sword but kept her hands open as if ready to pull a dagger. Will you take us to Mull? Pirates who let her keep her sword and trunks? Aye, Beck said, regardless of her circumstances he wasn't about to leave women and children to starve on a deserted isle. He'd be hardly better than the French pirate that he hunted. Eliza nodded. We are ready to leave the moment it is safe to row across. Frig, the boy cursed. I could swim out there right now, if you have food on board, lightning or not. How long have you been stuck here? Droston asked. Beck surveyed the rain-dampened and wind-blown shelter. The middle lass ran over to the wall where little lines were chiselled. She ran her fingers over them. Fifteen days. God's teeth, Rabbi said under his breath. They be nearly starving. We will wait for the storm to abate, Beck said pulling his leather satchel from his shoulder. He'd thrown in some rations of bannocks, cheese, and a bladder of ale for the three of them before they rode out, knowing they'd probably be staying the night. He walked over to the table, pulling out the provisions. Cheese! the little girl squealed, running over. And it isn't rancid, the older woman said. She nodded to Beck. Why, you Alice? Thank you. Beck uncorked the flask. Eliza motioned to a barrel that sat in the uncovered portion of the dwelling. We have water. There's whiskey, Rabbi said. The boy took it from Beck's hand, but Eliza walked up and swept it away. Tis only ale, Beck said. Water down ale. The rainwater is fine, Eliza said, handing it back to Beck. She looked to the boy. Eat something. The boy snatched up a bannock. The others gathered around the table, eating quickly. Even the bairn chewed the bannock without dropping a single crumb. Ye need to eat too, Beck said to Eliza. Her lips pressed inward and she looked like she would refuse. But then she walked over, checking to make sure everyone else had eaten before sampling some cheese. I am Pip, the middle girl said, smiling. She was missing two teeth in front that made her lisp. She had red, shoulder-length hair and freckles across her nose and cheeks. Beck smiled, his eyebrows raised. Your parents named you Pip? Tis my pirate name, she said, raising her chin. More fierce than Penelope. Beck looked to Eliza. Do you have a pirate name? Her gaze slid from Pip to meet his stare. No. She pointed at the boy. Anders? The boy tipped his head while chewing. And Alice is holding Hester. She is only two or three. And you're all one family? Jostin asked. 
Rabbi walked along the perimeter, heading as covertly as possible toward the trunks along the one wall. Alice met him there, wee Hester still against her neck, and plopped herself down on top of one of them, her gaze as sharp as a well-hewn pitach achlesh. I, Eliza said, Alice is my mother. Older sister, or a young aunt, Alice called out. And these are my children, Eliza met Drosten's gaze without wavering. Did you birth the lad when you were ten, then? Drosten asked. He's my nephew. Lies rolled easily from the lass's mouth, lies she did not even try to cover. They wouldn't get any real information from her except that they were stranded without food. Beck looked at Drosten and gave a little shake of his head. Night was falling quickly, and the wind still gusted. Hopefully this will blow off by morn. He shut the door to stop the breeze from blowing straight through. Let's start a fire so you can get dry. Eliza's hair had begun to curl in wisps around her face. It was shorter than that of most of the lasses he'd met, stopping just below her shoulders. He wondered how it moved in the breeze when rainwater wasn't weighing it down. Anders, Eliza said, and the boy leaped up as if she'd issued an order. He lifted the lid on one of the trunks and pulled out flint, a bit of wool, and some dry twigs. Beck sat at the table and took a drink from the ale before passing it to Droston. Three children and two women left with weapons in flint but little food. Can you help me, Alice, and Pip? Eliza shook out a blanket that had been folded inside one of the trunks. Alice handed Hester to the boy, who carried the toddler easily. He stuck his tongue out, making her giggle. Pip and Alice held sides of the blanket so Eliza could duck behind it. Her arms lifted over the edge, and it quickly became obvious that she was changing out of her soaked costume. He looked across at Drosten and Rabbi, who stared at the blanket, Rabbi with his mouth open. Ye too, Beck called, and their gazes snapped to the ceiling. When she stepped out, he forgot to inhale. She wore a burgundy gown of satin, with embellishments sewn into the bodice, which laced in front over her stays. The petticoat was long, as if it were made to lie over a set of full underskirts. Her hair hung about her shoulders in wild curls. It looked more golden as it dried. Her gaze slid about the room, landing on him. We have limited blankets, but this part of the chapel is dry, she said, and took the ban from Anders. Hester's eyes were already shut, and Alice waved Eliza over to lay the wee one into an open trunk, as if it were her cradle. Teeth, Pip, Eliza said. You too, Anders. The two groaned, but took up pieces of cloth and water from a bucket, rubbing their teeth. They had cloth, blankets, and buckets. What type of pirates accommodated their prisoners? The children moved about smoothly as if used to the routine of nightfall. Beck looked at Rostin. I will take the first watch. Eliza lowered herself onto the cobblestone floor, her back against the wall, and threw a blanket over her skirts. She clutched a dagger in one hand and let her eyes close. In the glow of the fire, her skin was smooth and golden, as if the sun had beaten down on her while she'd been marooned. Stop staring at me, she murmured, her eyes opening. Beck cleared his throat. A pirate left ye and the others here, marooning ye on this isle with rich dresses, he said, tapping his head to her ensemble. Weapons, flint, blankets. He trailed off, making the observation into a question. He said he would return for us. He had no reason to see us dead. Beck quietly picked up the chair he'd been sitting on and set it closer to her so they wouldn't be talking across the hushed room. The old wood creaked under his bulk. Yet he has left he to starve. She crossed her arms over her chest and he tried to ignore how her breasts swelled above the neckline. Like I said, she whispered, he planned to return. Her lips pinched tight, her voice dropping lower as if she didn't wish the children to hear. I can only think that something has happened to him or his ship for him to be so delayed. She looked distressed, even as she fought to hide it. A pirate left them here. Are you French? He frowned. The man who left you here wouldn't happen to be Captain Claude Chandot. Eliza's eyes snapped to his and she pushed back against the wall. She lifted the dagger, clutching it tightly. Do you know Chandot? She asked, pushing herself up the wall to stand. Her eyes glanced about as if assessing where the children were in relation to his men. She had the determined look of a cornered wolf that was prepared to fight to the death. Beck stood too. I'm hunting him. Claude Chandot had abducted his brother's wife two years ago. The bastard had planned to rape Lark and sell the other lasses he'd stolen. 
He was working for the French monarchy as a privateer, trying to find a place for the French army to land to invade England. But even if he had not found a French outpost in Scotland, he had found an income as a bloody pirate. It was the near loss of Adam's wife that had led Beck to build his ship, the Calypso, and learn to captain her. Beck met Eliza's assessing gaze. I would see him hang for his crimes, especially those against women and children. Eliza held his stare for a long moment, and then lowered her dagger. As would I, she whispered. She leaned against the wall. The wind seemed to ebb out of her sails, and he watched her slender neck as she swallowed. Eliza, he lowered his voice to the breath of a whisper. I shan't do harm to you. He harms everyone he comes across. Her lips pulled back slightly, showing little white teeth. Anger tightened Beck's muscles, his fists clenching. What has he done to you, Eliza? The thought of the bastard touching her wound his gut into a knot. Or harming Pip, or little Hester, or Anders. Raping Alice, too. Tell me, Beck said, his teeth clenched. The answer would decide how immediate and painful Jando's death would be once he found him. What has he done to ye? She stared back into his hard eyes, hers equally so. He killed everyone I loved. Chapter Two Mama, Papa, Peter, please, no. The sound of her mother weeping was etched into Eliza's mind like a wound that would never heal. Jandot had killed her parents, but not before he let his crew attack her mother. And Tyrell Wentworth was too old for him to sell, but not Eliza. She was only twelve, the perfect age to earn him gold. Her brother Peter was only three years old, forgotten on the deck as Jandot dragged Eliza off to his cabin. I would keep you pure, ma petite mademoiselle. You are safer in here with lustful sailors about. She'd lived two horrid weeks in that cabin, hiding in every crevice she could find. He escaped, Jandor, the Scotsman said. She looked into Beck Macquarie's eyes. They were dark in the dim light, hard and questioning. Aye. She opened her lips to say more, but then closed them. She knew nothing about this man, and Captain John's advice was very clear. Never trust a man, especially a sailor. Beck looked over at her sweet children, who she would rather see dead than end up in Jonto's cabin, waiting to be sold and used by vicious, lustful men. Even Anders could be in jeopardy, or just terrorized and killed. He helped them escape too, he asked. Giving him a portion of the truth would reassure the Scotsman that he should take them to the Isle of Mull, a place where Captain John could find them. I was rescued from Jondo ten years ago although my parents and brother were killed on his ship after being tortured. These children and Alice were rescued from various places and ships. Alice was rescued with me. Pip has been with me for two years. Anders three, and we just plucked Hester from the sea two months ago when we came across her ship foundering, torn apart by a storm. She was holding on to a piece of the gunwale. Who is the captain who saved you? Helped you save all of them? She hesitated, weighing the Scotsman. She needed to find Captain John and the crew, and it was obvious after two weeks on the isle that she would need help. Captain John Pritchett, she said. King Henry of England had died earlier that year, leaving his younger son Edward in charge of the country. The captain was a privateer for King Henry, and is awaiting word from the new king's regent, Admiral Seymour. He stared at her, but she merely looked back, directly into his eyes. She would not flinch. Why did he leave you here? Beck asked. Because he heard that Jean Doe is in the area, and Captain John has the guns to send the devil to hell. She glanced over at the children. Just in case. He left us here so Jean Doe could not take us. What if Jean Doe landed here? Beck asked. Then I would kill him, she said, turning to lie on her side. Or she would die trying. Your ship looked bigger from the isle, Anders said, as the heavily laden rowboat moved closer to Beck Macquarie's ship, anchored off the coast. Eliza and her family had managed to load all their important possessions into one trunk. Pip held Hester on top of it since there was no place for them to sit. Hester hid her face any time she was this close to the water, but Pip smiled as she lay half over top the little one, flat on the trunk. "'Tis a fast ship," Drosten said as he strained against the oars. Beck, Drosten and Rabby rowed. Hm, Anders said. "'Captain John's ship has four masts and forty guns.' Eliza kept her face to the wind where she sat in the back of the boat, her hair whipping behind her as they moved through and over the tossing waves. 
Alice looked green. Not Eliza. She loved the bob and flow and freedom of the sea. Being trapped on land for the last two weeks had nearly driven her mad. The Calypso is lighter and smaller because she didn't stay out at sea for more than a few weeks, Beck said, glancing over his shoulder at the boy. His muscles strained against his tunic, his shoulders wide and powerful. He had the build of a warrior. An intriguing scar sat near his hairline on his forehead. His nose had a slight bump, as if it had been broken but set well. A close-cropped beard gave him a roguish look, although she'd seen plenty of clean-shaven men who were true scoundrels. Beck Macquarie was handsome, brawny, and seemed to be kind. She did not trust him. We live most of the time on Wolf Isle, Beck said. Have you seen wolves there? Pip asked, but instead of looking frightened, she looked excited. I have a pack of wolf hounds, Beck said, but there have never been wolves on the isle since the Norsemen named it hundreds of years ago. Alva means wolf in the Norse language. Anders pointed, counting softly. Ten cannon portals, that's all? The Calypso has twenty-six cannons, Rostin said. Rabbi glanced at the boy, sweat across his forehead. And a fore and aft gun for chasing down our prey? The old man gave his fiercest look. Anders did not seem impressed. The devil's blood is forty-two guns. The devil's blood? Beck asked. Eliza could feel his gaze on her, but she continued to look out at the empty sea. Where the bloody hell was Captain John? Tis the name of our ship, Anders said, pride in his voice. Rather dark, Drosten said. Anders nodded. It scares off pirates. We're almost there, Hessie, Pip said, her arm snug over the little girl. Anders held his hand over her eyes. I see ship way out. Can you see its colours? Eliza asked, sitting taller. Anders was their spotter. He had the best vision of Captain John's crew, and wasn't afraid to climb high in the rigging to see for miles. He shook his head. Maybe John was finally coming back for them. The thought made her heart squeeze, and she glanced at the carrack before her. It looked recently built. A beautiful three-masted ship that was quick and armed. If I could steal it, John would be so proud of her. He'd probably let her keep it. But what were her chances of securing the carrick with only three children and Alice to help her? Intimidation would not work with Beck Macquarie. She would have to kill him and as many of his crew as she could. But he bloody hell just saved us. Damn conscience. Captain John said it was the worst thing for a pirate to possess, and the best thing for a man. The ship was free of rust and barnacles as they pulled up along its side. A rope ladder dropped, and a chain with a hook and wheel was lowered to raise the trunk. Hester and I will ride up on the trunk, Pip called. Tis easier than climbing a ladder with her. Beck looked to Eliza. Pip could swim, and Tester wasn't letting go. Let them, she said, and Beck signaled the sailor above to crank. Hold on, Hesse, Pip called. We're going for a ride. Anders climbed the ladder quickly, followed by Alice, who was exceedingly ready to be off the tossing boat. As Eliza climbed, she knew her skirts billowed, letting the three men below see most of her legs, but she'd already donned trues under them. Would they think that odd? An older man, who looked about Alice's age, helped Eliza climb over the rail. He was handsome, with an easy smile and widening eyes. Welcome to the Calypso, he said. I'm Gavin McLean. Eliza nodded and turned to inspect the ship. At the same time, it seemed the crew was inspecting her. Some wore sailing trues like Beck and his brothers, others wore the Scottish wool wrapped around their hips. Damn that! The sea required warmer stuff up here in the Atlantic. Bare legs and feet were more suited for the Caribbean. She turned away, grabbed her burgundy skirts, and traipsed across the deck, her head tipped upward. The rigging looked correct, the sails whole and new. Aye, the ship was young and untried. No black ash marked any of the planks, and there were no stitched holes in the sails. Your trunk has been placed in my cabin, Beck said behind her, making her pivot. She frowned, her mouth opening to protest. It is your cabin until we reach Alba, yours and your family's. Her mouth clamped shut, and she nodded. Thank you. Her arm went out toward the foregun. Have you even fired your cannons yet? Aye, but not at a ship. She slid her hand along the polished wood of a mast. A lot of care was put into building her, she said. Beck looked upward at the soaring masts and rigging, and she admired his strong jawline. I built her and have touched every part of her, he said, and dropped his gaze back to Eliza. I love her more than any person, he shrugged, except my brothers and Adam's family. 
Hmm, she said, walking to the rail to look out. Anders was right, there was a ship way in the distance. Even with a wind blowing behind it, the ship would take an hour or more to reach them. Captain, Beck turned his gaze to another sailor. There was a light at sea last night, another ship riding out the storm on the west side of the isle. We haven't seen it this morning. If it was Captain John, he would have come immediately to retrieve us, Eliza said. Last night or this morn. The sailor's gaze slid to her. She narrowed her eyes and he hurried away. Beck chuckled. They didn't know what to make of ye. She leaned over the rail. They shouldn't make anything of me. Beck leaned his back against a post alongside, studying her. So, Captain John Pritchard, privateer for King Henry. She straightened. What is your question, Scotsman? Privateers are pirates to other countries. If he sailed for England, he would be considered a pirate to the Scots. She raised an eyebrow, meeting his gaze. Will you arrest us, then? she asked. Two women and three children. Send us to the gallows. Before Beck could answer, Anders leaped onto the mast to scurry up high. I can get a better look above, he yelled, peering out toward the incoming ship. He shook his head, glancing down. I see blue, not red. Her eyes closed for a moment. It wasn't Captain John. Tis Colin Duffy, most likely, Gavin McLean said, chief of the MacDonalds of Isla Isle. Tis one of his ships patrolling for pirates along our coast. Bloody fucking hell, Anders yelled out. That ship isn't Scots he said, pointing toward the isle they had just vacated. Around the south side emerged a galleon flying a fleur de flag and a scarlet red one beneath it, meaning they took no prisoners, except the ones they would enslave or sell. It was the very ship that haunted her nightmares. Tis the Bureau, Anders yelled, and began to slide down the mast. The ship's name sliced through Eliza's middle. Damn his fetid soul. Jean Do, the devil who had killed her father and raped her mother before slitting her throat, and Peter. What had the pirate done to her three-year-old brother after Captain John rescued her? Neglect? Rape? Selling him at some port? Killing him too? Because I left him. The guilt twisted with the hate and fear inside her gut, a poison she could never bleed out, no matter how many children she rescued with Captain John. The Bureau, Beck said. The rest of the men ran to the other side of the ship to get a better view of the dark, scarred ship with its forty cannons and over fifty raping, stealing, gutting crewmen. She met Beck's eyes. It means executioner in French. Tis Jean d'Or. His stormy eyes narrowed, and he turned, yelling out orders. Make sure the cannons are fully loaded. Everyone to their stations. Lanterns ready to light the fuses. Drosten, he yelled, pointing to the helm. Can ye get us windward? Eliza held a piece of her hair up and let it drop. The wind blew it behind her. Damn, they were leeward side, giving Jean Do an advantage. Like he needed more. Not before that ship is upon us, Drosten yelled back. We will blast him anyway, Beck pointed at Gavin and several grim-looking men. All the weapons ye have. Eliza tore her eyes from Jean Do's approaching ship to stare at Beck. You aren't planning to fight him, are you? Beck walked away, yelling more orders, changing the sails to catch the wind to take them into a position to sail around the isle. He was still trying to get to the windward side. Eliza ran after him, grabbing his thick arm. You cannot beat him, Macquarie. He has forty cannons and fifty bloodthirsty men. Even if he wasn't flying his red flag, Shanta would kill you all. She tried to shake his arm, but it didn't move. And he will take the children, Alice and me. She shook her head. You must convince him not to attack. He leaned into her. That is Colin Duffy's ship out there. The two of us will catch him. She gritted her teeth. Not before Jondo sinks this ship. Your friend will not reach us in time. The Calypso is sturdy, he said, his hand sliding down the polished wood of a mast. Go with the children into the cabin, Beck said. I will stall him with cannon fire until Colin reaches us. Eliza let out a rough growl between her clamped teeth. Fool! He had little to no experience fighting a sea battle, and none with the likes of Claude Jandot. You are going to get us all killed. She stomped away. Anders, Pip, Alice, she yelled, and met them at the aft captain's cabin. Alice held Hester on her hip and they all filed inside. Pip ran to their trunk to tug out her sailing trues. The bureau is rounding the aisle, Eliza said, running over to the open trunk, her mother's brooch thumping against her chest. She pulled out her long wool and leather coat. Alice plucked the laces of Eliza's bodice so she could pull it off over her head. She yanked open her stays. They and her smock flew off quickly as she threw on her white tunic. 
There was no time to bind her breasts, but her jacket hid them well enough. Pip, take Hester and find an empty barrel that she can hold on to if you have to swim with her back to the aisle. Do not take the rowing boat or they will see you. Then hide. She turned to Anders. You go with them. She would rather see them dead than taken. But I can... I need you to care for them, Anders. Make sure they have food. Get them to mull. His lips closed tight and he nodded. She had told all the children about her time on the Bucho ten years ago. They knew the horrors that awaited them if taken. The horrors that her baby brother had to face while she hid away in Jondo's quarters. Stop it. Teeth gritted, Eliza forced her thoughts to the current situation. Otherwise, she would be paralysed with remorse and fear. She buttoned her jacket, tucking the brooch inside, and grabbed her crossbow and pitch-tipped arrows. Alice was already yanking a tunic over her own head. She grabbed the lantern while tucking the ends in her trues. Eliza's gaze locked with hers, and they both gave a small nod before tearing out of the cabin, Eliza jamming her floppy leather hat on her head. On deck, Beck was issuing orders while his brother yelled to the men working the sails. Men pulled ropes to turn the ship to try to position it to catch the sweep of wind, giving the Calypso some advantage over Jean d'Eau. But it would not be enough. I have to stop this. And she would. Even if that meant taking over the ship. Chapter 3 To wait for Cullen, or attack now. Beck watched the heavily gunned galleon sweep around the small isle, the wind filling its sails. After six months of patrolling the waters off the west coast of Scotland, Beck wouldn't let this chance of capturing the most notorious French pirate slip past him. If the bastard outgunned them, he would use some intimidation to slow him down, until Cullen could attack the bureau from the other side. Gavin, he yelled. Are the men ready? Gavin's mouth dropped open, frozen, as he gazed past Beck. Beck pivoted on his boot in time to see... Eliza? The woman wore sailor's clothing. No petticoats, but the breeches that she'd worn under her skirts. Tall boots hugged her shapely legs up past her knees. She wore a longish coat of wool and leather with an intricate braid trim, a white tunic, and a floppy hat over her hair. A crossbow swung by her side. She charged across the deck. Alice, who was also dressed in trues, hurrying behind her with a lantern. Holy Lord, Rabbi said next to him. Beck, Drosten yelled, pointing at Eliza, as if he hadn't seen her. Half his men had stopped to stare at the lass as she leaped up onto the forecastle at the bow of the ship. Eliza, he called. He caught up to her and Alice, where Eliza was climbing onto the rail, wrapping one of her legs in the line to steady herself. What are you doing? Alice pulled the long dagger from her belted scabbard, holding it before Beck so he couldn't advance on Eliza. Eliza swung around, pointing her knocked arrow directly at his chest. Taking over your bloody ship, Macquarie, so I can save it. Mochrach. He had a crew of twenty armed men, and she thought she could just take over his ship. First of all, I rescued ye from starving on that isle. And I'm showing my appreciation, she said, by preventing your certain death. Now give me space to do it, Macquarie. She met his gaze with a hard one of her own. In it he saw fury and fear. What had she been through at Jean Do's hands? I will shoot you if I must, she said. Beck, Drosten yelled, pointing to the pirate ship surging through the water with a wind. Jean Do's ship was gliding close enough that he could see the bastard standing along the rail, his beard regrown from when he'd shaved it as part of his disguise two years ago. Men, young and old, stood ready along the rails, each with a blade or a gun. Two cages were suspended over them, one with a skeleton tied upright inside, bits of sinew dried to the poor bastard's bones. The other cage held a more intact corpse, his body slumped over. The tangy whiff of death tinged the breeze, as Jean Do manoeuvred the bourreau into a position of attack, aiming his cannons along his gunwale at the calypso. Beck leaped past Alice to stand next to Eliza. The rail pressed against his shins to keep him from falling into the narrowing space between the ships. You almost tipped the lantern, Alice yelled. Burned the whole bloody ship down. You plan to take on the bureau with one crossbow? Beck asked. One lit with fire, Alice said, raising the lantern. It will do little damage on its own, he said, trying to remain calm. The woman thought she could take over his ship. The ship he'd spent a full year building. The ship he loved more than everything other than his family. Tis a warning shot, Eliza said. Granite hard determination in the set of her mouth showed no room for negotiation. I plan to frighten him away. Beck stared into her intense blue-grey eyes. 
First off, Chandot is not a coward, especially when faced with twenty fewer guns. Second, I want to capture him, not frighten him away. Beck reached toward her and felt the sting of a blade across the back of his hand. He looked down to see that she'd slid a dagger across it. Not deep, but blood swelled from it. Her warning shot to him. Crossbow along her side, she held the bloody dagger pointed at his throat. We are on the leeward side, she said, going against the wind in an attack. Whatever that ship is out there will not get here before Jando's heathens board to steal your ship, kill all the men, and take my children to sell or rape. Those swinging ropes along his side? Beck knew they were there. They are for sending at least half his fifty crewmen over here as soon as he's close enough. The swine will overrun us within minutes. Her eyes snapped with fury. Teeth clenched. She leaned slightly closer to him. I will not let that happen. You will have to kill me to get me down from here, because I would rather die than end up in the hands of that crew. He could grab her and lock her in his cabin, although he'd likely suffer more bloodletting. Damn it. She was right about Jean Dos stealing the children if he won against the Calypso. As much as Beck wanted to capture the French pirate, he wouldn't sacrifice children in the attempt. Beck inhaled through his nose. What's your plan? he said, and watched the slight lowering of her shoulders. Eliza turned outward. If you change your mind and try to put her down, Alice said from below, holding a six-inch dagger. I have no problem plunging this into your bollocks. He realised she was right at that height where he balanced on the forecastle rail. Understood, he replied. He whipped out a rag tied to his belt and wrapped it around his hand, pulling the knot tight with his teeth. Hold this, Eliza said, passing him her crossbow, the thick arrow tipped with pitch. What bloody else was in that trunk of hers? As the Bron slid through the waves to cross their path, and Jondot ordered the sails to be dropped, Eliza cupped her hands around her mouth. You dare show up in these waters, you friggin' weak-witted cur, Jondot, she called across. See that ship closing on you? Tis Captain John on the devil's blood. Jondot smiled, tipping his head. Every time I see you, Mademoiselle Eliza, you turn more beautiful. Quelle beauté! Has Captain Jean made you his whore yet? Jondo knew Eliza well. Beck's gut tightened, and he imagined the cocky French captain struggling under the heel of his boot. Captain John will be beyond vengeful if you mar his new ship, she said, ignoring his taunt. Do not dare to step one of your filthy boots on this deck. And fair Lady Alice, I see there, Jondo said, casting his eyes to her. Getting plumper by the year? With you having gained your sea stomach, my men will find or put a paradis between your thighs. Alice cursed softly from her determined position on the deck. Hold your fucking tongue, Beck yelled across. Jordot's dark-eyed gaze drifted to Beck. I'm a quarry pup. His smile grew until his white teeth showed. You let a woman speak for you. A woman who will shoot you right through your cold heart, Beck said, handing her the crossbow. Jordot chuckled. Ah, c'est l'amour. Perhaps she is your home, Aquarie. If I wasn't going to kill you today, I would ask you to send my regards to your sister-in-law, Lark. He kissed the tips of his fingers. You bloody bastard, Beck cursed low. jean men held their swords at the ready, glaring from the facing gunwale. Some growled, some spit, others yelled lengthy profane threats. They were lined up at the ropes meant to swing across. Without hesitation, Eliza lowered the tip of her arrow to the flame Alice held, turned, aimed in less than a second, and fired. The arrow pierced one of the thick ropes, making the man holding it drop it onto the deck, the fire licking up the thick strand. Another man threw a bucket of water on it from a rain barrel strapped to the mast. Jondo chuckled. Feisty wench. He rattled off something in French that made his men laugh, their leers raking down Eliza. A slight colouring in her cheeks told Beck that she'd understood whatever foulness the man was spouting. For a certainty, Beck knew he'd rather be a dead man than a live woman in Jondot's clutches. We will blow holes in you, Eliza called, and John will finish you off. She tipped her head, shrugging. You cannot beat John. He has already proven that, Jondot, numerous times. She held another flaming arrow knocked aimed straight at him. His tunic, under his long seaman's coat, was open halfway, showing hair on a tan chest. A long scar marred his cheek. One of the pirate crew ran over to him. Whatever he said made Jondo glance over the far rail at the ship closing in. Beck was almost certain it was Cullen Duffy. Cullen was twice his age, and had taught Beck all about sailing, since Beck had decided that the Macquaries, being a clan on an island, must have a ship and the ability to sail. 
Rowing a boat after Jean Derwady'd abducted Lark had proven that. Eliza shot at another rope, higher this time, so the men had to climb to put out the greedy flames. Would she ward him away, or just incite him? Beck looked to his ready crew. Any pirate trying to board would have a hole in him. Eliza knocked another flaming arrow. We will blow some holes in you and your men, and when John arrives he will cut your black heart from your fucking chest so you can watch it thump and bleed out where you die on your burning deck. The lass had a way with words. Rabbi held the end of a musket up to Beck. It was already primed, and he took it, holding it ready next to Eliza and her flaming crossbow. I thought Captain Jean was your protector, mademoiselle, yet he leaves you out here alone with only this Highlander to protect you. The lass obviously doesn't need protection, Beck called, and Captain Jean is closing in behind ye, Jean Doe. Ye are caught between us. Jean Doe glanced over his shoulder at his crew and then back to her. I have an offer for you, mademoiselle. I am not interested in your offers, she yelled, venom in her voice. A trade, Jondo tipped his head, his eyes narrowing as his grin grew. For some valuable treasure. I would never be interested in any treasure fouled by a hedge pig like you. Ah, but this treasure you may want with all your lovely heart, mon chéri. Eliza stared at the pirate captain, ignoring his bait. Leave now as a live man, or die with a flaming arrow in your heart or your head on Captain John's pike. The man's smile faded to a look of annoyance. Tell John you would earn more gold working with me than with these island sots who are barely able to catch a breeze in their pristine white sails. His nose wrinkled like he smelled bilge water. He turned away, issuing some orders in French that sent his men moving to raise their sails. Dung it, Beck was actually letting Jordo slip through his fingers. If he didn't have Eliza and her children on board, he would have attacked, keeping Jeanne there until Cullen could catch up to them. The Calypso could have survived it. She was strong and buoyant and ready to earn some scars. Farewell for now, mademoiselle, Jeanne yelled over as the wind filled the sails on the four-masted ship. If I had known you would grow into such a tasty morsel, I would have fought harder to keep you. His hand went down to his cod as he leered at her. Perhaps you will be interested in that trade I mentioned. Tell Captain Jean, I heard he was interested, and I will not remain in these waters for long, a week or two at most. Eliza held her one hand up in a gesture that Beck had never seen a lass use before. She jumped down from the rail, her boots clomping hard onto the boards. She strode back through his men as they stood dumbstruck by her courage. Alice followed in her wake, her chin held high. Keep moving us into the wind to meet up with Cullen. Beck yelled to Drostin, and his well-trained men began to hustle around the deck once more. Watch the bureau, he said to Rabbi as he passed him. Alert me if he seems to have changed his mind, and mark his course. You plan to go after him with Cullen? Rabbi asked. Beck exhaled, his fist clenching. Once I get the children off the ship. He followed behind Eliza and Alice as they strode toward his cabin. Anders came running up to her along with Pip, holding wee Hester, who was tied to an empty barrel. Good Lord, Eliza must have told them to prepare to jump. Drowning, freezing in the North Atlantic, or being eaten by sea creatures, was apparently better than being taken by Jean Doe. Beck had to agree. Eliza, wait, he called as she reached the door to his cabin. She nodded to Alice and the children to enter and turned to meet his gaze. Her face was flushed, the confident fury bled away so that she looked a bit lost. The door shut and she leaned back against the wall next to it, waiting without a word. He could seize her for taking over his ship, demand she answer his questions. What happened to her before? Who was Captain John Pritchett? And why was Jean willing to let go his prize to escape the possibility of meeting him in battle? What was in her trunk? Where had she gotten the clothes? Was she a pirate? There were so many questions, and he needed to stress that he was the only captain of the Calypso. Eliza, he said, stepping closer. Her breath came fast and shallow. Hands resting on her shoulders, Beck felt tremors rolling through her, so much so that it was a wonder she was standing. All his urgent questions slid into one as he pulled her to him. Are ye unwell? Chapter 4 Of course she was unwell. Eliza's stomach was a tangle of tight knots, like a wretched fishing net that should be abandoned. That was obviously why she couldn't make herself pull out of the Scotsman's arms. The warmth he gave off penetrated her open coat through her tunic. She had not felt cold or afraid while baiting and bluffing with Jean Doe, 
not until she had walked away and the realization of the nightmare they'd narrowly escaped had overtaken her. Will you chain me inside your cabin now? she asked, trying to sound angry, but her voice seemed too small. Beck's arms curved around her. He was a big man, taller than John, and stronger if his biceps were evidence. He hadn't made her seem weak by dragging her down from the rail or striking her for cutting him. There was no way he could have been truly worried for his life at the end of her blade. I didn't happen to have chains on board, he answered, while she shook against his chest. What type of pirate hunter are you without chains on board? she murmured. She had not been held since she was a child. Captain John did not acknowledge weakness. Alice had been her only source of comfort, and the children clung to her until they grew too old, like Anders. Pull away. He will try to touch me. All men are scoundrels. But she didn't pull away. Eliza let his arms encircle her, hold her. He did not press his cod into her or slide his hands down to her arse, or try to press his lips against her mouth or neck. He just held her, and the oddest thing happened. Beck Macquarie seemed to suck the tremors out of her, as if his own body had taken her fear and dissolved it. He did not shake, but stood like a sun-baked rock to which she could cling. Against him her breathing slowed, her body stilled, her mind moved away from the cruel memories of Jean Doe. She inhaled the warm spice that seemed to permeate his skin. What would it be like to have a man like him, someone who was solid? The thought jarred her, and she stiffened, pulling back. His arms dropped immediately. She glanced up and saw concern in the lines of his strong features, the hardness of his mouth. Whatever Jean Doe did he? he said, his voice filled with restrained anger. He paused, and she waited for the end of his question. But he did not ask. He cleared his throat as if trying to swallow down fury. He glanced away from her and then back. You were bloody splendid out there. Her gaze snapped up to his eyes. Splendid? I stole control of your ship, she said, and glanced down at his hand. And I bloodied you. A scratch he said, and my men know I am in charge, and that I decided to go along with your bluff, and as long as the Calypso didn't burn and ye and your family are safe, your plan proved sound. She tilted her head, feeling much more herself, and not the trembling weakling she'd melted into for a few moments. I could have taken over your vessel, she said, knowing she'd never have been able to accomplish her boast if he'd decided to have his men surround her, wrestling her to the deck or pushing her overboard. The corner of Beck's mouth turned upward, with three children and a nursemaid to help you. He thought she was jesting. Maybe she was, but she wasn't about to admit it. And as Alice, Pip and I could sail this carrack alone if need be, and it only takes three out of a crew of twenty to lead a successful mutiny. His eyes narrowed as he studied her. I'm suddenly quite content that we are going back to Wolf Isle and not on a long journey with ye on board. He leaned closer to her face, which made her still. His teeth were white, his look deadly serious. Because no one will ever take my calypso from me. I have worked too hard for her. She is as dear to me as a family member, and those who try to steal or harm her will attend an immediate meeting with God or Satan, depending on the sway of their heart. She blinked. Meeting with God or Satan? She would need to work that into her repertoire of curses. Noted, Captain Macquarie, she said and opened the cabin door to slip away with the last word. Ask if there is any food on board, Anders called before she could shut it. Eliza exhaled and turned back to Beck. Could we please get some rations, if there are any available? I will have some sent up, he said, and glanced around her into his cabin, nodding to Alice and the children. Good eve. He turned and walked away, having won the last word. Damn. Eliza closed the door and leaned against it, letting air out of her puffed-out cheeks. Splendid, Alice said, her brows raised. You were listening at the door? Eliza asked. Of course, Pip said as she held Hester's small hands and danced around with her. We must always strive to know what's going on. Her voice was deep to imitate Captain John. Understanding is our best weapon. I agree with Captain Beck, Anders said, peeking out one of the small glass-paned windows. You were splendid. He looked at her. Captain John would be proud. Worry tightened her face. Where the hell is he? She said to the room. The devil's blood would have returned for us if it were still floating, 
Alice said, her face pinched. And the captain, surely? Eliza rubbed a hand down her face. Well, we know Jondot did not sink him or my bluff wouldn't have worked. She pushed away from the door and looked around the comfortable but spartan room. It seemed the same as many captains' cabins, except it was clean and new. The smell of fresh wood still hung in the air, along with the essence of Beck Macquarie. His bed was made, even if it was wrinkled, and a trunk sat at the end of it, bolted to the floorboards. A table with two chairs, a small keg, a washing basin, and several glass oil lamps were the other items. Bloody hell, Anders called, having opened a planked wooden door. He even has his own jakes. Pip rushed over to look down the hole that opened over the water. I need to go first, Pip said, pushing at Anders to get out of the privy. Do you want to try? Alice asked Hester. They'd been struggling to get the child to forego napkins to stay dry. Little Hester nodded vigorously. Rap, rap. Anders ran to open the door. It was Gavin McLean with a tray laden with food. We are going into port in the morn, he said with a smile. So no rationing required. Spend it, Hester said, her frightened face relaxing into a smile as she tried to say the new word. Pip swung the door of the jakes open, rushing out with a squeal of excitement, her trues half unlaced. Anders nodded, trying to act serious, with his eyes open wide at the assortment of cheese, dried meat, bread, and what looked like tarts. Thank you, Eliza said to him. Gavin bowed his head and glanced at Alice. Uh, I, he stammered, and his face reddened. Did the man like Alice? She looked between them as he backed out of the room. Eliza added him to her list of three mutinous sailors, just in case she needed it. The children grabbed up the tarts first. Pip took a bite, her eyes closing as if she were in ecstasy. You have to eat some of these, Anders said, handing one to Alice and then to Eliza. The best I have ever tasted. How many tarts have you eaten before? Pip asked around a mouthful. A couple, he said defensively, and this is by far the best. On board the Devil's Blood, desserts were not something that Bart, the galley cook, baked. Without sugar, except when they travelled down into the Caribbean, Shriveled fruit was the closest they had to treats. And wine. Eliza definitely preferred wine over the strong spirits John's crew usually drank, although they had all made certain she could drink whiskey without succumbing to foolishness. She took a bite of the tart. Even cold, the sweet, spicy apples came alive with something close to joy in her mouth. God's teeth, these are splendid, she said, using the word of the day. Crossing her legs, Eliza lowered herself onto the floor of the cabin, took another bite, and closed her eyes to enjoy the lingering blend of spices. So sweet, so soft, with a perfect amount of filling. Captain John had bought her a tart once long ago when he declared her birthday was on Christmas Day, because that was when he'd rescued her from Chandeau. She was certain he declared it because he wanted to give her a gift on Christmas without having to give one to everyone else on board. So Christmas Day became her birthday. She couldn't recall when her real one was. Most of the crew didn't know their birth dates, and the rest stopped grumbling that the captain didn't give them gifts when he called them whining idiots. Captain John Pritchett was never soft nor lenient, but his men and those children he saved were loyal to the grave. I will not let go. The words he'd yelled while pulling her from Jondot's cabin had bound her to him forever a father to replace the one she'd seen Chanteau slice through and throw overboard like an empty barrel. Eliza would remain at sea with Captain John always. She owed him for her life, her virtue, and the confidence that she mattered in the world. It was the closest thing to love she'd ever felt, if love was indeed something real and not just a way of imprisoning a person. But where was he now? Eliza sighed and stood up to eat some more of the feast that Beck had sent up. The morning would see them to Wolf Isle. She wondered if it was still cursed. Lark was worried the storm might have sunk the Calypso, Adam Macquarie said. As Beck's older brother and the chief of their small clan, Adam continued to honour the promise they'd made to their father before he succumbed to death. Rebuild clan Macquarie. Bring it home to Wolf Isle. I built the Calypso to withstand more than wind and rain, Beck said. It was what I told her. Adam's hand fell heavily on Beck's shoulder. His gaze moved past Beck to the ship. Who are these? Two lasses and three children stranded on Ellen Moore, Beck said, glancing back. 
Eliza stood along the rail looking out at the trees. She was back in a dress, the blue one that had dried after the storm. Her hair was full of golden waves that caught the shine of the sun breaking through the clouds. I have not yet drawn out their entire story. Did you tell Adam how she stole your ship and sliced you open? Rabbi asked as he strode up, bent under the heaviness of the pack he'd taken with him to sea. He narrowed his eyes at Beck. And she's not the type of lass to settle here and bake ye tarts, so keep your eyes on Jack to yourself. Dinna forget we have a curse to break, and ye need a wife. With one last glare, he continued up the path. The damn curse of Wolf Isle. How could Beck forget? Until all five Macquarie brothers learned to truly love someone, whatever that meant, their isle would struggle, and their clan would continue to die out. A century ago, when their ancestor got a woman with child and abandoned them both, the woman's mother cursed the clan, driving the inhabitants away. Beck had heard the story since he was a lad sitting on his dar's knee, pledging to break the curse before he even understood what that meant. Adam's brows raised as he studied Beck. Bloody dear, she doesn't sound like a lass you'd be interested in anyway. Beck held up his hand, which he'd washed and tied with a fresh wrap. A letter. Ye let her bloody ye. Beck exhaled. I let her direct my ship for a quarter hour at most. Ye best have Lark clean the cup. Adam looked past him to Eliza. What do you know so far? Eliza Wentworth is her name, and she has history with Claude Chandot. She escaped him ten years ago and despises him. Adam's eyes snapped to Beck. Chandot. The word was a curse. The pirate had nearly killed his wife, Lark. We came upon the bastard just off the coast, Beck said. He has to be seen in these waters for two years. Beck's jaw sat rigid. The devil is back. And you escaped him, Adam asked. His ship has twice the gunpowder of the Calypso. Beck let out a long breath. Cullen's ship was closing in on us. Jondo knew he'd be outgunned shortly, and... Beck paused, rubbing the back of his head. How did his older brother always make him feel like a lad, rather than a man of seven and twenty with years of studying the sea? And Beck started again. Eliza Wentworth bluffed Chando into thinking Cullen's ship was our Captain John's ship. So she saved your heart, Adam said with a hint of a smile. We were in the leeward wind with half the guns and not enough time for Cullen to reach us. Beck crossed his arms over his chest and glanced at Eliza as she walked gracefully down the narrow plank, holding wee Hester against her. She says her captain's name is John Pritchard of the Devil's Blood. Pritchard? I didn't know the name, Adam said, turning to watch her too. Damn, must have stung, her save in the day. Eh? Beck said, annoyance in the tightness of his forehead. It was a good ploy. Eliza walked up to the deep-water pier they had built for the Calypso on the south side of Wolf Isle. Beck's voice lowered. Captain Jean saved her and the others. He put them on Ellen Moore because he was planning to sink Jean d'Or, and didn't want them captured. Hmm, Adam said. I Beck agreed. There is more to her story. If what Rabbi says is right about her not being a lass who will settle down, perhaps you should stay away from her, Adam said. Beck frowned at him. I didn't need to consider wedding every lass I happened to meet. You know I didn't believe in curses, Adam said. But we still have a clan to build here on Wolf Isle. And we have three brothers to help with that, Beck said. Not all of us must marry. Gersel seems to think we do, Adam said, his face hard. Now that he had a wife and Ben, Beck's oldest brother seemed even more dedicated to breaking the curse and building the clan. But she didn't believe in curses, Beck said. Adam looked away. Gersel is the last descendant of the woman William Macquarie wronged, and the dead willow tree grew buds when I realised I loved Lark. So now ye believe in curses, Beck asked, his voice hard, because it all worked out for ye. I dunna know, Adam said, shaking his head. He met Beck's gaze. But be careful with this one. He nodded toward Eliza. I have no plans to get close enough out to gut me, Beck said, although he'd held her as she trembled which hadn't been part to my plans either. Good, Adam said. She could be dangerous. Bloody hell. Everything about Eliza Wentworth was dangerous. Was that why Beck found her so fascinating? She walked up to them and handed Hester off to Pip, who smiled her toothy grin up at Adam. Are you the captain of this isle? 
Pip asked. Aye, Adam said. But people call me Chief. Beck is Wolf Isle's only captain. Anders glanced toward the woods. There are many in now. You've been to our isle before, Adam asked. We have visited the woman living farther down the shoreline, Eliza said. She looked to Beck. She used to say the isle was cursed against men. It was a statement, but sounded like a question. The Macquarie clan has returned, Adam said, his voice commanding, and we are growing. Wolf, Hester said, her finger pointed at Beck's large wolf hand running toward them, her pups following. God's teeth, Alice said, coming up behind Eliza as she watched the dog. Tis as large as a wolf. Beck tapped his leg as the tumbling pack ran up to greet them. He scratched the mother dog's head. This is whiskey and her brood. Pip sat Hester down next to her and the puppies surrounded them, knocking the little girl over. Hester giggled, the first laugh Beck had heard from her. You named your hound Whiskey? Eliza asked. When she lopes about, Beck said, she looks like she's had too much whiskey. A smile blossomed onto Eliza's lips, and for a moment Beck's breath stopped. The lass was a natural beauty, with shiny hair and rosy cheeks, her skin lightly tanned from her days at sea. But when she smiled, happiness seemed to make her grey-blue eyes sparkle. Adam cleared his throat, the frown in it obvious and almost certainly meant for Beck. Mistress Eliza and crew, he said, glancing at the children and Alice. You are welcome at Guyland Castle. Let's see if we can improve your situation. Thank you, Eliza said. Beck looked toward the ship where Gavin managed the unloading. All seemed well, so he walked with her. Just follow Whiskey and her pups. Pip, Hester and Anders chased them, with Alice following. The children's laughter made Eliza smile and she lifted her skirts to run after them. Adam exhaled next to him. I will speak with Callum and Dagan about staying away from her until we figure out her intentions. Beck frowned. Her intentions? They surely didn't include remaining on a cursed isle wed to a Macquarie. He and Adam followed the parade toward the castle. The large grey stone structure sat perched on the rise that looked across the small strait to the Isle of Mull, where their friends, the Macleans, lived relatively peacefully under the chieftainship of Tor Maclean. Eliza slowed as they crested the hill that looked down into the abandoned village of Ormeg, sitting in a shallow valley behind Gylan Castle. After two years of work, most of the abandoned cottages had thatched or stone roofs on them once more. The hushed emptiness still caused a shiver to newcomers. The children paused next to Eliza, the pups wrestling together at their feet. Adam continued toward the castle, probably to warn their brothers to stay away from Eliza. That place looks haunted, Alice said, looking down into the village. Haunted? Nay, nee, Beck said. Just empty. But Ormeg will thrive once more. In fact, you all could live there. He watched Eliza's face. Eliza tucked the wayward curls along her temples behind her ears. I would not know how to live on land now, she said. In fact, I can still feel the sway of the sea under me. Pip held out her hands and closed her eyes. Me too, she laughed. Hester imitated her. Me too, she repeated. Eliza continued toward Guylan. Beck caught up to her. I love the sea too, he said. But there's something pleasing about putting my feet up before a fire without worrying that it will burn my ship down around me. She chuckled. We sailed down to the West Indies in the winter. No need for a fire. Pip, Anders, Hester and Alice stopped before the great wall surrounding Guylan. Alice scooped up the little girl as they stared at the open portcullis. Tis a lot of stone, Pip said, her face open in awe as she surveyed the surrounding twelve-foot-high wall. Guylan was the best fortified castle on an isle that had no one to attack it. Unless pirates land again a nightmare that had pushed Beck to make his sailing dreams a reality, and he'd poured his heart and soul into building the Calypso. Come along, Eliza said, capturing Pip's hand. The girl tipped her head back to spy the pointy bars overhead as they walked under the portcullis. That would surely keep villains out, Anders whispered in awe. Have you met many? Beck asked him. Just the ones who killed my ma and pa and gave me to a whore to race, he said, and ran ahead. Lord, they had been through too much. Look at that, Anders called, and stopped with the others before the willow tree in the middle of Guylan's Bailey. The tree that had been stabbed a century ago and could not be chopped down. 
the bleeding dead tree that represented the curse of Wolf Isle. Why is there a knife in it? Anders asked. Who would stab a tree? Alice asked on top of him. Beck cupped the back of his head as all of them, except Eliza, fired questions at him. It has little green buds, but it looks dead. Tis bleeding. Can trees bleed? Tis summer. Should it not have leaves? Hester squealed as the wind blew the whip-like tendrils around, one of them seeming to reach out toward her. She climbed higher on Alice. Eliza stepped away from the lashing limbs. Why do you not chop it down? She frowned at him like he'd meant to scare the wee lass. Tis part of the legend. Anyone who tries to chop it down will have no children. My father made us swear not to try until we are old. I can chop it down for you, Eliza said. You don't want to be on of your own, Beck asked, frowning. There are enough unwanted children in the world. I will care for as many as I can find. And it would be ridiculously hard to manoeuvre on board a ship while heavy with child. She apparently planned to spend her whole life at sea. He frowned. They must be chopped by a Macquarie, he said, not sure if that were true or not. Hm. She walked toward the double doors to the keep. Eliza waited for him to catch up and nodded to him to go inside ahead of her. He saw a blade in her hand. Aye, Eliza was not some frail flower to be protected. She was very capable. Stepping from the darkness of the entry into the great hall, Eliza glanced around. Since the Macquaries had moved back to the castle two years ago, the decades of neglect had been washed away, and the broken window panes, set high in the stone walls, had been replaced to allow in light. The large hearth at the far end was dark, since the summer temperatures had finally risen. Two tapestries in bright colours hung on the walls, one depicting the willow tree in green foliage, the other showing wolves on the isle, and Norse ships on the sea around it. Rabbi and Adam stood with Beck's two younger brothers, Callum and Aegon, at the far end. Callum's brows lifted at the sight of Eliza, but whatever Adam said made them lower, pinching together. These are my last two brothers, Beck said as they walked toward them. She took right over, Rabbi was saying. Bluffed against Shondo. He shook his head and took a gulp of his ale. Who knows what else is in that trunk of hers? Poison, and the bones of those who've crossed me. Eliza said. Callum's frown turned into a pinched smile. Oh, but she didn't mention how bonny she is. And she's bonny, Rabbi said, flapping his hand toward her, his bushy brows lowered. Are you a bastard, miss? Rabbi, Adam said, his voice full of warning. Hagen hit the old man's arm, making some of his ale splash out. We'll be sending you off to the isle if you keep asking women that. The curse says we canny father bastards. Adam explained, but it matters not if they come onto the isle. He glanced at the children, but they were just staring up at the rafters and the iron chandelier. A stabbed tree, an abandoned village, and a curse, Alice said, shaking her head. Any witches about, too? Aye, Hagen said, one near where you landed on the south side. Gersel is not a witch, Eliza said, frowning at him. She cares for mistreated children and women. Ye you know Gersel? Callum asked. She visited Wolf Isle before we came back, Beck explained. Ye steal any sheep while you were trespassing? Rabbi asked, narrowing his eyes. No, Eliza said. Egan is the youngest of the five of us brothers. You've met Droston on board, and Adam the chief, when we landed. And I am Callum, just a year younger than Beck. Droston is his twin, Lark Macquarie said from the stairwell. She was alone, her bairn likely napping. She smiled broadly, her red hair caught in her usual thick braid to lay over one shoulder. And I am Lark Macquarie, Adam's wife and Lady of Gylan Castle, she said. Eliza nodded in greeting. I am Eliza Wentworth, wife of no one and Lady of Nothing. Lark's smile broadened, her gaze shifting to Beck and then back to Eliza. So glad to have you here, and all of your family. Callum was still staring at Eliza. Do you bake tarts? Lark's sister Anna is supposed to make the best tarts. That's why Beck is going to wed her. Wed? Eliza asked. I met Anna once, Beck said. I haven't even tasted her tarts. He looked to Eliza, and I've no current plans to wed anyone. Callum made a snorting noise. Well, you better soon. We don't need to marry in the order we were born, Hagen said. Being the youngest, he liked to make it clear that he could wed before them all if he found the right lass. The right lass? 
Who exactly would that be? Beck always thought she would be a sweet woman with an easy smile and talents for baking. Someone who would see him off as he sailed around Wolf Isle, protecting their home, and who would welcome him back with gratitude and long hugs and longer kisses. In complete contrast, Eliza frowned at him with her arms crossed. And this is Mistress Alice, Pip, Hester, and Anders, Beck said. Pip dipped into a small curtsy. Hester squirmed for Alice to set her down where she imitated Pip by dipping low and holding out her skirt. Very nicely done, Lark said. I think you're about a year older than my Johnny. When he wakes up from his nap, he can show you some of his toys, she said to Hester. And I think our wonderful cook Jasper has some tarts in the kitchen. I love tarts, Pip said. We had them on the Calypso. Dee big, Callum started to say again. No, Eliza said, glancing his way but then her gaze landed on Beck. I do make a good fish chowder when we can find fresh cream and butter. We can definitely find some of that here for you, Lark said. Mistress Wentworth, I will take ye and your family upstairs where you can take a warm bath and change into fresh clothes. Aiken, see if you can find some tarts to bring up. Aye. Eliza took a step toward Lark, but Callum jumped in front of her, his hand out as if to grab her arm. Beck strode over. Callum, stop. Eliza's command snapped out of her, making his brother freeze. A dagger appeared in her hand, and she held it pointed toward Callum's throat. Chapter 5 Eliza's blood rushed through her, giving her energy, as she stared at the tall Scotsman, who looked as if he would seize her. She stared into his wide eyes. If you or any man touches me without asking, the body part you touched me with will be cut off, she said and sliced the sharp edge through the air. Whatever part that is. Beck's brother stepped back, lowering his hand. She watched the man swallow. Understood, Eliza asked. Aye, Callum said, his brows raised high. Eliza walked around Callum, never taking her eyes from him. Watching a potential enemy often stopped them from following through on their dark thoughts. She guessed that Callum Macquarie was honourable, like Beck, but she took no chances. She walked backward toward Lark at the steps. Pip stopped to glare at Callum, too. With her free hand, she drew a slicing motion across her neck. Not a touch, Scotsman, she said. Hester imitated her glare as she held Pip's other hand and moved her finger across her own neck. Show me your teeth, Pip whispered. Hester opened her mouth wide, making it difficult for Eliza to hold her glare. No, keep your teeth together, Pip said, and the child clamped her teeth together with a loud clack. The two girls pulled their lips back into a pair of human snarls. Alice frowned at Callum. As women who must traverse ports, we ladies do not give second chances. No touching, and if the leering gets too strong, you will lose an eye or two. Lark stood behind Eliza. We are going to get along famously, she said lightly. Beck, Callum, Egan, and even Rabbi watched them exit, and they climbed the narrow stone steps up to the floor with bedchambers. This is a small chamber where I keep my bathing tub. Lark said, and pointed to a second door. That leads to Adam's in my bedchamber. You can bar both doors and you will not be disturbed. She pointed to the hearth where a small cauldron sat on a grate. The brothers will bring up cold water from the cistern, and you can heat some. One could drown in that, Pip said as she inspected the tub, her eyes wide. Pish, Alice said. You can swim, and I will bathe Hester. From the quickness in Alice's voice, she was just as excited as Eliza to sink into a bath. You must not have much of a chance to have a warm, fresh water bath living on a ship, Lark said. Eliza shook her head. I had one as a birthday gift on Christmas Day several years ago, at a whorehouse in port. She still remembered relaxing in the warm water, letting it rise to her chin. She'd stayed in it until the water had turned completely cold. Well, you could have one every day here if you can hold the water, Lark said. I have a bathing tub down in our cottage in the village, too. You have a second dwelling? Eliza asked. Lark flushed. When Adam and I need to be away from his brothers or we are working in the village, sometimes we just stay the night there. If my sisters move here, they may live in it. The children inspected every inch of the room, and Lark told her about the rooms in the castle, until they heard footsteps. Water is here, someone called. Callum, Egan, and Beck walked in with buckets, each one pouring fresh water into the tub. Jasper says tarts will be baked by the time you finish up here. Callum said with a quick glance at Eliza. Thank you, Lark said, and shrewed them out. Beck went to the hearth and worked quickly to start a fire. You can eat the cauldron right on the grate, 
he said, and crouched to gently blow on the growing flame. Eliza watched the play of his muscles through his tunic. Lord, he was fine to look at. He stood, turning to Eliza. Your trunk has been placed in a room down the hall where there are three small beds. Next door is one with two beds. Where do you sleep? Eliza asked, not quite sure why that seemed important. He met her gaze, and something stirred in her stomach. His eyes were dark in the room, but she knew they were a pale grey. We are each working on a cottage in the village, where we will eventually live. You're always welcome at Kylan, Lark said, straining with a water-filled cauldron. Beck took it from her and set it on the grate. Tis crowded here, he said, and Lark laughed. My place is nearly finished, so I will sleep there, Beck said. Pip's eyes grew round. In the haunted village? He chuckled. I'm not afraid of ghosts or curses, or even pirates. Well, I am, Pip said, going to the fire to stare at the heating water. A good amount of fear keeps you alive, Alice said, as long as it doesn't paralyse you. Wise words, Mistress Alice, Lark said. Come along, Beck, let's leave them to their baths. Eliza stood at the door, closing it slowly as she watched Beck walk away toward the tower stairs. He looked even larger inside the confined space. At the top of the steps he glanced back as if he felt her stare. Their gazes connected and her breath stopped. Damn, he had some sway over her. She frowned over her reaction and pulled back into the room, closing the door. Beck sat at the table in the great hall, watching Anders fidget with his empty plate. We eat when they come down? the lad asked. He'd bathed in the loch with Beck, Drostin and Rabbi, and was dressed in clean clothes that the boy had pulled from the stuffed trunk upstairs. Eat a bannock while you wait, Beck said. A growing boy was forever hungry. Anders snatched up the oatcake. Pip's voice came from the turning tower stairs. I could have stayed in that bath forever. Me too, Hester said, a little voice high-pitched like a bird's chirp. Beck stood and tugged at Anders. He should stand when a lady enters the room. What? Why? he asked, his mouth full of bannock. Beck lifted under his thin arm and the boy stood. Adam and his brothers walked in through the entryway, but Beck kept his gaze on the alcove as the two ladies and two children emerged. Eliza wore another blue dress, perhaps one of Lark's. A white smock, edged in lace, lifted above the bodice that was cinched to show Eliza's waist, and the curves she had hidden well under her sailor's tunic. Stays pushed her lush breasts upward, and petticoats spelled out her skirt. Her hair had dried in loose curls of gold, half of it plaited and pinned to the top of her head. With the added colour from the sun, she radiated health that came from exercising outdoors. He could not stop studying her as she walked with a grace that came from growing up on a moving ship. Her nose was straight and just the perfect size for her face, set between eyes full of depth. He never thought of a lass's eyes before, and realised that he'd like to look in Eliza's longer. Eliza's sharp gaze quickly took in the room, as if she must always know where danger lurked. Was Jean Doe responsible for her constant wariness, or Captain John? Callum came to stand next to Beck. Does she have to look so bloody fetching? he said under his breath. You will be missing a hand or a set of lips before she leaves, Hagen said to him, and as snorted crumbs on his lips. Beck caught Callum a shaming look. She has been through enough. Then I give her reason to defend herself. Callum's face pinched in. Oh, Beck, you fucking know I wouldn't do anything a lass wouldn't want me to. Aye, Beck said, but it will not do to become attached to her if she's planning to leave as soon as she can. You must remember that too, Hagen said. Beck glanced at Anders. She doesn't plan to marry ever, does she? Nay, Anders said. Never. Excellent, Lark said, striding in with her son, Johnny. With red hair, chubby cheeks, and happy blue eyes, the bairn was nearly as big as Hester, even though he was at least a year younger. Adam came over to take the lad. Eliza sat across from Beck, with Pip and Hester between her and Alice. Eliza smiled at Anders, and again Beck watched her face, soaking in the softening. You look clean, she said. I smell good too, he answered. Captain Beck uses a soap with pine needles in it. Anders held up his arm and sniffed along it. I smell like the forest. He looked at Eliza. What do you smell like? Aye, what did she smell like? Beck could imagine inhaling along her warm nape under the fall of her golden hair. Eliza imitated the boy by inhaling along her own bare arm. Lemon and rosemary. The Lady of Aros Castle makes soaps in many different scents, Lark said. Strawberry is my favourite. I will find you some to try. 
"'Tis my favourite, too,' Adam said. But his tone made it apparent that he liked strawberry the best on his wife, not himself. He leaned over and kissed the bare skin above her shoulder. God's teeth! His older brother exuded utter contentment. "'Twas part of why he and his brothers were working on their own cottages, so they wouldn't keep stumbling upon them kissing and tupping in dark corners, as if they didn't already have the largest bedchamber in the castle. "'Can we eat now?' Anders asked. "'Certainly,' Adam said. First, Eliza cut in, raising an eyebrow at the lad, "'we say a thanks for our food.' "'Pip frowned at Anders. "'You know that, because there are so many without.' "'Very true,' Lark said, cutting a stern glance across at Beck and his brothers. Eliza bowed her head, Beck did too, but kept his eyes open, free to watch her without her catching him. There were other colours in her golden hair, browns, and even a hint of red. When her eyes were closed, her long lashes fanned out under her eyes. We thank you, Lord, for making this food available for us. Keep us healthy, strong, and courageous, or take us away from this world, she said. Amen. And squeeze the hearts of our enemies until they burst and they descend to hell, Pip said, and looked up at Eliza. You forgot that part. Hagen laughed from his spot down the table. Captain John's favourite prayer is not suitable for all tables, Alice said. Eliza reached forward to spoon out a piece of mutton pie for each of her wards, Alice, and finally herself. This Captain John sounds like an interesting fellow, Adam said. He have been on his ship for ten years. Eliza chewed, and Beck could see her face tighten. No matter how casually Adam asked, she was clever enough to know she was being questioned. Aye, she said, and took another bite. Have you all been on his ship for that long? Well, those of you older than ten. Eliza set down her spoon. One's history is one's own to tell. If they wish to tell you, that is up to them. How about you, then? Adam asked. Lark placed a hand on his arm, but he did not pull the question back. Eliza set her cup down and faced Adam. When I was twelve, Captain Jean Doe boarded the ship that my parents' baby brother and I were sailing on from England to Ireland, where my father was to be stationed. Jean Doe stabbed my father through his chest and gave my mother to his crew to be raped repeatedly until they slit her throat and threw her overboard. I was kept alive to sell into slavery. I was on board the Bureau for two weeks when Captain John came across Jean Doe's ship. She took a sip of her wine and set it back with a clunk on the table. Everyone sat in silence as she spoke, only the children eating. John knew Jean Doe well enough to check his cabin. He found me there and dragged me out. Captain John's crew crippled the Bureau's sails while he swung me back across to the Devil's Blood. I've been there ever since. The room was silent. And your brother? Lark whispered, her face pale. After all, that could have been her if Adam and their family hadn't rescued her. Beck watched Eliza swallow and then inhale slowly as if pain bit down within her. I did not see him after I was locked in Chandos cabin. We found Hester holding on to a piece of floating gunnel several months ago, Pip said. She shrugged when Anders frowned at her. She is too young to tell. She looked back down at the table. Her ship was torn apart in a storm. She is the only one we found alive. No one said anything. Most of them, like Beck, had probably lost their appetites. Silence fell along the table until Alice cleared her throat. She had washed too and looked quite handsome in a green costume. Captain John's men also rescued me from Jean Doe's ship. I had not seen Eliza or her brother because I had been shackled below. Lark's hand pressed against her heart. I... I can only imagine the horror. Alice flushed as if she knew what everyone was imagining. I luckily get very ill at sea, and the smell of vomit and the fact I did not try to stop myself from soiling myself and all who came close deterred the men for the three days I was there before Captain John and his crew boarded the barrow. Lark looked at Adam. I need to write to Anna to let her know Jean Doe is back in Scottish waters. He nodded, his face grim. I was taken off a different boat, Pip said. It was a horrible place with very smelly pirates. Luckily I was too young to remember much. The girl looked down at her plate while she spoke, and then began eating again. Everyone along the table turned their gazes to Anders. He finished chewing and shrugged. I was raised in a whorehouse in the West Indies. Mistress Amanda said Captain Jondo dropped me off there when I was a baby and would come back for me some day. Captain John paid her for me before that happened. Does that mean ye belong to Captain John? Beck asked, his voice rough. No, Eliza said, her eyes cutting to him. A human belongs to no man. Tis Captain John's belief. We are all free to go, but we choose to stay to help others. Is that what your captain does? Lark asked. Saves children and women from pirates? Captain John is a privateer for King Henry of England, Eliza said. 
Now that the king is dead, the captain is waiting to hear from King Edward and his regent if we have royal orders to seize enemy ships. But if there are children or women imprisoned on any ship we encounter, we do everything possible to free them. Tis a noble cause, Callum said. There is a fine line between pirate and privateer, Adam said, and while Henry was alive, Scotland was considered the enemy. Eliza popped a piece of mutton into her mouth and chewed slowly before swallowing. You would definitely consider us pirates, then. Pirates who save children and women, Lark said, her hand sliding down Adam's arm. Beck wasn't about to let Eliza and her group be thrown into Guylan's dungeon, but he knew his brother was not that heartless. With the start of a new English rule, the devil's blood should sail elsewhere, Adam said. Eliza put her small eating knife down. I would recommend it, but Captain John and the devil's blood seem to have vanished. A pinch between her brows showed her worry. He had planned to return to Ellen Moore for us over a week ago. Chandot, Lark asked. Eliza shook her head and the candlelight danced along the gold of her hair. My bluff that your friend's ship was the devil's blood would not have deterred Chandot if he'd already sunk it. Would he have abandoned you on the isle? Beck asked. Eliza lifted her gaze to his. No. And Cullen hasn't seen the ship? Lark asked. Nay, nee, Troston said from down the table. When he caught up to us, he said he'd not seen anything except an English ship sailing in the waters. Cullen wanted to go after Jondot, Beck said, but you know Camille is wedding this week, and Rose would have his hide if he didn't return in time. He looked at Eliza. Camille is Cullen's daughter. Tarts, said Jasper, a tall, dark-skinned man who had arrived on Mull asking for work the year before. He had a curious accent when he spoke, which wasn't often, and a delicious way with food. His past was his own, but he seemed honourable, and they had hired him to work in the kitchen several months ago. He carried in a tray laden with fragrant pastries. Wonderful, Lark said. Thank you, Jasper. Pip squealed and Hester imitated her, the two jumping in their seats. Beck took one, biting into the honey and nut pastry. As always, the sweetness cleared his mind like a giant broom. There was no room for curses or ire. His eyes closed momentarily as he tasted it fully. When he opened his eyes, Eliza was staring at him. Her lips were pinched tight. Try one, he said, nodding at the plate. Jasper makes the most delicious tarts. She finally took one, biting it and chewing. Delicious, she said, her hand coming before her lips. Jasper nodded in response. Johnny began to fuss and rubbed his eyes with his little fists. I will take the lad to bed, Adam said, rising. How about a tour of the castle? Lark said, and kissed the curls on her son's head as Adam lifted him. I think I need some fresh air, Eliza murmured. She gave a tight smile. I will take the children up in a bit, Alice said, looking at where Hester had climbed onto Whiskey's back with the help of Pip. Is the dog that tolerant? Aye, Beck said. She is fine with Johnny grabbing her ears. Then a tour would be very nice, Alice said. Eliza was already walking toward the entryway by herself. Callum and Dagan watched her go and then looked to Beck. Me are going after her, aren't you? Callum said. I get stabbed, Beck joked, but was already rising. Callum snorted. You are the one she keeps glancing at. He rescued her, Jostin said, eating a tart, and then didn't throw her overboard when she took over his ship. Beck frowned at him. She didn't take over the ship, and for her bluff to work, I couldn't very well drag her down. Aye, aye, Drosten said, unconvinced. Damn what they thought. He had built the Calypso himself with guidance from Cullen's shipbuilder. He would never have let Eliza, or anyone, take her over. He strode away from his annoying brothers, thankful once again that he had his own place down in the village. You are massive, Eliza whispered in the shadows that enveloped the small stable built inside the stone wall around the castle. The horse lifted his head over the stool. She could see his large eyes in the silvery moonlight that came in through the door she'd left open. She was used to traversing her world in the dark, but her world was a much smaller place on the deck of a ship, one that she knew so well she could walk it blindfolded without tripping. The beast before her blew a breath out of its nose. She held her palm up to the soft muzzle, and it sniffed, breathing in her scent. Her patience was rewarded with the horse moving closer, pressing its velvet nose into her hand, letting her smooth down it to scratch under its bristly chin. Pebbles crunched behind her, and her hand slid to the dagger she had tied to the belted chain around her waist. His name is Borchgun, Beck said. She let her inhale out in a silent stream. 
Beck came up, stepping past her to pat the horse's neck. It means ghost in Gallic. He was born white and turned a dappled grey. She ran her hands along the side of the horse's cheek, exploring all the indents and rises of his face. The horse let out a breath as if sighing. He seems to like this, she said, smiling in the darkness, even though sadness tugged at her. It does indeed, Beck said. I will take him out to exercise on the morrow. When I'm at sea, Lark takes him out, but Adam says she may be with child again, so she can't ride him as much. Eliza touched a pendant she wore on a chain around her neck. I had a horse once, long ago when I was in England. We left her behind when we sailed for Ireland because we were only to be gone a year. I wonder sometimes what happened to Ginger. The darkness hid the glimmer of tears she knew must be in her eyes. She tried to keep hold of her familiar ire to banish them from her voice. She might still be alive if she were a filly. Beck said. He leaned against the stall door, and she could feel his gaze, even though she kept her focus on Bochgan's big eye. Eliza moved under the horse's neck, turning her back on Beck. I have no life back in England. I am dead to that world. Like the rest of my family. The familiar heaviness of guilt swelled in her stomach, and she leaned her forehead against Bochgan's neck. He could have an inheritance, Beck said behind her. He was close, but did not touch her. Wentworth sounds like a proper English. I have a perfectly happy life sailing with Captain John, rescuing children from build scum like Chandot. For the child I did not save. I will remain on the devil's blood until John makes me her captain. The weightiness of guilt was making it hard to breathe, and she pushed away, striding toward the door, her legs slapping at her skirts. Damn petticoats. He would give you a ship? Beck asked, and she heard the frown in his voice. Did he not think she could captain a ship? I'm apprenticing for the position. He says I'm the cleverest of his crew, one he can trust to keep our mission alive. That was if the devil's blood was not currently at the bottom of the cold sea. Eliza stopped in the middle of the bailey, well away from where the willow branches danced like whips in the night breeze. She stared up at the stars in the night sky, listening to Beck follow her. Is there no way to get out of this fortress once the gate is down? she asked. Frustration made her sound surly, but she did not care. The Scotsman had no right to question her or make her think about things she'd rather not. She startled when his hand took hers. Come this way, he said, tugging her toward the wall. Chapter 6 The fact that Eliza didn't pull a dagger on him for touching her hand was promising. Promising for what? That he could get more information out of her? Was that why he was showing her the way out of the small door in the wall? to make her trust him, although he was starting to think that Eliza Wentworth would never trust anyone, especially a person with her own set of bollocks. Except for this Captain John, who had promised her a ship. He should stay away from her. Adam's words worked through Beck's mind. This way to the shoreline, he said, dropping her hand and pointing down the moonlit path away from the village. The crunch of pebbles as they walked was muffled by the summer grasses in the narrow stretch of woods that led to the shore. The moonlight barely made it through the rustling leaves overhead. Eliza stepped down onto the sandy beach dappled with rocks. She stopped just shy of the lapping water's edge, hands clutching her skirts, raising the hem to keep it dry. The moon shone down, making her glorious hair look silver as it moved about her straight shoulders. If she transformed into a mermaiden before his eyes and dove into the sea, he would later say he'd expected it. He came even with her along the waterline, the gentle waves wetting his boots. The sea is soothing, he said, his voice as soft as he could make it. I miss it, she whispered. And John? Her profile was splashed with moonlight like the surface of a pearl. He inhaled. You love him, Denier. Eliza turned her beautiful sad face to him. If there is such a thing, I, I love him. Beck could not keep the hardness from his face. The thought of a pirate, obviously a man, not a boy, rescuing a twelve-year-old girl, and... Jean had called Eliza Captain John's whore. She punched his upper arm. And not the way you are thinking, she said. He rubbed it. He has never touched you. She huffed. Get whatever horribleness you are imagining out of your head. He's only touched me to nurse me through a fever or pat my back. He is a father to me. She turned her face back to the vacant smooth water that reflected the moon when the clouds slid past it. Captain Jack kept any man intending wickedness away from me, from the time he took me on the ship. At twelve, Beck said, to keep her talking. In the dark before the ocean, words seemed to come easier from her. Aye, she said, 
her voice a sneer of contempt. Base devils who thought a child of twelve was not too young to whore. What did your captain do? A tight smile grew across her lips. He found two on top of me below deck. He punched them soundly to get them off. He stripped one naked and hung him from the mast lines until his neck broke. The second he slit his throat before the whole crew, so they knew what would become of them if they touched me, or any woman or child on his ship. She crossed her arms over her chest. He set course for the nearest port, telling those who could not abide by his rule that they had one opportunity to leave with their lives. Did they? A few. Many stayed. I became part of their family. Edgar, Kofi, Wretch, Bingley, Bart. They taught me to be useful. She snapped her face toward him again, in a non-whoring way. She narrowed her eyes as if he'd said something offensive. He are worried about them. She looked back out to the dark sea. I need to find out what happened to them. Lord, it was like she'd lost her family a second time. We will hunt for them on the Calypso, he said. Her gaze snapped to his. When? After Camille's wedding in a few days, we can head back out. Cullen Duffy is my mentor and helped me build the Calypso. I need to be at his daughter's wedding. Thank you, she whispered. He ran a hand through his hair. Bloody hell, Eliza. All I had to deal with growing up was missing my mother and dealing with a family curse and dying clan. Ye, on the other hand, are beautiful, brave, clever. Damaged, she said. Mochrach, nay, Eliza, he said. Ye are brave, strong inside and out, and world-wise like no lass I've ever met before. She cut her eyes to him, narrowing them. He exhaled. And I'm not seeing that to get under your skirts. Because you want to fuck Anna? Who? Of course he knew who. He'd met Lark's bonny sister at the same festival where Adam had married Lark. Lark's sister? Nay. Because she will bake tarts for you to eat and close your eyes while you enjoy it, she said, accusation in her voice. He shook his head, staring at her. Was she jealous? She sounded jealous. Well, if she bakes tarts, I will eat them. And because you want to fuck Anna? Nay. Do you not like to fuck? Nay. I mean... He scored his fingers through his hair. I mean, I, but not all the time, and not Lark's sister. She looked back to the water, a smile playing across her mouth. What have they even been talking about? What am I supposed to see? he asked. She shrugged. Most people lie or tell half-truths. He crossed his arms over his chest and looked out at the blackness that seemed to hover over the calm, silvery water. If I tell you the truth, I will end up with a blade in my gut, he murmured. Silence fell. The only sounds were the lapping water and a slight breeze moving the tree limbs behind them. What truth would you tell? she asked. The silence stretched, and he crossed his arms. That I think you are beautiful, and the bravest lass I've ever met. She kept looking outward. I was not always brave. Her words were soft, as if she spoke a guarded sin. She inhaled and turned, walking away from the ocean back up the path to the castle. Good eve, back Macquarie. Where are you? Eliza whispered, as she watched the sunrise from the Calypso's main top castle, high above the deck. Captain John had left them on Ellen Moore over two weeks ago, saying he'd return in one when their supplies would run out. He'd survived for decades through storms, attacks, and trickery. And Jean Do did not know he was missing. Where was he? Eliza turned in the tight space to look out across the trees and moor a full file. The nearly vacant village of Ormek sat in the shallow valley just beyond Gylan. Was Beck asleep down there? Did he wear a nightshirt, or sleep completely bare? No one had been awake when she'd snuck out past the snoring rabbi in the great hall. The calypso had sat unguarded, just tied to the dock. How many would it take to sail her? Movement inside the castle wall caught her eye and she squinted, and as in Pip ran out of the door she had told them about when she'd gone upstairs to their room last night. Beck's wolfhounds followed on their heels, the mother loping behind. The portcullis rose and she noticed the youngest of Beck's brothers in the gatehouse. He waved to her and she raised her hand in greeting. They can look down, speaking to someone there, and two Scotsmen strode out the front gate. Beck and Drostin walked directly toward the ship. Her heart sped, and she turned back to the water, hoping to see the devil's blood. But the edge between sea and sky remained an unbroken line. Checking my rigging, Beck called. She looked over the rail at him far below. He frowned up at her. You leave your ship unprotected, she said. 
He threw his arms out wide and turned in a circle. From the thieves, pirates, and criminals sneaking around our dock. The dogs ran over, knocking into him and his brother, standing on their back legs, demanding to be petted. Pip and Anders laughed, trying to pull them away while Beck continued to scowl. Away, Beck said, striding through the rabble toward her. If she hadn't known how gentle he could be, she would say he looked menacing. Wrapping her leg around one of the dangling ropes, Eliza slid down toward the deck. Someone is in a foul humour this morning, she said. Drosting kept up with him. Beck is always foul when he must rise at dawn, she smiled. One did not talk to Captain John until he'd had his morning beer and had time to contemplate the horizon, unless one wanted to be assigned to hunting rats in the hull all day. Why did you have to rise at dawn? she asked, her feet touching down on the deck as Beck strode up. To make sure a lass was not stealing my ship, he answered. Otherwise I would still be a bed. She shook her head as he stopped before her. You really should not give out such information to would-be ship thieves. She ticked off her fingers. You leave your ship unguarded, no one seems to be awake before dawn, and you like to sleep until mid-morning. His hair was slightly mussed, as if he jumped from his pallet. Eliza glanced past him and then back to meet his narrowed gaze. You slept at the castle instead of your dwelling in the village. Adam thought you might try to steal my ship, he answered, rubbing his palm against his forehead. She snorted. Then you should have slept on your ship. I've been out here for half an hour. He glared at her. I told him that you were not a thief, and I trusted you. Not enough to sleep in the village, she said, her brow raised. Drostin chuckled and jumped on board, striding past her to go below. Are you always this troublesome in the morn? Beck asked. No, I'm this troublesome all day long, she smiled. And at night, when I'm not asleep. She tipped her head, thinking, Actually, I'm probably troublesome then, too. Captain John says I talk in my sleep. He was handsome when he glared, the breeze brushing his short hair. Stubble grew along his jawline and above his lips, showing the beard that would grow in quickly. His skin was tanned, lines of white radiating out from the corners of his eyes from squinting out at sea. Eliza looked away from him and ran her hand down the polished mast. "'Tis a fine character you build. His face softened. It took two years, but she is stout, straight, and will be fierce. Eliza understood the pride in one ship, and it practically gushed out of Beck as he looked upon the Calypso. You would trade your soul to keep her afloat, wouldn't you? she asked. Aye, he said, looking at Eliza. I love her. I want to name her Wolf, Pip said, walking up holding a squirming pup who licked her face. Does she have a name yet? Tis a good name, Anders said. Pip nuzzled her face into the pup. Wolf Isle should have at least one wolf on it. Beck continued to stare at Eliza. Wolf is a fine name, he said. Pip cheered, setting the pup down to run toward the shoreline off to the left. A floating dock was being pulled across the narrow strip of water from the neighbouring isle. Visitors, Eliza said, spying two women and a man who ferried them across the narrow waterway between islands. Beck murmured a curse and strode toward the ferry landing. Eliza hopped off the wooden dock and followed him. She had to take two steps to every one of his. The man was damnably fast and long-legged. He was back in his native clothing, a woolen red plaid wrapped around his narrow hips, a bit of skin showing between its edge and the top of his worn boots. His tunic stretched taut across his shoulders as his arms swung, his left one sliding across the scabbard he wore tied to his side for easy access. He was certainly a warrior on land, and might well be one at sea. She'd like to see him swing that sword. Did he ever train with his tunic off? The ferry slid to a stop on the sand at the end of a rope that was tied across the narrowest stretch between the aisles. Oh, there, the man called. Callum appeared and jogged down to help tie the ferry in place. Oh, Gavin, he called. Mistress Meg, Mistress Cecilia, welcome to Alba. He smiled appreciatively, but Cecilia looked right past him toward Beck. When I saw Gavin, I knew you had returned, Beck, the woman called. She was pretty, with dark hair and loose curls, most of it on top of her head. Her nose was tipped upward at the end, the slightest amount, and her pale skin looked smooth as milk. Cecilia, he said, nodding. Meg. My father has a letter for Adam, Meg said. Is this Mistress Alice that Gavin mentioned? She smiled warmly at Eliza. The dogs came tumbling and barking down the shoreline. Nay, eh, Gavin said. This is Mistress Eliza. Mistress, Cecilia said and laughed. In your breeches, I thought you were a lad. Then she shrieked as the dogs ran around her. Really, Beck, you need to tie them. 
Eliza sails and the britches keep her warm, he said. Pip and Anders ran down to the shore, along with Hester, who squealed, adding to the barking pups. Well, I for one would rather wear britches, Meg said with a genuine smile. Good to meet you. Eliza nodded and Meg laughed as Pip and Hester tried to ride the mother dog. And who are these? My children, Eliza said. All of them, Meg asked, her eyes widening. They were not born of her, Beck explained. She has taken them in. Like Grussel, Cecilia said. Different, but... Beck looked at her and then back to Cecilia. Aye. Right. Cecilia took his arm, pressing close to him. Eliza smirked and looked away. Droston, Meg called as Beck's brother came to greet them. So happy you're back. I made you some tarts. Lord, did every woman bake tarts for men here? Pip was trying to get the newly named Wolf to sit. Hester sat instead, which made Anders plop down on the dock laughing. Their humour made Eliza smile, and she exhaled. What did it matter if Beck liked the dark-haired Cecilia? Eliza and her family would be back out on the sea as soon as she could find Captain John. She had a duty on the seas, one that would take her across the waters of the world. Aye, it was her mission, one that Captain John had promised she could continue. She owed it to the lost and forgotten. She owed it to Peter. Eliza jogged ahead of them all and leaped up onto the cliffs. So. Even if the devil's blood had sunk, she would find another vessel on which to travel. The conviction strengthened her heart, protecting it from the worry growing each day Captain John and her family on board remained missing. No matter what, she was raised to sail and win the lives of innocence, just like Captain John. Her strides took her to the bowsprit that tilted out over the water. On the devil's blood she often climbed out on it, straddling it with her whole body so she could stare down at the dolphins that raced before the ship as it sailed. She was always careful, holding on to steel handholds that Captain John had placed onto it when he realised that he couldn't keep her off it. The Calypso's bowsprit was smooth white oak, and Eliza straddled it, sliding out over the water on her stomach, her legs clutched around it. She let her gaze drop to the water, gently lapping against the hull. "'Tis not Sifo here," Beck said behind her. Her limbs clenched around the wood. He followed me. "'Tis peaceful," she answered. "'Tis my favourite place on a ship." "'You should come into Guile and talk with the lasses." "'I think Cecilia would rather talk with you,' she said, pushing upright to glance at him over her shoulder. He stood on the deck, leaning out toward her. "'I'm not leaving you out here by yourself.' he said. You will either fall and drown or steal my ship, both of which will ruin my day. She grinned, slowly pushing back down the long wooden pole, aware that her ass was going first toward him. Once Bingley had said it was her best feature, and she shouldn't cover it with layers of petticoats. Eliza wriggled all the way down the pole, stopping at the bottom. She could almost feel his gaze on her ass. I like to watch the dolphins that swim before the ship while we sail. They're my favourite animal. Beck's gaze lifted from her arse to her eyes. He swallowed, crossing his arms over his broad, muscular chest. I never thought of a sea creature being anyone's favourite animal. She stepped down, adjusting her trues where they'd rucked up into the crux of her legs. They saved my life once, she said, and leaned back against the rail. In the distance, she could see the two ladies and their escort waiting for Beck. I fell overboard when we were sailing along the southern coast of Africa. There was a shark but the dolphins surrounded me until Captain John could swing the devil's blood around and throw a rope. Beck stared, his mouth slightly unhinged. You've either lived an uncommonly adventurous life, or you're an excellent liar. She smiled broadly. I choose both, she said, and raised one eyebrow. Beck chuckled as if he couldn't help it and shook his head. You are full of surprises, Eliza Wentworth. You have no idea, Beck Macquarie, she answered letting the hint of sensual insinuation dip and rise with the words. Even if she'd never let a man touch her that way, she'd learn the art of suggestive talk from the ladies at Clare's house. What type of adventure could she have with Beck Macquarie? On the sea, or in his bed? A single night with him, naked and teaching her things she'd only heard about, and she could walk away full of knowledge without worrying about any entanglements. Aye, an adventure of the most carnal kind. She could entice Beck to give her one glorious night, and then she would sail away. Chapter 7 
I can you imagine living on board a ship with all those dirty, crude men, Cecilia said, her fingers rising to tug absently on one of her many raven-coloured curls. Eliza shrugged. Captain John taught them some manners, and they keep their comments hushed when around the children. Cecilia and Meg McLean sat with Eliza, Alice, and Lark in a semicircle near the hearth. It had been a long day of exploring the village of Ormek with the children and trying to avoid being indoors with the crow, which is what Eliza had decided to call Cecilia, because she was loud and bossy, had black, glossy hair, and seemed drawn to sparkly things. As the temperature dropped with the sun and the rain began, Beck had started the fire to keep everyone warm in the great hall of Guylan Castle. The brothers, Gavin and Rabbi, moved about the hall, drinking, talking, and listening to the ladies. Callum especially seemed interested in what Cecilia had to say. She had a smile that could captivate men. The whole crew of the Devil's Blood would be fetching her whatever she wanted. Eliza tried to imitate the woman's smile, not too broad and not a frown. The tilt of her lips sat somewhere in between. The effort made Eliza's cheeks ache. She sat up straighter and smoothed the skirt of the lovely gown Lark had lent her. Even though she was more comfortable in her sea clothes, she would have been even more out of place without the feminine attire. I mean, Cecilia continued, the smell itself would make me more ill than the waves. Eliza took a drink from the cup of ale and set it back on the small table between the seats. They weren't too dirty and smelly, especially after a rainstorm. Cecilia's delicate brows tipped inward. After a rainstorm? Aye, Eliza said, nodding. The men would strip down, tie themselves to the masts so they would not be swept overboard, and rub soap all over themselves. The slashing rain would rid them of every speck of dirt and stink. Meg snorted softly, her hand going to her mouth. Cecilia looked like she didn't believe her. She looked back. Is that routine practice on sealing vessels? Eliza didn't let him answer. I'm sure Beck took advantage of the freshwater rains in such a way. She looked at him, a mischievous smile in place, because he smelled deliciously fresh when he rode over to me on Ellen Moore. Drostin spit his ale back into his tankard, and an explosion of laughter erupted from Egan where he stood behind Lark's chair. Meg laughed, and Cecilia's lips turned up in a smile, as if she did not want to be left out of the joke. Beck's chest moved as he smothered a chuckle, but he smiled. I'm surprised you could smell me when you kept me far away with your sword. She tapped her nose gently. It works quite well. They shared a moment, their gazes connecting. At least that was what Eliza felt. Adam strode downstairs, pulling Beck's gaze away from her. Eliza noticed Cecilia's frown had increased as she looked back and forth between her and Beck. Was she worried there was a fondness between them? Was there? If I had a nose that large, Cecilia said, I'd be able to smell it sword's length too. The poorly veiled cut would have held more weight if Eliza's nose were large in any way. Eliza nodded, leaning in to offer advice. If you let me break your nose, it will grow larger. The crow frowned, opening her pinched beak, but Lark cut in, trying to diffuse whatever this was. Your hair is quite lovely, Cecilia. Even with the weight of it so long, it curls beautifully. The woman toyed with a curl that sprang up along her shoulder as she tugged on it. Thank ye. I use chamomile rinses to keep the dark colour shiny. As if striking upon something interesting, she leaned slightly forward, her gaze going to Eliza. I hear that lice infestations run rampant on ships. Is that why your hair is short? You had to cut it all off because of lice? We are careful to eliminate the bugs when we leave the ports, Alice said, glancing at Eliza, her lips tight. Eliza's hand went to her hair. It had grown past her shoulders and hung in natural waves of blonde. I, I cut it short to blend it with our crew a year ago when we stayed in the West Indies for a month. Eliza caught Callum studying her hair. Did he think a louse might jump out of it? Tis such a bonny colour, Meg said, trying to make up for her friend, and grew him back so fast. Brothers, Adam called from the table, and beckoned them over. Gavin, a question about Tor's letter. The chief of the Macquarie's glanced at Eliza. Does he know something about Captain John? Eliza asked, standing up. Nay, tis about an English sea captain looking for Chandour, Adam said, with the last name Wentworth. All eyes turned toward her. Could he be a relation of yours? Adam asked. Eliza clutched her hands to stop herself from touching her mother's brooch tucked under her bodice. I know of no living family members. 
There had been her father's younger brother, who had disapproved of her mother, someone her father avoided. She'd never met him. I think the name is common in England. She walked over to the side table where she'd seen Callum pour himself a small cup of amber liquid. Lifting the stopper, she used her excellent nose to sniff at the contents. Whiskey. Lark was offering the ladies wine, but Eliza wanted something stronger to deal with the crow the rest of the night. So none of ye have any family? the judgmental woman asked. We have each other, Pip said. And the crew of the devil's blood, Anders added. Oh my, Cecilia continued, unless they've all drowned or been killed. Then you will have lost your families again. Eliza snapped around, her gaze landing on Pip's downturned face. Did Cecilia not know her words hurt the children, or was she purposely using whatever she could to make them all seem lower? Cecilia, Meg murmured. Are you so cruel as to bring that up to the children? Alice asked, her mild Irish accent turning fierce with her ire. I hope you thank the good Lord every day for your own family. She rose abruptly, picking Hester off the floor. Tis time for this one to find a bed. She marched indignantly toward the tower steps. Cecilia had the sense to flush red, her gaze going to Lark as if she had done harm to her instead of the kinless children around her. I apologise. My thoughts just tumbled out. I never met a group with such an unusual background. Eliza snatched up the glass flask of whiskey and some small cups that were stacked for easy tasting, and walked back over, nodding to Alice as they passed one another. Eliza stopped beside Cecilia's chair. We have each other, she said cheerfully, her gaze connecting with Pip. Even if Captain John is sitting on God's knee entertaining him by strumming his lute, we are together with food in our bellies and clothes on our backs. She nodded to Wolf, lying across Pip's legs, and Pups in our laps. Pip smiled back at her. Let us raise a toast to our crew, Eliza said, wherever they may be. Whiskey? Anders asked with a smile. Captain John had recently let him take a taste of the strong spirit. Can I have a nip? Pip asked. The only whiskey you'll be enjoying is the mother of your pup, Eliza said with an indulgent smile and nod to Beck's dog. Not until you are at least twelve. Twelve? Lark asked, her eyes wide. Eliza poured only enough whiskey to cover the bottom of one cup and handed it to Anders, and then poured herself a swallow. She looked to Lark. When Captain John rescued me from Jean Doe, he started teaching me to handle strong liquor. Most ladies on land drink wine or ale, Cecilia said, her eyes on the amber drink in the glass flask. Of course, Eliza said, pouring into three more cups. But when a scoundrel is trying to get a lady drunk, it is best for a lady to know what it tastes like and to build a tolerance so she can still think straight and gut the scoundrel if needed. Both Meg's and Cecilia's mouths dropped open. Do you want to know what it tastes like? Eliza asked, handing them each a cup, the fullest to Cecilia. Lark waved her cup off. I've seen the effects of whiskey too much. It certainly can bring out the worst in people, Eliza said softly, and poured it back into the flask. The other two ladies sniffed their cups. You do not need to drink it, Eliza said, and pointed to Anders. But watch how he does it so as not to act like a novice. Both ladies stared at the boy who straightened with the attention. He breathes in, throws the liquid into the back of the throat, swallows, and then breathes out the fumes. He did what she said, barely grimacing. It warms me all the way down, he said, grinning. Meg giggled. I'm going to try it, she whispered glancing over to the men who were engrossed in whatever Tor's letter said about Captain Wentworth. Tar will not let me at home, and Gavin will not leave our sight. She breathed in and poured the whiskey into her mouth much too slowly. Meg spit it back into the cup. Horrible, she said, making a face. Eliza chuckled and downed her own swallow with ease. It takes practice. Cecilia eyed the liquid. It makes one braver, doesn't it? Some say it does, Eliza said, although it makes some stupider. Cecilia took a deep breath, her shoulders rising. She threw the contents into her mouth, swallowed, and breathed out as if her mouth had flames inside. Ugh, she said, her eyes wide. Wait for the warmth, Anders said, patting her on the back as she coughed into her hand. Do you feel it? Cecilia wrapped both hands around her wine goblet and took a big drink. Lowering it, she nodded. Yes, tis hot, she said, trailing a finger down her front. Eliza nodded. You have the makings of a fine pirate, Cecilia. If you feel like taking a bath, Eliza indicated the window up high in the keep walls, we can strap you to the Calypso's masts, since it's raining. 
Anders doubled over with laughter. Cecilia smiled cautiously, as if she weren't sure if she was being made fun of. What is so humorous over here? Beck asked as the group broke up and the men joined them again. Eliza is teaching us how to be sailors, Meg said, smiling at her friend. Cecilia seems to be more fit for it than I am. Gavin took Meg's cup, sniffing it. Whiskey? he frowned. I spit mine back in, Meg said. Horrid stuff. But it makes one warm, Cecilia said, smiling up at Beck. Beck frowned at Eliza, and she smiled sweetly, batting her eyelashes. You drink whiskey with your crew, he asked. Only when we have something to celebrate, or forget, she said. And we sing songs, dance, and speak poetry, Anders said. Eliza's the best at that. The dancing around naked in the rain, I bet she is the best at that, the crow said, and hiccuped, which sounded like a squawk. Aye, the name suited her. Cecilia, Meg admonished again. Maybe the whiskey was loosening the crow's tongue. Eliza did not care if she talked about her as long as she wasn't making her children sad. Cecilia leaned into Callum's arm, her eyes on Beck across the way. There was an invitation in them, which irritated Eliza. Cecilia waved her hand, her fingers scissoring as if they were legs standing in a circle. Eliza dancing with her crew on a ship, if not naked, then in her man's clothes, smelling of rain and whiskey. No. Anders said, frowning. Eliza's best at telling tales and poetry. She makes them up on the spot. Tell them one, he said. Callum was looking down at Cecilia. Was he falling for her simpering? She reminded Eliza of the ladies in port who tricked the crew out of their money with unspoken promises and then disappeared. Whoring or thievery, both were wrong. At least Mistress Clare did not lie and act coy. Cecilia leaned closer to Meg, but her voice carried. She probably sleeps in and wears that one set of breeches every day, she tisked. Tell a poem, Pip said, picking up the heavy puppy and spinning around with her. Aye, Egan said. I'd like to hear something clever. Clever? Cecilia snorted and covered her mouth and nose with a pale hand that was surely smooth, not a callous in sight. Damn haughty crow. Eliza stood, her mind floating along the rhymes that might have something to do with a lady's fair attribute. She tried to keep the curses that made the crew howl out of it. I met a fair lass with curls the colour of night, lips ruby red and skin pale as moonlight. Cecilia smiled, holding up her pale hand and touching her dark curls. She teased and twirled, prompting songs from birds. Her smile and blinking eyes made all the lads hard. Egan laughed and Meg covered her mouth with both hands, but Eliza continued. But beware, my good men, Eliza said, leaning in to meet each brother's eyes. The bait do not bite, for her promises are hollow, and her legs are locked tight. Silence. Meg had her hands overlapped across her mouth, her eyes full of mirth. Lark's eyes were the same. Gavin looked appalled, and Cecilia's smile faded to a glare. What could Cecilia say? She could not deny it without looking like a loose woman and accepting the portrait of her made her look like a woman who lured men as a game. Pip clapped loudly, her smile bright. Well done, Eliza, she called out. It all rhymed. Gavin shook off his paralysis. And accurate, he said, his gaze sliding to connect with each of the Macquarie brothers. Mistress Cecilia's legs are locked tight until she weds. Same with Lady Meg. His hand waved in the air. And all the unwed lasses here. Shut tight, I see. The man's face had turned crimson. Or well, your dars will be sliced in my head from my neck, he said, pointing at Meg. Hiccup. Everyone looked at Cecilia. I feel strange, she said. A bit dizzy. Her hand slid against her stomach. The whiskey you drank, Meg said. Lord, could Cecilia be drunk on one swallow of whiskey? It had been a rather large swallow, but it was still just one. The woman stood up, and with a slight motion from Lark, all the brothers stood too, including Beck. Yes, definitely dizzy, Cecilia said, her hand going out to catch Callum's arm. Shall I escort you to your bedchamber? Callum asked, pulling her into his side. Absolutely not, Gavin said, practically climbing through the assembled chairs to pull Cecilia away from him. I will take her and Lady Meg up, tis late already. Rest well. Meg said with a smile, and followed after them. Beck's gaze went to Eliza, but he didn't say anything. She shrugged one shoulder. "'Twas one swallow,' she said, "'and she deserves any ache in the head that she gets from it.' 
Cecilia has a tendency toward jealousy, Lark said, and is no thoroughly think through her actions. She pointed at Callum and then the other brothers. You should all stay away from her. Even though we are supposed to be finding brides, Hagen asked, raising his eyebrow as if arguing her point. You were all trying to find brides, Eliza repeated. To marry? That is typically what one does with a bride, Drosten answered. Adam sat in the chair next to Lark that Meg had vacated. The Macquarie clan is all that she see here. The rumour of a curse from long ago has scared away all the families, but we are rebuilding our clan in Dial. To do that, we should each take a wife and start our own families. He took up Lark's hand, kissing her knuckles. She smiled at him, her cheeks pink and her eyes joyful. She looked truly happy to be bound to him for life. And rebuild the clan together, she said. They shared a nod, and she looked out at Adam's brothers. Be careful when choosing, for you will have her as a partner your whole life. Do you want a wife who slanders others, or one who will help you build a home with friends? I won't neither, Pip said, and covered her yawn with a hand, which made Anders and several others yawn. Like Eliza, I'm not marrying anyone. Eliza felt Beck's gaze. You are not planning to marry? Ever? he asked. She lifted her eyes to his. Her parents had married and seemed happy, but that was the only example she had known before meeting Lark and Adam Macquarie. No. I will captain the devil's blood when Captain John asks me to take over in his old age. Then you want children? Callum asked. Her gaze cut to Pip, who had taken up a spot near the hearth with the sleeping puppies, her own eyes closing. Wolf nuzzled against her face. I have children already. You've born children out of wedlock? Rabbi asked. She frowned at him. I could if I wanted to, but no. My children are those lost in the world, those who need a home. I have Anders, Pip, and now Hester, and I certainly do not need to wed a man to do that. Anders stood from his chair. And if a man gets Eliza with child, Captain John will geld and gut him. He joined Pip with the puppies. She met Beck's gaze. I can protect myself and my family, even if we do not find Captain John. But then you want love? Callum asked. Most lasses do. Eliza turned her face, meeting his stare. Love makes one weak, vulnerable. I would argue against that, Adam said. She turned to see the eldest Macquarie studying her. When you lose someone you love, the pain of it swells inside, choking you when you cannot pour it out on them. Tis like poison. But you love your children, Lark said, her brows bent, almost like she pitied Eliza. Pity went hand in hand with shame, and Eliza hated both. I, I pour the love for those I've lost onto them, and the children need it to grow properly. But I would never invite a full-grown man into my heart. She shook her head. Tis too dangerous. I would just hurt more when the sea separated us. Everyone sat in silence for a moment, and she took a sip from her cup. You're welcome to stay on Alva if you decide you would rather not return to sea, Lark said. You and your children. We can make one of the large cottages in town years. Thank you, but the sea is in my blood, Eliza said with a smile. But Lark continued. We plan to start a school soon with Gristle's children. Pip and Anders can learn to read and write and cipher numbers. She looked to where the two were falling asleep against the pups and smiled. You two, of course. We will have ladies from Mull coming over to learn. Thank you, Eliza said. I was taught before I was captured, and I've started teaching Pip and Anders. You read and write? Egan asked, obviously surprised. I read to the crew, stories from books they find at port. She smiled, thinking of the gruff men sitting on deck along the sides of the ship, listening intently. Even serious Kofi would sit, legs crossed out before him. Edgar would make them all stay quiet, and Bingley always wanted a story about mermaidens. Myths and legends are the favourite. Sadness tightened inside her chest, and she blinked, glancing down at her lap, draped in borrowed wool. Damn that pressure of love. I need to find them. We will, Beck said, right after the wedding this week. Maybe this Captain Wentworth has come across the devil's blood, Adam said. He's English, but he may be of help. Anyone hunting Jondo is someone I can work with, Beck said. The vehemence in his voice warmed Eliza. I think a couple of young sailors need to be put to bed, Lark said, tipping her head toward Pip and Anders near the hearth where they were piled up with the sleeping pups as if they were part of the litter. Beck stood, striding quietly toward the two. He lifted under Anders' arms and the boy woke. I'm too old to be carried off to bed, he mumbled, so Beck guided him, half carrying him. 
Eliza followed, picking up Pip, the big girl heavy with sleep. Do you want to trade? Beck asked. There were a bloody lot of steps in a castle. She nodded and transferred Pip into his strong arms. He held her effortlessly as Eliza followed, steadying Anders with his half-closed eyes. Perhaps the nip of whiskey had affected him, too. She'd have to build his tolerance to liquor before he was a man. Lord, the responsibilities of raising children were endless. Beck turned left when they reached the floor with bedchambers along it. Alice stood from a rocking chair next to the bed Hester was sharing with her and Pip when Eliza opened the door. Beck lowered Pip into the middle bed. Eliza guided Anders to the room next door, where there were two small beds. A splash of light from a lit sconce in the hall helped her guide him into one. No, Eliza, Anders mumbled. You too, she whispered back, touching the hair that had fallen along his forehead. Eliza turned and stopped short. Beck stood in the doorway, the light from behind his form casting his face in shadows. His wide shoulders filled the space, his hands perched on the doorframe above. Where will you sleep? he asked. She indicated the other small bed. In here. Tis comfortable. I can light your fire. It was cool, despite it being summer, but she was used to much colder on board a ship where they only lit fires when absolutely necessary. Fire was a wooden ship's natural enemy. She shook her head. We are fine without one. Tis a luxury to sleep without worrying about being dumped from our hammocks by an irksome wave. Luck was right, he said softly. If you're done a fine Captain John, or even if you do, you can stay on Wolf Isle. She shook her head. I cannot live landlocked. This is an isle, Eliza. You can stay with me on the Calypso. I am certain your future wife will be absolutely jubilant with that arrangement, she said. One of his hands lowered from the doorframe to grab the back of his neck, as if it were starting to pain him. I have no plans to wed any time soon. He crossed his arms over his chest. Isn't that your duty as a Macquarie? she asked, her brow rising in mock question. Marry and fill the eye with Macquarie lads and lasses. Any and all children will be safer here than on the sea, he said. She opened her mouth to deny something that she knew was true, but he held up his hand. Just something to consider, Beck said. Sleep well. He shut the door. Eliza listened to the hollow sound of his boots fading away. She sat on the edge of her bed for long minutes, listening to Anders breathing as he fell deeper into sleep. Would he have a better life growing up with the Macquarries? Pip and Hester would be safer from Jean and his ilk. Even if Eliza wanted to continue to sail the seas, they could stay. She could too, with Beck. She drew in a full breath feeling heat in her middle. Surely it wasn't the whisky any more. She'd barely had any. No, she liked the Scotsman. Without thinking further, Eliza rose and left the room. The corridor was silent as she padded down it in the slippers she'd borrowed. She counted the steps silently as she descended, her fingers following the rough stone in the dark. The arched alcove at the bottom kept her hidden from the room that still glowed with firelight. She peeked around the corner, Beck and three of his brothers were still there. Only Adam had gone to bed with Lark. That rhyme was clever, Hagen said, even though Cecilia looked like she'd just downed Bilgewater. Twas right vicious, Callum said, but smiled. Beck crossed his arms. She made Eliza angry. Cecilia could have ended up with a dagger in her gut. I think she was jealous, Drostin said. Hagen flopped back in his chair. Who? Oh, Eliza, Drostin said. She watched you, he said to Beck. Had she? Eliza frowned. Hagen grinned. Jealousy lands a lass in your bed. Beck's face pinched with annoyance. She's no fish. She is rather like a mermaiden, Callum said. Golden hair and a lovely tail. Eliza clamped a hand over her mouth so as not to snort. But she will not marry ye, Drostin said, shaking his head. Like Adam said, tis best to stay away from her. You need a wife. I know bastards or a clan is doomed. Hagen said, pointing at Beck with each word. I know how to prevent that, Beck said. Spill outside the lass, all three Macquarie brothers said in unison, and raised imagined tankards as if saluting. Drosting cursed. I swear we should have chiseled it on Dar's tombstone. Beck scratched fingers through his hair. What did it feel like? It looked as clean as the rest of him. Eliza felt a giddiness in her stomach. Beck wasn't married yet, and he knew what to do to prevent a babe from growing in her. Maybe this was her chance to learn about carnal delight, as Wretch called it. Choose wisely, Eliza. Captain John's words echoed in her ears. 
There was only one first time, no matter what the whores pretended. And Captain John had lectured her on the lies men tell to trick maidens into thinking they are honourable. But Beck was honourable, and strong, and good. Choose wisely. She stared across the hall at the large, well-muscled, clean-spelling Scotsman. I choose you, Beck Macquarie. Chapter 8 Beck strode briskly out the door in the wall surrounding Guylan Castle. Rain pelted down on him, the wind gusting the raindrop sideways. Even Eliza wouldn't try to steal his ship on a night like this. The lass was bold, clever, and rash, but she wasn't foolish. He trudged to the top of the rise that led down into Ormeg and to his cottage. He carried a candle enclosed in glass. Aye, it was good he'd left the castle, or he would be tempted to go back up to Eliza's room. Adam was right. He should stay away from her. As soon as she could, she would sail away, probably never to return. As he'd stood across from her in the hallway, watching the candlelight play across her lovely open features, he thought he'd seen something, something that beckoned him, more than her beauty and wit, hair down around her shoulders, and the gown showing her full curves. Eliza had looked like a half-undone woman, and if he didn't know better, which he surely did, she had looked like she wanted him to undo the rest of her. No bastards. You must marry soon. I won't be landlocked. Voices filled his head, scattering the heat her imagined look had started within him. Beck took a step down the hill and paused. Crunch. The sound of pebbles behind him made him turn. Eliza? She trudged toward him along the path. The heavy rain weighted her hair and gown, and she held her petticoats high, her slippers squishing in the increasing mud. She stopped before him, her face tipped up. Why are you standing out here getting soaked through? she asked. He wiped a hand down his face to briefly rid it of water. Why are ye out here getting soaked through? I— She licked the raindrops clinging to her lips, and he felt his jack grow under his kilt. I cannot sleep, and wish to see your dwelling. She bent to purposely look around him. I saw several completed ones today, but didn't know which one was yours. He stared at her for a moment, the rain tapping all around, and then turned to follow her gaze down into Ormeg, the one toward the back on the left near the tree line. She nodded, even though he knew she couldn't see a thing in the drenched dimness. She raised her arm to indicate the path. It would be helpful for you to hold your lantern ahead of us. These slippers are melting into nothing, and I would avoid the rocks. He lifted the lantern, and they continued on through the wind and rain, walking side by side into the town. The dark cottages looked like cairns lining the road. Why can he asleep? he asked above the wind. And as snores. He rubbed his hand over the tension in his forehead. Tis dangerous to walk out of the castle and find my dwelling by yourself in the dark in the rain and wind. Because of the wolves? she asked as they strode forward between the dark shapes of the vacant cottages. There are no wolves on Wolf Isle. He was sure she knew that. Oh, because of the ghosts, then? she asked her gaze still trained forward. There are no ghosts here. Then you are worried scoundrels will sneak up and steal me away? He sighed, seeing where she was leading him. There are no scoundrels here because there are hardly any people on the aisle, and ye are likely armed. They reached his door. She turned, putting her back against it, and smiled broadly, her damp face tilted up toward his. Raindrops wetting her long eyelashes made them into dark spikes. With the lamplight adding its glow to her face, she did look like a mischievous mermaiden who had come up from the depths to drive him mad with lust. I am always armed, she said, so you need not worry about me. She turned and opened the door to his cottage. Lightning splintered across the sky, followed by a crack of thunder. He followed her inside, raising the lantern to flood the room with golden light. He left the door open behind him, the rain filling the silence. He should close it, but would she feel like he was trapping her inside? Bloody hell, Eliza was complicated. She walked farther into the cottage that he had worked on over the last year, making it water and wind tight, like the Calypso. Layers of daub, the lime ash floor he'd laid, and the layered shale roof made the home cosy and dry, except when the front door was left open in a storm. Eliza frowned at it. The rain is coming in. Shut it before we have a flood to clean. He closed it and left the lamp on the table as he went to the dark hearth to start a fire. Spacious, she said, 
and he turned on the balls of his feet to watch her walk around the perimeter. Do you have company often? she asked, while staring at his large bed in the back corner. As you just pointed out, there are not many people on Wolf Isle. She turned away so he couldn't see her reaction. There's another room. She walked to the door off the back wall and opened it, letting the firelight touch inside. Tis a privy room, Beck said. Like you have on your ship, she said, turning. He smiled. I... I'm going to get Captain John to have one built on the devil's blood. He stood, watching her inspect the corners. Even doused with rainwater, she strode with pride and fortitude, considering all that she had endured being wet through was hardly an annoyance. She stopped at his bed and pulled open the shutter over the glass-paned window, but he doubted she could see anything out of it. Turning, her gaze moved restlessly about the room as if she were judging him by it. He only had one trunk and a table with two chairs besides the bed. How did she judge that? Eliza stopped at the shelves near him by the hearth, which held bowls and basic food supplies he had left before sailing. He felt the fire grow behind him, the heat fending off the chill in the air. It crackled over the sand of the beating rain. You cook? she asked. Between the hearth fire and the appreciation he saw in her expression, a foolish hope took root that she wanted more than to inspect his home. For myself, he said, and sat down at the table across from the bed. Simple things, really. Now that Jasper is cooking up a gale and I tend to wander up there for meals. So far Lark hasn't thrown me out. She continued her inspection, and he leaned back in the large chair, watching her. Do you approve? Clean, sparse, no offending odours. Aye, tis a nice home, she said and sat in the chair opposite him. Pushing back, she frowned. You have chairs for giants. My feet do not touch the floor. He smiled. I made them to fit my frame. She scooted forward, and he heard her slippers squish against the floor. A sigh came from her open lips. I'm dampening your chair and floor. No one worries about watermarks on a ship. I'm dripping to, he said. He found her a drying sheet and set it around her shoulders. She brought her hair over to one side to squeeze it into the towel, and he saw the pale smoothness of her nape. He inhaled and stepped back quickly before he lost his mind and placed his lips there. He couldn't tangle with Eliza. She might be a virgin. She might be fertile, and she definitely didn't want to get married. Unfortunately, the fire inside him didn't seem to care about the bloody curse or his brother's reminders. Eliza's fingers drummed across the polished wood planks of the table. Is that why your bed is so large? He blinked, not remembering what they had been talking about. Your large furniture? she said with a grin. Because you have a large body. He met her unblinking stare, the edge of his lips curving up. Sleeping is one of my favourite things, so I have a big, comfortable bed. And you have no problem sleeping here by yourself, all alone, except when you bring a woman back here to fuck. I've never brought a woman to my house, especially not to... You use that word a lot. Fuck. Aye. He watched the slight lift of her shoulders. It is what the crew calls it. What word do you use? I... I do not talk about sleeping with the last two others. Sleeping, she laughed, her voice going up. From what I have heard, there is rarely any sleeping going on when a man and a woman are. She moved her hand in the air and mouthed the word silently. On shore, Beck said, barely able to hold his chuckle, and not in a port town like the one where Mistress Clea runs her brothel. We didn't use that word, at least among ladies. I am no lady, she said. Ladies wear dresses all the time. She looked down at her bedraggled self. And keep them dry. She met his gaze again. They wear lots of fragrance that makes me sneeze. They're either whores or conceited girls who tease men to asking them to wed. I do not tend to use the word among men either, Beck continued. Perhaps when his brothers and he were drinking, or he hit his thumb with a mallet. How the hell had they gotten onto this topic? He cut the back of his head. If Eliza went to Mull and spoke about men and women fucking, everyone would say she was crass. Someone like Cecilia would make her feel like an outcast, and she would certainly leave. And I want up to stay. He dropped his arms back down. Eliza was beautiful, but besides that, she was the most interesting, authentic lass he'd ever met. He'd always sought simple lasses who might fawn on him, but Eliza, she was so much more. And he realized he wanted more. He frowned. She leaned forward and frowned back. Then what word do you use when speaking of... 
and she made a gesture with her two hands to mimic sex. Apparently she knew the basics of the act. His frown melted into a grin. I've never seen a lass do that with her hands. She waited, her brows raised. Well, he said, starting slowly. When talking amongst ourselves, over whiskey or in private without lasses are those easily offended. A lad may say swive, tap, sleep with, he thought. Frig, sand, nug. Some have been known to say they are loving. Love has nothing to do with it, she said, shaking her head. Captain John tell me if a man says he loves me, it is just because he wants to climb upon me and start rutting. Beck coughed into his face. What could he say on the subject of love? Nothing, and he knew Eliza avoided it. Another reason tangling with her would not work, if Gersel was to be believed about the curse. Beck and his brothers had to learn truths about love in order to completely break the curse on the isle. He pushed back from the table and found the jug of ale he'd brought down earlier, pouring two cups. All this talk about fucking was making him quite thirsty. He set a cup before Eliza and took a drink of his own. Your Captain John is accurate. There are a lot of scoundrels and rogues in the world, just looking to get up a lassie's skirts or in her breeches or whatever she wears. He cleared his throat. With guidance like that, it's no wonder you didn't want to marry. He swelled the ale in his cup, noticing how the hair had begun to dry around her face, curling up along her perfectly smooth jawline. She took a drink and shook her head. Wedding in fu- She stopped. Tapping have nothing to do with one another she said, confidence in her tone. I can surely tap a man without wedding him. He just stared at her, not sure what to say. Her hands flipped about when she talked to emphasise her meaning. She was passionate about her thoughts, her feelings. Would she be as passionate in his bed? He couldn't imagine Eliza being anything but, and his jack grew harder. The fire lit her face, but her enthusiasm added colour to her high cheeks. She wet her bottom lip, making him suck some of the ale down his windpipe. He coughed hard for a moment, and slid a hand down his mouth. "'Tis a wonder ye would want to tap it all, after ye've heard it described as a trick by scoundrels." Eliza leaned back in her chair, letting the bathing sheet slide to the floor. The damp dress clung to the lush curves he could see above the table. The neckline was low, and the stays pushed the rise of her breasts high as she inhaled. You do not know me well, Beck, but one thing I despise is not knowing things. She paused, as if considering her words carefully. When Captain John saved me from Jean I knew nothing, nothing at all about sailing or living on a ship. With Jean I only learned how to hide very quietly in small spaces. Beck's hands fisted on the table. If he'd known Eliza's history with a pirate, he would have fired upon Jean anyway, blasting as many holes in his ship until Cullen joined them. She cleared her throat frowning at him as if he weren't listening. I will kill him the next time I see him, he said, his words low. A small smile returned, and she sat up straighter on the edge of the Highlander-sized chair. Unless I kill him first, she said. Anyway, I asked Captain John to give me britches like the lads he had training on the lines for the sails. I learned faster than all of them and was climbing up high into the top castle of all the masts. After surviving Jean heights did not frighten me, nothing did, so I learned everything I could, including how to slice a throat or gut someone who wishes me harm. Beck set his hands on the table across from her. I have no doubt you know everything about running a large ship and a crew. She nodded. I do, but there are things in this world I know nothing about. I hate that. She folded her hands before her on the table. In the large chair she looked small, delicate. And you seem like a proper sort of fellow. You could teach me things, so I won't be ignorant. Such as he asked, his breath momentarily stopping in his lungs. Her hand flipped about again, like proper words and things other women know in the world, so I will not come across as ignorant. What did he know about other things women of the world knew? Luck will certainly help you fit in, Eliza. She frowned. I want you to teach me, like you did about the word fock being improper. You are honourable, clever, and will not mock me for my ignorance. What are these things that other women know that she want to know about? he asked, watching her closely. She leaned forward, but instead of answering him, she took a drink of ale and sat back in the seat. Well, she started, I know little about cooking and baking since Bart manned the galley on the ship and rarely let any of us in there. She took a big breath. 
and Beck tried to ignore the rise of her flesh above her neckline. Bloody hell, she looked wild and free and utterly delicious sitting there in the firelight. And needlepoint, she said, smiling brightly. Beck cleared his throat. You want me to teach you to do needlepoint? He rubbed the back of his neck. Her mouth opened, staring at him for a moment, and her brow raised. Do you know how to do needlepoint? Eh? Yeah. He shook his head, dropping his hand back to the table. But I could ask a lot to teach. That is not what I need to learn. What do you need to learn, then? Her mind was tangled, and he couldn't follow it. She wanted to learn proper ways of being a woman on land, and she wanted him to teach her? She folded her hands on the table, her fingers weaving between one another. I am a woman now, and the crew goes on and on about... She stopped herself. About tupping, as if it is the best thing in the world. It is practically all they talk about, drinking too, but tupping the most. She was talking fast, and Beck held his breath. It shows up in jests and swearing in poems and songs. She shook her head, and I know nothing about it. Nothing. She strung out the word, her shoulders rounding for effect. Holy Lord. Was she asking what he thought she was asking? He met her gaze, keeping his face neutral. You want me to teach ye about tupping? She straightened. I, she said with a gusty exhale, every little detail. His mouth dropped open like a fish caught on a line. What kindly heroic thing had he done in life for God to grant him such a request from Eliza Wentworth? Did she understand what that meant? But you're a virgin, aren't you, Lars? She frowned. Of course, or I would already know. There are a lot of things that can happen between a man and a woman, Eliza. Things that your crew may talk about that go along with topping. So you could... All of it. I want to know everything. Her fingertips bit into the edge of the table. From... Me? He asked slowly. Her brows pinched together. If you don't want to touch me, you can explain with words. Bloody hell, Eliza, I do. You do what? Want to touch you, Eliza? His hand fisted. If he saw my jack under the table right now, you would have no question about it. She ducked her head under the edge of the table. Tis covered, she said, coming back up. Her lips were closed tight as if trying not to laugh. Captain John said that if I ever want to learn about fucking, I need to ask a man I trust, one who won't rut on top of me only to sate his lust. You're not seeing this because you want to gut me. She crossed her arms, resting her elbows on the table. If you do not want... Fuck, Eliza, of course I do. She smiled broadly. You said fuck. She nodded. You teach me to do it and I'll teach you to talk like a true sailor. He couldn't stop the deep chuckle from coming out. She looked so happy, as if this had been weighing on her mind. Hell, what would he teach her? Every little detail. She wanted to learn everything. He wasn't celibate, for sure. He'd had his share of lovely young widows and lasses who came to him without their maidenhood. But everything? What exactly do you mean by every little detail? He asked. Talking was keeping him seated and not lunging across the table like a randy lad who'd found his first willing lass. He made the gesture she'd used before, his finger sliding into the circle his other hand made. He obviously knew the basics of what goes together. She nodded. Mistress Claire told me, and I've heard the act through her walls at the brothel, lots of grunting and crying out and panting. It sounds like a lot of work. Beck stared at her without saying anything, his jack hard as granite under his kilt. The fire crackled in the grate, and the wind whistled around the eaves, coming down the chimney, making the flames dance. If he ripped the table away between them, that might make her pull her knife. Arse. Get a hold of yourself. He took a deep breath. It can be vigorous. I get more than enough exercise on board a ship, climbing the lines and working alongside the crew. I should be fine. Aye, he said, his voice dropping to a rough murmur. I think you will do very fine, lass. His tone brought her gaze to his, her smile fading. Should we start now? she asked. Aye. Do you have any specific questions first? Because once they started, he would probably not be coherent enough to answer her questions with words. I want to know why it seems to consume everyone's thoughts, and then there are specific acts they talk about. Bloody hell. Such as? They talk about a woman swallowing or having a mouthful. She scratched her chin. Is there drinking or eating involved? 
Beck blinked. Not usually. And they talk about riding a girl, she said, looking across at him. I might be strong for a woman, but I know I could not carry your weight about, and— Wait, he said, and took a deep breath to rid himself of the scenes her words were creating in his mind. He pushed his chair back and stood, adjusting himself, although he knew there'd be no hiding his rigid jack tenting out his kilt. He walked around the table, and Eliza slid off her perch to stand before him. She glanced down. I see it now. He let out a chuckle on an exhale. Was God or the devil jesting with him? At the moment he didn't care. All he wanted to do was make Eliza Wentworth forget all about what she thought this would be like. She'd lived her life in different types of pain, and he wanted to open her world to pleasure. No bastards. Aye, he knew that. He'd kept his control enough over the years, and he would with her. Beck touched a curl that framed her face, sliding his finger along her soft cheek. He bent closer, his face near hers as he met her gaze, letting her see a bit of the lust that flamed through him. Eliza, lass, are you sure? She met his gaze fiercely. I, she answered, the single word coming a bit breathless. I choose you, Beck Macquarie. Chapter 9 Beck bent his head toward hers. The contact was soft against Eliza's lips, nothing like the few bruising presses against her mouth she'd experienced before. He pulled back, but kept his face close. You need to relax, Eliza. Relax, she repeated, swallowing. How is that possible? Her heart pattered like a drumbeat for dancing. He smiled and touched his forehead to hers. Eliza, he said, and dipped so that she had to meet his gaze. Ye are in charge. She didn't feel in charge of this situation now that she'd asked to be in it. If you change your mind along the way, whatever we do, tell me, and we will stop. His hand came up to slide through the heavy mass of her hair that was half damp, half a riot of curls drying in the humid air. Do you understand? She nodded, offering him a slight smile. I can say stop, and you will stop. She inhaled, trying to lower her shoulders, which she hadn't realized had crept up high toward her neck. And I need to relax? He smiled. Aye, and most people close their eyes when they kiss. Otherwise you go cross-eyed trying to see up that close. Eyes closed, she murmured, and he nodded. She closed her eyes, inhaling to loosen her shoulders, which kept creeping upward. She felt his breath on her lips, and his nose slid along hers gently. He kissed her cheek. Let yourself feel, lass, he whispered, kissing her temple. Oh, but you're the softest creature I've ever touched. His words unfurled some of the tension in her limbs. He kissed along her jawline, and she felt his large body press against her as his other hand wrapped around to strum down her spine. Her lips remained parted, and he brushed them with his own, once, twice, before kissing along the other side of her face. His mouth was warm and soft, but what caught her up in the sensation was the reverence the touch imparted. He moved slowly, his hand stroking her back as his lips touched along her face and then down her neck. Inside, the chill of unease began to melt. Beck was noble, and just like on the deck of his ship, he'd put her in charge. Eliza's hands rose to his chest, her fingers curling into the damp tunic that spanned it. They were both still wet, their clothes clinging to their skin. His mouth moved back to her lips, settling over them as his hand guided her face to slant, deepening the warm kiss. She inhaled through her nose, smelling him. Fresh rainwater mixed with his natural scent, a combination of the soap he favoured and wild Scottish wind. He tasted of the ale they'd shared. Her lips parted and his followed, their bodies pressed closer together. She could feel his jack, hard and long through his woollen wrap. She'd seen a number of jacks in her ten years living on board a ship with a crew of men, but they had hung low. Her hand slid down his chest and past the edge of his kilt to press against his length. Beck inhaled, reeling her in even closer with the pressure of his hand on her back. Large, like the rest of you, she said against his kiss. Her voice sounded breathless in her ears as the flame inside her grew. It stretched down her middle to the crux between her thighs, making her legs shift under her wet skirts. Breathing heavy, Beck pulled back, resting his forehead against hers. Eliza, he said, and backed up a small amount so that his body didn't press against hers. 
you need to know that there is sometimes pain the first time. He looked pained himself, all humour gone from his face. It was wild with want. Even a virgin could see that. But instead of making her worry, it just made the heat within her body roar. Alice told me about that. He exhaled. Good. Tis my job to soothe it away, he said, pulling her back against him. And are you good at your job? she said, teasing. I've never lain with a Belgian. His voice was rough as if he laboured. She smiled. Then this is the first it's something for both of us. A grin broke through the intensity of his features. Aye. His fingers slid on the sides of her head, threading through her wet hair. He must be cold in all this dampness. I'm actually growing a bit hot inside, she said, making him smile. And I think I would learn best without being cinched up like a chicken to be roasted. He stepped back and pulled his wet tunic off over his head. The firelight glowed against his tanned skin, and she swallowed. She'd known Beck was brawny, his strength evident in his movements and the way he handled his sword and the ropes on the calypso. But Lord, his muscles were bigger than any she had seen on a man, even Captain John. Beck's biceps mounded as he threw his tunic at the empty table. Muscles filled his chest, curving in waves down his stomach to his narrow hips, where the edge of his kilt sat low. A light trail of hair curled over his chest, down to where it disappeared under his plaid. His hair was cut to fall at his chin, accentuating his jawline and strong neck. He turned, bending over to untie his boots. The muscles of his broad back rippled in the firelight. Glorious, was all Eliza could think. The sight of him pushed away any doubts she had about wanting to be touched by this man. Oh, Lord, she wanted to be touched and to touch him. He turned back toward her, and she forced herself to shut her open mouth. Now your turn, lass. He made a circle with his finger, and she turned around. His steps toward her were quieter without his boots, and she felt his fingers push her hair aside to help slip off her outer jacket that matched the blue of the gun. She unpinned the stomacher in front, letting it fall with the jacket. She watched as his strong, nimble fingers plucked open the laces down her front, releasing the hold her stays had on her, allowing her to breathe in deeply. Her petticoat pulled around her feet as she slipped the sopping wet slippers off. She stood in her damp smock before him. Bloody hell, Eliza, lass, he murmured, an appreciative glance sliding down her form. Ye are lovely. And you are... She lifted her hand to indicate his chest. Bigger and stronger than any man I have seen. Tis making me feel, I don't know, soft inside. Was that how she should feel? It was almost like a fever, but the only ache was between her legs, and it was most unpleasant. She knew enough about her own body to know the ache there would lead to pleasure. She reached down her body, and his gaze followed. Beck inhaled as she touched herself through the smock, rubbing. I ache, Beck, she whispered, and her gaze dropped to his obvious arousal through his kilt. His large hand went to it, rubbing himself through the fabric. Oh, lass, I'm on fire inside, especially when you tell me how you feel. She smiled. Then I should keep talking. He stepped closer, touching her hair again with reverence. I, as much as you wish. She slid her palms down his warm skin and his face lowered to hers. Their lips touched and she slanted her face, bringing their mouths into perfect contact, as if she were an oyster shell and the kiss was unlocking her. The feel of him under her hands made her want more. She wrapped her arms around his middle as their kiss intensified, growing wild. She opened her lips, and his tongue moved inside, tasting. She touched it timidly, and he groaned, hugging her close. The linen of her smock slid against her skin, making it even more sensitive, the heat of Beck's body adding to the fire growing inside her. She stroked her hands down the cording of his body and moved them to her smock, rocking it slowly upward. She broke away from him, taking a step back. I want this off, she said, lifting the edge of the white fabric. His handsome features were tight, but he kept his gaze directed at her eyes. It was as if she were revealing more through her eyes than lifting the smock off her naked body, and he did not want to miss any of it. She broke the gaze when the smock covered her face. She pulled it off her head and let it fall into a damp heap behind her. She wore only the brooch that her mother had given her, the one she kept hidden under her tunics. Beck's eyes never left her face. You can look at me, she said, her words soft, and she took a step back toward the hearth, her toes curling across the cool floorboards. No one had ever seen her completely naked. 
Alice had cared for her when she'd had fevers and had helped her dress, but she had never seen Eliza naked from head to toe. Oh, worse. Beck's deep voice sent a thrill down her, and small bumps rose over her skin, making her nipples pearl even more. Tell me now if you want to stop this. His voice was rough, as if he restrained himself. Did he worry she would change him into a wild beast unable to stop? Did she have such power over this mighty man? A small smile eased across her mouth, and she took a step closer to him. She lifted the thin chain that held the brooch over her head. It clunked on the tabletop as she set it down, the chain following with a whisper. Touch me, Beck. Teach me what you know about pleasure. Without hesitation, Beck moved up against her, his arms surrounding her so that her breasts pressed into his hard chest. The contact shot sensation through her, making her breasts feel heavy. She rubbed her lower half against his still-covered jack, feeling how hard it was against her abdomen. Her fingers moved to his belt that held the wrapping in place, tugging. He helped, and the heavy wool dropped, the buckle thudding with it onto the floor. She didn't need to glance down to know he was massive. She could feel that against her, hot, hard, and reaching. But curiosity sent her hands down to him, and she wrapped her fingers around his thick jack. Beck groaned against her mouth as if he teetered on the edge of pain and pleasure. She slid her hands up and down like he'd done through his kilt. It was long and hard, nothing like she'd glimpsed the few times she'd seen men washing on the ship. He murmured something in his burbling Gallic language, something ancient that resonated within her chest, as if it called to her. He leaned over her with a kiss, and her hands rose to hold onto his shoulders, wrapping around the back of his neck, their naked bodies pressing together. Heat and sensation slid through Eliza like the strongest whiskey. But instead of numbing her body, his touch woke it, bringing her fully alive. Beck's large hands stroked down to cup her arse. Her breathing grew rapid as he lifted her up to rub the crux of her legs against his jack. The ache there grew, and she arched backwards so that his fingers could dip down her backside to reach between her legs. Please, she whispered against his lips. The ache? And then he found her his strong fingers dipping into her sensitive flesh. She moaned into his mouth. Lass, he said, breathing heavily and kissing a trail to her ear. Ear full of wet fire. Eliza lifted her face to the ceiling, closing her eyes to the sensation of his mouth working down her throat as his fingers delved within her, moving, seeking. Oh, God, she whispered, swallowing, fully surrendering her body to whatever his mouth and fingers wished to do to her. Catching her to him, his hand came around the front, finding her most sensitive spot as his face dipped to her breast. His kisses on her flesh turned to hot, wet suction as he drew her nipple into his mouth. Teeth and tongue teased her as his fingers stroked below. Bloody yes, she whispered on a gasp that turned into a moan as he played her body. He raised his head, kissing her lips, and they slanted together for long minutes. So wet, he murmured. I want to taste ye. You taste of ale and delicious, Beck, she murmured against him. She could feel him smile against her mouth as he backed her up slowly, until she felt the edge of the bed against her naked calves. I want to taste your honey, lass. Her mind tried to latch onto his words, but she couldn't make sense of them as he continued to rub his thumb back and forth against her most sensitive nub. The warmth of his kiss and the fire of his touch infused her entire body. Sit and relax, Beck, he said. His hand came away as he pushed her gently down to the edge, the soft, cool quilt under her arse. She opened her eyes to see him kneel, his intense gaze meeting hers. See if you like this, he said, and his hands pressed her legs apart, bearing her most intimate self to him. She caught her breath as he dipped his head, and she fell back onto her elbows. Her full breasts were perched on her chest, her stomach muscles tensing when she felt his hot mouth touch her. Holy hell! She murmured as wet heat surrounded her below, his fingers dipping back into her as his tongue teased and tasted. The sight of him loving her between her splayed legs was utterly erotic. This powerful man who could take anything from her at the moment chose to give. And lord how he gave. Eliza sucked in her breath as sensation shot up from his touch, rippling through her body, plucking at her taut lines tighter and tighter and then he pressed his fingers into her flesh again. Oh, God, Beck, she cried out, as the crest of the wave he'd built up within her curled over. 
she moaned, her head thrown back as the sound grew into a deep groan that filled the cottage. Pleasure shattered through her, and she sucked in large inhales of fresh air. The friction of his warm skin as he slid up her body stroked her senses, and she opened her eyes as he helped slide her fully onto the bed. He wore a wicked grin, his handsome face the most beautiful she'd ever seen. The firelight cast him in gold, the slight stubble of his beard and the appreciative bend of his mouth giving him the look of a scoundrel. Sweet, honey, he said. He leaned in, his lips finding hers as he lay next to her, his talented fingers teasing her tight nipples. Eliza glided her toes up and down his muscular legs. They were so strong. Her hands rubbed across his rock-hard chest, travelling down his taut stomach and abdomen to clasp his jack once more. Beck groaned against her mouth as she stroked him, discovering every nook along his length that made his breath catch. The ache grew inside her again, and she thrust her pelvis forward, rubbing against him. Beck's fingers teased her below, and her legs slid wide apart. I want you, Beck, she murmured against his mouth. And bloody hell I want ye, he said, as she felt him nudge against her. No, she said, as she lifted her knees, bracing herself with him right at the entrance to her aching body. He pulled his face back so they could look into each other's eyes. Intense, hard, and determined, Beck was beautiful, and he thrust into her. Eliza's mouth dropped open as his hugeness sank deep. The twinge of pain that she'd heard afflicted virgins was hardly noticeable against the surge of passion pulsing through her. Beck was huge, and the power behind his jack was immense. And all of it sent a thrill through her. His lips slid across her lips, and his fingers found her sensitive spot below, rubbing it. She moaned into his mouth and thrust upward, feeling him fully embedded. He groaned in return, but didn't move. I didn't want to hurt you, he murmured against her mouth. She pulled back, her hands going to the sides of his face, as he opened his eyes. You are not hurting me, but I might hurt you if you don't stop moving. Beck inhaled, his nostrils flaring open as if he were ready to charge into battle. Only the slight lift at the corners of his mouth softened the intensity chiseled into his face. He pulled almost completely back from her body and then surged forward again. Eliza's mouth dropped open as her eyes closed with the intensity of the pleasure. Aye, she cried, and he did it again. Again, she yelled, and he did just that, moving faster. Her fingers clutched his broad shoulders, anchoring herself as she thrust upward to meet his plunging. Even so, the power behind his thrusts pushed her up the bed. Finding a rhythm, their bodies surged and retreated while kissing, teasing, and rubbing. The fire building up again through Eliza burned away all thought. Oh, God, Beck! She felt the wave growing, the one that had crashed over her before with such exquisite pleasure. I... His finger moved across her nub, gentle but constant, teasing her higher and higher as he moved within her. The pleasure shattered, harder than the first time, plunging her off into waves of pure sensation. Beck! she screamed, her eyes closing and her body straining. With a roar of his own, Beck pulled from her body, rolling to the side. She opened her eyes to see him use the blanket to catch his explosion. His entire power-built body strained, the muscles mounded. She stared, her jaw open at the intensity of his pleasure as he poured himself into the cloth. Her body clenched as if wishing he was still within her. We can't have other bastards. His words twisted in her mind. Not that she wished to have a babe, there were too many lost in this cruel world. But the thought of a wee babe with Beck's smile and beautiful grey eyes made her chest squeeze. He rolled back to her, pulling her into his arms, his arms encircling her. She inhaled his scent as she nuzzled her face against the light sprinkling of hair on his chest. Their legs twisted together, and he tugged up the quilt to cover them. His fingers grazed her cheek, and she looked upward into those perfect grey eyes. She smiled seductively. I'm quite certain I chose the right teacher. He gave her a cocky grin. T'was just the first lesson. There are plenty more, lass. She drew a circle with her finger on the skin of his chest. And did I earn superior marks, teacher? He laughed outright, falling onto his back and pulling her to lie across his chest. The highest marks possible. He looked up into her face, his expression growing more serious. 
I've never met anyone like you, Eliza. Something inside her clenched, making it hard to swallow. His words, the feel of him against her, the respect in his gaze. Aye, Beck Macquarie was dangerous. He could slice her heart into a million pieces when he left her. Because all men left in some way. Through a need to adventure, or through death, or through wedding another, all men left. "'Twas another reason not to lose one's heart to a man. "'He stared at her, seeming to wait for an answer. "'She gave him a saucy smile. "'And I have never met any man who smells as good as you, Beck Macquarie. "'She inhaled along his skin, as if savouring a steaming sweet bun. "'He laughed, rolling her onto her back as he started to nuzzle along her skin. "'She gasped at the tickling. "'You smell delicious, too,' he said and caught her head between his hands for another long, leading kiss. Such pleasure couldn't be dreamt. Beck's eyes opened as a deep groan funneled up from his chest. Deep shadows sat in the corners of his cottage, the fire burned down but still giving off a glow. Was this another glorious fantasy about Eliza? A year, he said, his rasping whisper breaking the quiet of the night. The stroke along his rock-hard jack was no dream. Eliza? He glanced down his body and sucked in an inhale so hard his lungs could have jumped from his chest. The woman knelt between his legs, both hands wrapped around his length. She glanced up at him, a mischievous smile on her glorious face, her hair cascading down over her shoulders to tickle along his knees. Lesson number two, she said. I want to taste you. Her lips opened and he watched her mouth descend. Heat, good lord, wet heat enveloped Beck, and another deep growl grew, breaking from him. He forced his eyes open to watch her as the pleasure of her exploration shot through him. Oh, God, Eliza, he groaned as she worked along him back and forth. She was the most exquisite torture he'd ever experienced, making him stronger and weaker at the same time. Her hands worked with a rhythm along with her generous mouth, touching all of him, tasting him as he'd tasted her. She pulled back, and the coolness of the room replaced her heat. Tell me what you like, she whispered. Eliza was an angel and a devilish siren at the same time. She was everything alluring and intriguing. Her breasts hung down over him as she waited, continuing to stroke him. Everything, he said. I like everything you do with that fucking glorious mouth. She smiled broadly. You said fuck. I must be getting superior marks again. She didn't wait for him to respond, but dove back down over his rigid jack. His roar of pleasure filled the cottage, and maybe the night. I don't mind if people know, Eliza said as Beck walked with her along the path leading to Guylan Castle. They held hands in the dawn light. It was the first time Beck could remember being awake at dawn with a bloody smile on his face. He stopped, pulling her around to give her another kiss. Lord, why had he made her get up instead of keeping her next to him in his bed all this day? He pulled back gently, the reasons clearer when he didn't have his lips on her warm body. I dunno want to give anyone a reason to see something that will make you cut their tongue out. She chuckled, her fingers fiddling with the chain that tucked into her bodice. You think my feelings will be hurt? He looked straight into her eyes. Cecilia is still here and she has a waspish tongue. Maybe she needs to have it removed. He turned to gently tug her along. Exactly why we are up at dawn to sneak you back into the castle. Even if I say I want another lesson. She slid her hand up his kilt to squeeze his ass. With a playful growl, he pulled her around and swept her close in with his arms. He kissed her soundly, their mouths slanting together in a gloriously familiar way. He held her under her arse in the stiff and rumpled blue gown. His jack rose to the call for Eliza's further education, but he finally set her back down, pleased that her teasing face had relaxed into open want. He leaned in, tonight, on the calypso. Hunger sat in her eyes, and she let the tip of her tongue come out to slide along her bottom lip. He groaned and tugged her along behind him. I can't even look at you or I'll drag you off into the bushes. Her laughter made him smile despite the torture, and they walked up to and through the door in the wall to an empty bailey. He whispered into her ear, You should sneak up the stairs and go to bed in the room with Anders before he wakes. I'm not tired, she said, 
her voice sounding loud in the quiet morning air. He put his finger across her lips, giving her a for-the-love-of-God-stay-quiet look. Her lips curled up under the pressure of his finger, and she opened her mouth, sucking his finger inside. Her teeth grazed it, and her tongue swirled around it with perfect suction. His mouth dropped open. She slid her mouth off his finger and turned to saunter away, her hips swinging most provocatively. At the archway she glanced over her shoulder. Her gaze dropped to his fully tented-out kilt. She chuckled and walked into the keep. Sleep tight. Good Lord, how is he going to last the day? You're up early, Adam said as he walked down those same stairs. His brows rose as he saw Beck's obvious erection. He glanced back at the archway, and then at Beck, a frown growing. I thought you were steering away from her. Beck once again tried to adjust himself. She came to me. Adam exhaled, crossing his arms over his chest. You can't get her with child. Even if the curse isn't real, people make it real by believing it. If they hear ye father a bastard, they will never settle here. I see anger froze away the desire that had infiltrated him. Bloody hell, Adam. Do you not think I know that? I spilled outside her. Adam looked back at the stairs. Tis no guarantee. He shook his head. Would ye wed her? Beck exhaled, rubbing a fist against his forehead. She says she will not wed, ever. Adam stared hard at him. You should break off whatever is between ye before either of ye gets attached. She will be leaving soon and ye will wed someone else. Beck frowned. Adam was the eldest and the chief of the clan. Is that an order from a chief? If it needs to be in order to safeguard the clan. Thank you, Beck swore. Before you were all, I didn't believe in curses, Beck mimicked his brother. It didn't matter to ye that Locke is a bastard. Adam took a step closer to stare evenly at his brother. We found out from the Bible that it isn't a matter if the bride is a bastard, only if we father them, which ye will if ye stay with Eliza Wentworth and she will not marry ye. Well, she is not one, Beck said. She is an orphan who has lived with rough men for ten years. It can take some time before she is ready to wed anyone. Or she will not all, Adam said, dropping his arms and striding toward the bailey. Beck caught up to him in the dark entryway, slamming his hand down on his shoulder. His brother turned abruptly toward him, ready for an attack, but Beck just stared at Adam's shadow. Is it your order that I stay away from her? he asked. Because I need to know if I'm breaking my allegiance to my clan or no. Beck, Adam said, you may just be intrigued by her. A lass was alluring, and one you know will not tie you down. What do you mean? Adam's outline in the dark stepped closer. We all know you don't want to settle down with one lass yet, but we need you to. You know there are three other Macquarie brothers, Beck said. They are welcome to start. It does not have to follow oldest to youngest. So what then? Adam asked. You follow Eliza with a calypso? Tuppen until she does get with child but still will not marry ye? Maybe I'll leave the aisle, Beck said, his voice low. Would he do that? Leave his family for a woman he had only just met? Was his attraction to Eliza that strong, or was he just annoyed by Adam's dictates? Adam's hands fell onto his shoulders. Ye are a Macquarie wherever ye roam. But if folks didn't know if a bastard had curses on a reel, then it wouldn't matter what I do as long as no one knows. Adam exhaled, dropping his hands from Beck's shoulders. Ye would give up your family for a lass ye just met, one who may or may not be a pirate herself. Beck raked his hand through his hair. Damn it, Adam. Try to pull back some from her and see. You need a clear head, and top on her will just cloud it. Promise me you will think about breaking off whatever you've started with her. Beck released his breath in a huff. Aye, I will think about it. Good. Adam turned, walking out into the morning air, and Beck followed him. In his mind he saw Eliza sailing away with a crew of pirates. He must marry for the sake of the clan. Damn. Was Adam right? Should he cut things off with Eliza? Now, before this heaviness in his gut grew any weightier? Chapter 10 I did not expect you to be a timid mouse, Jasper said, even though his back was toward the door where Eliza peeked into the kitchens. She had found the building sitting in a herb garden off the back of the keep. Eliza stepped inside, glad to see that the cook was alone. I am no mouse, she said with a small grin. Just trying to find a kitchen in this huge place. She liked Jasper and his gruff quietness. 
He reminded her of Kofi, a serious protector on the devil's blood. Eliza had bathed with the strawberry soap Lark had left her, but didn't want to dirty another gown, so she put the rumpled one back on. Alice was talking with Gavin McLean in the Great Hall, while Anders helped Pip and Hester train their new pup, so Eliza was free for the afternoon. She cleared her throat. I would like to learn how to bake tarts. Jasper studied her for a long moment. He was large, with markings on his forehead along the edge of his very short hair, like tattoos, but light-coloured like scars. What type of tart? he asked. Do you know what type Beck likes the best? After the night they'd had, where the pleasures had been delicious, she wanted to give him something delicious in return. Jasper snorted softly, the edges of his white teeth showing as a grin crept across his mouth. All the brothers like sweets. Beck likes apple honey tarts best. He beckoned her over with a flowery hand. And we will cut the apple so the tart looks like a rose. Eliza smiled broadly. That sounds perfect. She might never be a lady, but she would surprise Beck with something else that made his mouth water. I said, do you care for my gown? Cecilia's sweet voice had taken on an irritated twist as she stood beside Beck in the bailey. The whip-like branches of the mostly dead willow tree danced in the breeze. He nodded. I very rich indeed. Where was Eliza? He hadn't seen her since she'd climbed the stairs that morning. Her children and Alice had been about all day, playing with Whiskey's pups, talking to Gavin and Lark. Anders had brought a foldable wooden tables board down for them to play. In all that time, Beck hadn't seen Eliza, and he must talk to her. To say what? That they couldn't continue her education because she wouldn't marry him and might doom the isle if he got her with child? Bloody hell, it sounded ridiculous. But standing there before the cursed willow tree with a dagger in the trunk, the curse was all too real. Adam was right. Real or not, if his brothers and others believed in the curse, Beck must do what he could to break it, which included learning to love and marrying if he wanted to have children. Cecilia smoothed the pale mauve petticoat. Let us go inside. This damp bear is ruining my curls. He walked with her inside and into the great hall where the others sat. Everyone except Eliza. Lark spotted them and stood up, carrying a goblet. A cup of my brew to settle the stomach, Cecilia. She studied her face. You still look a bit green. Cecilia frowned. Whiskey is poison, and we still have to ride the waves back to Mull. She looked to Lark. Do you think I angered Eliza last night and she sought to poison me? She drank from the same flask, Meg said. Cecilia turned her gaze on Beck. Then she certainly must drink a lot. Could she be a bloodthirsty pirate? She shivered. She sails, Beck said. Her captain is a privateer for England. That makes her a pirate to the Scots, Cecilia said. I did not see her as bloodthirsty, Lark said, taking a seat within the semicircle. Just displaced and unsure of what will happen if her captain is not found. It must be frightening. Meg smiled, her eyes wide. I do not see Eliza Wentworth fearing anything. Pirates show little fear, Cecilia said, as if she were an expert on the subject. They just resort to trickery until they find a way past whatever disaster they've created for themselves. She leaned toward Lark and whispered, I would hide any silver and valuables you may have here, Lady Macquarie. Beck sat down heavily in another chair. Eliza is no thief. Really? Cecilia asked, her lips pinched into a tight line. Where did those poor children get that nice set of tables? And the gown her woman Alice is wearing is made of silk? Would a simple sailing woman own such clothes? They could be gifts, Meg said, her voice low. Tor McLean's daughter was much more positive than Cecilia. How had Beck ever thought Cecilia McLean bonny? The more she disparaged Eliza and her family, the uglier she became. Meg cleared her throat. I think you're feeling unwell, Cecilia, and it is making ye see faults where there are none. None, Cecilia said, her brows rising. They looked too dark on her pale face. The woman curses, wears men's trues and swigs whiskey. She seems to know nothing of the womanly arts, or how to care for a house unless it is rocking up and down on the waves, and the children are being raised to be wild heathens. They have lived through some terrible events, Beck said, his voice low with an edge of annoyance. We all have, Cecilia said. The woman had lost her mother young, and her father often left her alone as he journeyed off Mull. 
She had her share of difficulty, and it seemed to come out in waspish ways. That is no excuse, huh? If they were my children, I would make certain they learned manners and how to live in society. Lark stared at her. You do not know the horrors they have all seen. She wrapped her shawl tighter around her shoulders. That she was in the clutches of Captain Jean Doe. Well, it is a miracle how she survived it. Makes me wonder how she survived it, Cecilia said, opening her eyes wide. The insinuation that Eliza may have kept her life by whoring cut through Beck like the sharpest blade. His usual forgiving nature bled out with it, his jaw becoming painfully clenched. They say men are crass and tactless, but it amazes me how black-hearted a woman can be. The small smile fell away from Cecilia's face. I didn't mean anything bad about her. I'm just saying she may have had to compromise herself to keep that terrible captain peaceful and giving her treasures. Chandor giving Eliza treasures. He was brutal, torturing, raping and selling children and women. He was the devil himself. Eliza was twelve at the time, Beck said, his voice rising. And the treasure ye see he gave her was to see her family slaughter before her eyes. Gavin strode across toward them at the uproar. Cecilia's hand went to her bare chest above the lace-edged bodice. Well, this is coming out all wrong if I'm raising your eye, Beck. I'm just saying that a woman who has obviously won luxuries from a seaman with whom she has lived. Not the Jean d'Or captain, but the one she has lived with since then. Well, she could possibly be given out to her favours in return for things. She tipped her head and looked at Beck with innocent eyes. I didn't want to see you be the laughing stock of the Macquarie's. And who knows what happened to her at twelve, ruining her for any honourable man, she whispered. Lark's chair scraped as she stood abruptly, her face red as she stared down at Cecilia. You have no knowledge of what it might be like on board a ship filled with men who rape and slaughter. If you can't find a way to kill yourself, you're at their mercy. And a woman who survives should be applauded for her cunning and strength, not whispered about and ridiculed. Captain John, who rescued her, is like her father, Beck said. Who left her on an isle to starve? Cecilia said softly. Perhaps he has grown tired of her. Meg's face had gone white as she stared at Cecilia, her mouth open. She looked to Gavin, who wore a frown. I think it's time for you to see us back to Mull before Cecilia's foolish tongue gets her in more trouble. Good Lord, I've done it again. Cecilia looked apologetic. Perhaps this man who cared for her as a daughter has just fallen to bandits, she said, her eyes wide. I meant nothing untoward. I'm speculating about the peculiarities she shows, the strange clothes she wears. She is like no one I've ever met. She looked at Beck, who stood with his arms crossed. I'm sure Eliza has the morals of a saint. A saint, came Eliza's voice from the hallway. She laughed. Hardly. She walked into the room, her arms holding a flat board covered with some type of pastry. The gold-streaked waves of her hair floated unadorned around her shoulders, with several wisps curled tightly to caress her flushed cheeks. Jasper walked behind her, looking more like a bodyguard than a talented baker and cook. Just the sight of Eliza relaxed Beck's shoulders even as he held his frown. She'd been in the kitchen with Jasper. Tarts, Jasper announced, walking over to a small table that held a water basin and pitcher. He lowered both to the floor and lifted the table, bringing it over to the hearth for Eliza to place the board upon. Perfectly baked tarts sat in three rows, each looking like a rose and smelling of apples and cinnamon. My first tarts, Eliza said, her smile full. She opened her arms wide over her creations as if revealing them. She wore a flower-covered apron over the rumpled gown from last night. A smear of flour lay across her forehead as if she'd brushed a strand of hair away. Jasper is the best teacher I have ever had, she laughed, her gaze going to Beck. At baking, that is. She smiled at him, her eyes dancing with mischief. Lark, Meg, and Cecilia all turned to stare at him, but he kept his face neutral. Go ahead, take a bite, Eliza said. She lifted one and went over to Beck, holding it up to his mouth. She didn't seem to pick up on the stilted silence in the small circle. Beck inhaled through his nose, his gaze searching Eliza's beautifully exuberant face. To think of what she had been through over the years, how people as snobbish as Cecilia could hurt her with insults, how she could have been raped and sold by Jean Doe ten years ago. It stuffed his chest until it felt it would burst if he could not hold and protect her. But right now, 
staring into her joyous expression. He was going to eat whatever she put before him. He opened his mouth as she pushed the tart inside, almost choking him. He coughed, raising his hand to hold the rest she hadn't crammed in. Sorry, I thought your mouth was bigger, she said, her tone sounding wonderfully wicked. She winked, which drove home the fact that she was being wicked. He smiled around the tart, chewing. Damn, he was supposed to tell her they must stay apart. His smile faded. How does it taste? she asked, her smile dropping. Worry bent her brows. There is honey, apples and cinnamon. She glanced at Jasper, who stood stoically watching, and then back to him. Everything you like in a tart. He turned his attention to the apple cinnamon sweet on his tongue and made certain to smile, despite being highly aware of the judgmental silence behind her. Delicious, he said. My favourite. And he meant it. The tart was the perfect balance of sweet, tangy and spicy. Just like Eliza. Her face relaxed, the pinch in her forehead releasing, and her smile opened to fill her expression with joy. The result caught Beck, making him unable to breathe with the beauty of it. Behind her, Cecilia made a small noise. Did you stay up all night baking those? she asked. For Beck? And just like that, the light of joy snuffed out of Eliza's face. She turned around slowly. Did Cecilia, a teasing smile on her face, know how easy it would be for Eliza to throw one of the ski and doos she kept on her person? Beck stood still chewing, looking for hints of pending murder. But Eliza lifted the tray and turned in a small circle. I bake them for you all, she said, and carried the tray around so Gavin, Meg and Lark could have one. She stopped before Cecilia. Cecilia made an obvious perusal of Eliza's unadorned appearance. You went straight for him, shoving one of those things in his mouth, she grinned, her gaze going to Meg before leaning in slightly. We could teach you not to be so obvious about who you like, she whispered, but it was loud enough for all to hear. Oh, I do like Beck, Eliza said, her voice loud to contrast against Cecilia's mock whisper. But I would be happy to give a tart to people I do not like as well. Eliza set the tray back down and lifted one of the pastries, turning to bring it before Cecilia's lips. Open wide. It looked as if she would shove the sweet directly into Cecilia's mouth. I love the way the apple looks like a rose, Lark said, trying to pull Eliza's attention away from smothering Cecilia. Behind her, Callum and Drostin walked into the hall, striding directly over to sample the treats. Oh, yes, Meg agreed. Almost too pretty to eat. The best I've ever had, Callum said after taking a bite, his eyes nearly rolling into the back of his head. Eliza set the tart she held for Cecilia into her lap and turned, bringing the tray over for Anders, Pip and Hester to take one. Perhaps you could become a baker, Cecilia said, dusting off her petticoat with a pinch of annoyance on her mouth. So you wouldn't have to dress nicely. She looked Eliza up and down. You look like you went right from a rainstorm into the kitchen, Mistress Eliza. Or did you sleep in your clothes, rising early to impress us with your culinary skills? Eliza looked down at herself as if she was trying to remember what she was wearing. Her cheeks turned red, and Cecilia grinned as if she'd won some sort of contest. Eliza looked up her gaze connecting with Cecilia's superior look. The flush in Eliza's face remained, even as it hardened into determination. Mochrach, he'd have to jump in front of Cecilia to save her life. Beck stood again. Cecilia shook her head. Perhaps you could come back with Meg and me to Mull. Not if she bakes like this, Callum said, his flirtatious grin in place. It added more irritation to Beck's anger. Cecilia kept her gaze locked on Eliza. Meg and I would be happy to help you learn the ways of a gentle maiden and how to tame your wildness. It will help you find a man. Oh, Eliza drew out. She set the tray down on the small table and untied the dirty apron, pulling it from her water-stained gown. I have no need, Mistress Cecilia. She turned to her, standing in the centre of the half-circle before the hearth. I have no desire to be gentle, and I am no maiden. Bloody hell, Eliza was giving credence to what Cecilia had speculated. He wanted to shout that she'd been a virgin as of last night, but bit his tongue. "'Tis what I thought, Cecilia murmured, a smug smile on her face as she glanced at Lark and Meg. "'Tis such a shame.' Eliza's brow furrowed, not knowing what she was talking about. 
and Beck wanted to pull her away from the cruel rumours that would abound. Could he warn Cecilia not to say anything back on Mull? A shame, Eliza said, a half-grin tipping up her lips. She looked at Beck, slanting her head. I would say it was bloody splendid. Drostin choked on a mouthful of tart, and Callum's brows rose high. Cecilia's mouth opened in surprise, as did Meg's. Lark held a hand to her cheek and glanced over to where the children were playing, hopefully out of earshot. Eliza, Beck said, trying to warn her, but Eliza turned back on her enemy. Oh, Captain John certainly kept me a maiden, but I will never marry, so I saw no real need, she shrugged. And since I am a woman who wishes to know things in life, like how to bake tarts and how to swive, tup, fornicate, or fuck, Gavin started coughing into his fist, so Eliza raised her voice. I found a teacher. She turned to smile openly at Beck, one who did not seem to mind my wildness. Eliza made it abundantly clear who she was talking about, although perhaps he disapproved of my wet gown because he stripped me right out of it. With that, she walked up to Beck, threw her arms around his neck, and planted her lips right onto his. Chapter 11 It wasn't a soft kiss that she gave Beck, and it wasn't made for passion. It was made to punish the crow. The woman was horrible, pretentious, mocking, and obviously planning to talk about her to everyone. If Eliza had any plans to remain on land, it was clear that Cecilia would be her enemy— not that Eliza wanted to stay on land, but she was stuck here for the moment. After their night of reveling in the feel of one another, Beck's lips were familiar, even if he was stiff. Well, hell, she hadn't asked him if he cared that the others knew they had lain together. She'd apologize later. Right now she had a point to make. Pulling back, she avoided Beck's eyes and turned, her rumpled petticoat twirling out in her haste. She made certain to wear the smile that Captain John said looked like a cat who had just swallowed a bird. No need to trouble yourself, Eliza said to Cecilia. There are plenty of people here on Wolf Isle to teach me the skills of being a woman. Jasper is teaching me to bake, Lady Lark can teach me to pull up my hair, and Beck will teach me everything I need to know about being a wild, well-pleasured woman who can suck out a man's strength while making him roar my name. Everyone stood in silence, utter horror lighting Lark's and Meg's faces. The others gaped. Only Alice smiled and shook her head. Reckless, that's what she called Eliza, especially when it came to dealing with those who tried to shame her. Eliza lived with enough shame on her own. She refused to let anyone else add weight to her burden. In the silence, Callum slowly stretched his hand up high. Uh, I can teach you too. His eyes raised above her head to where Beck stood, and Callum cleared his throat, his elbow bending so that his raised hand rubbed the back of his neck instead. Uh, about farming the land. Uh, I'm right good with a shovel and know the best way to enrich the soil. His nose wrinkled. But, um, I guess that isn't something a lass does, necessarily. Egan, Adam, and Rabbi walked into the hall, going first to the table to retrieve tankards of ale. They looked like they'd been working outside, sweat and dust on them. Adam pulled his cup from his mouth and looked over at the silent group. Have we missed something? Hagen asked. Lark stood slowly, a small grin growing on her face. Mistress Eliza made us tarts, and they are splendid. She walked over, looped her arm through Eliza's, and drew her over to pick up the tart pan. Lark escorted her as if they were best friends. They walked to the table and all three men grabbed up their tarts. Adam's gaze had questions in it as he looked to his wife. And Gavin was about to escort Cecilia and Meg home to Mull, so if you have word for Tor, ye better give it to Gavin now. These are wonderful, Egan said, chomping on a tart. Rabbi said something too, but it was difficult to understand with his mouth full, crumbs catching in his scraggly beard. What Rabbi's trying to see, Adam said as that Grussel sent eggs to thank us for the blanket. Muriel and her toddlin' lass are outside with them. Why didn't he ask them inside? Lark asked, frowning. She grabbed the last two tarts off the tray. She didn't want to come in, Rabbi said. Just stood staring at the tree. Come out to meet Muriel and little Lark, Lark said, squeezing Eliza's arm. She led Eliza toward the entryway of the keep. 
Eliza glanced over her shoulder to where Gavin was signalling Meg and Cecilia to stand up. And Beck? She wasn't sure what was going through his head. His face was serious as his gaze followed her. Droston said something close to his ear, which just hardened his face even more. Had she gone too far to knock that condescending smile off Cecilia's face? At least she hadn't drawn anyone's blood. Stabbing someone would surely be looked down upon more than revealing that Beck was a talented lover. Lark continued to talk. Muriel named her bairn after me for helping her escape Jean d'Or while she was pregnant with her. Eliza caught Lark's gaze. I'm sorry you both had to experience that monster, Eliza said, her words soft. Claude Jean d'Or will burn in hell for the things he's done. Lark squeezed her arm. Just having been in the man's clutches for an hour, I'm astounded and think you're the bravest woman I know, Eliza, for having survived for two weeks. They stepped into the dark entryway, Lark's words burrowing into her. The kindness in them picked at the lock Eliza kept on her memories of that terrible time, memories that pressed disallowed tears behind her eyes. Lark. They paused in the darkness, arm in arm. Yes. The darkness made the words flow more easily, and Eliza didn't try to staunch them. Maybe if they flowed out of her, they wouldn't ache so much. I watched him defile my mother, him and his men, she swallowed. But he did not touch me. I, I could do nothing as a child of twelve to help her, so I closed my eyes. They stood in the darkness, and Lark pulled Eliza into her side. I, I did nothing, Eliza whispered. For any of them, not even Peter. He was only three. You could do nothing for them, Eliza, she whispered, except survive. I know that your survival was the prayer your mother was saying through it all. Eliza sniffed up the tear that had broken loose. I will never be helpless again, and I will never be that selfish again. Her chest clenched, making it difficult to breathe. I absolutely believe that, Lark said, but she was only answering the words Eliza was willing to speak out loud. They stood in the dark, unmoving. So, Beck, was your choosing? Lark asked. The restrained anger in the question made Eliza look at her, but she could see only a shadow. Did she worry that he tricked her into giving him her virginity? I, I chose him, Eliza said. Turning her mind from her shame, it was easier to breathe. I almost thought you might refuse me. She could feel some tension leave Lark's arm as she chuckled slightly, and started them walking again. They stepped out into the evening air. I doubt he would refuse you anything, Lark said. Why? Lark lowered her voice. You didn't see the way he watches you? No, do you? Lark smiled. Every time you enter the room? Perhaps he thinks I will steal something or stab someone. Lark laughed. My brother is rather open with sweet compliments to lasses, but I've never seen him really look at any of them. It's like he wants to figure you out. Lark's words made Eliza's stomach feel strange, like a flutter that spurred her heart to beat faster. And I think that is what's made Cecilia lose her mind and manners, Lark said, her laughter gone. I'm sorry for that. She stopped to look into Eliza's eyes. We would love to have you stay here on Wolf Isle, you and your family, even if things do not work out with Beck. Work out with Beck? Did that mean love? The children already had lines tied to her heart. She refused to add another. Before Eliza could reply, Lark called a greeting to the woman standing in front of the tree with a little girl who helped her hold a basket of eggs. Muriel, Lark said, this is Eliza, a new friend of ours, and she has a little girl just a bit older than we, Lark. She dropped Eliza's arm and went over to bend before the pretty girl with ringlets the same colour as Hester's. Muriel smiled. The two can play together, along with wee John, of course she said. Behind them, the dogs ran out of the keep, followed by Anders and Pip. Alice came holding Hester, who wiggled to get down so she could run after them. The two little girls stopped before one another for a moment. Hester giggled, and they both ran off after the puppies. I best follow them, Alice said, and continued after the toddling blonde girls. Behind the dogs, Gavin escorted Meg and Cecilia out, followed by Beck and his brothers. Excuse me, Lark said, and hurried over to them. Meg lifted her hand to wave to Eliza and Muriel. She's a love, Muriel said. Meg? Eliza asked. Muriel snorted. I'm definitely not talking about that waspish black-haired braggart. She shook her head. Meg puts up with Cecilia because she's a cousin. 
Eliza grinned. I like you, Muriel. Muriel chuckled, smiling. Well, now our wee ones can be friends, and we can too. It gets a bit lonely here on Wolf Isle with only Lark, Grussell, and the younger girls about. Eliza opened her mouth to say she would not be staying, but Muriel kept talking. There are two other lasses who've been living with us now, the young mother said. Although we get some who stay for a spell and go after we help them back onto their feet, poor things. So you help Grussell run the orphan home? Eliza asked. Aye, she smiled, standing straight. Our cottages are spread along the southern shore. Tis a place for pregnant lasses too. They come when there is nowhere else for them to go. We take them all. Rich, poor, young, old. Some have been treated sorely. Meg's mother and aunt are healers and come over from Mull to help with the births in early days. They are godly ladies. Alice walked over to the rising portcullis to speak with Gavin. He smiled sweetly at her. Eliza's gaze shifted to the brothers where they followed Beck out. And what of the Macquarie brothers? Muriel smiled. Brawny bunch of men. They train all the time as if they expect other clans to come war on our isle, trying to take it. I think they've learned a lot about being civil from Lark these last two years. All they talk about is repopulating the isle and the Macquarie curse. Ye know about the curse, don't ye? That no bastards can be born to the Macquarie brothers, and no one can chop down this tree, or they can't father any children, that curse? Eliza asked, her gaze sliding over to where Beck was speaking to Cecilia. Eliza couldn't see his face, but Cecilia glanced her way, her eyes wide, before turning her back and walking away with Gavin. Ay, Muriel said. A sad story about a lass with a bastard growing in her belly, the sin of the Macquarie chief at the time. She hanged herself, and her mother cut the bairn free, raising the wee lass to hate them all. Eliza turned back to stare at the woman. Did she kill the chief? Muriel shook her head. Nay, but she cursed the clan. She pointed at the blade in the tree. Thrust that in the tree, still wet with her daughter's blood. And the tree remains dead, Eliza whispered. But there are little green buds on it, Muriel pointed. They never open up. Even in the dead of winter they sit there, as if waiting for the other brothers to learn to love. Tis romantic. Eliza's face whipped back to her. Learn to love? Aye, twill break the curse fully, and the Macquaries and Wolf Isle will flourish once more. Eliza just stared at her, and Muriel shook her head. Ye really didn't know much about the curse, she shrugged. They didn't like to talk about it. A cunny father a bastard. No matter how often Beck and she would come together like they did last night, he would spill his seed outside her. Did that matter? No. At least she didn't think so. But he would need to marry and learn about the elusive emotion called love, something she believed to be more tale than truth. Her chest squeezed tight, and she rubbed her hand over it, feeling her mother's brooch pressed there under her smock. I better get back with little Lark to our cottages before the sun goes down, Muriel said. Tis nice to meet ye. Ye should come out to our home to see Gersel. Aye, Eliza said absently. What would a child made by Beck possibly look like? It was have blonde hair and a mischievous smile. She walked with Muriel out of the gate and turned toward the tall masts of the Calypso, tethered at the end of the long dock. The ship seemed to call to her as her mind tumbled around everything. No one was around. Alice had followed the children and dogs down the path to watch the crow waltz her fluffy ass off the aisle. Beck had walked with Callum that way too. Tisk, she said, and gathered her rumpled petticoats to stride down the wooden length toward the unguarded ship. Anyone could untie you and sail away. She patted the gunwale as she climbed aboard. I've touched every part of her. I love her more than any person except my brothers and Adam's family. Beck's words surfaced in her mind. What would he do if someone captured the Calypso? Eliza walked to the far side, needing to feel the familiar shift of water under her again, and looked out at the calm surface. The sun began to set off to the right, casting an orange glow over the sea as if the orb itself had sunk into it, dissolving into a thin layer to stretch across the top. She inhaled, smelling the mix of salt and land, the seaweed and fresh breeze off the water. She felt pressure behind her eyes for a moment, and shook her head. Damn, she missed her family, the crew of the Devil's Blood, and Captain John. They had replaced her mother, father, and baby brother. Was that love? Had she already lost her heart to them all? The crew was often dirty and crass, but they were loyal and brave, and would never harm a child or rape. They stole and brought down ships, so some would call them pirates, but others would call them saviours. Eliza certainly did. I will talk with him again, Adam's voice drifted toward her from the path, the sand carrying over the flat water. 
Eliza padded over in the slippers Lark had lent her and peeked around the side of the quarter-deck to see Drosten and Adam walking the path toward the ferry dock. He's apparently tuppener, Drosten said, and she has no desire to wed. If he gets her with child, our whole clan is doomed. He knows to pull out, Adam said. Drosten snorted. That's not foolproof. Any other lass, if he got her with child, would marry him, but Eliza isn't any other lass. No, yeah, she is now, Adam said, his voice gruff. What did that mean? That she wouldn't dress in fancy gowns and preen her curls like Cecilia? And I won't marry him. Eliza felt her cheeks grow warm. He seemed amenable to breaking it off when I talked with him this morning, Adam said. Breaking it off? Adam was going to stop giving her tubbing lessons, kissing her, helping her. Breaking what off? Blasted fucking hell! The two men walked until she couldn't hear them any more. She turned, swatting at her rumpled dress. Bloody petticoats, she said, feeling the tightness in her throat as she leaned against the boards at her back. One word from his brother and Beck was cutting her off. Son of a jackal, she whispered. She traipsed toward the captain's cabin, going first to the private Jake's, feeling the need to be somewhere small. I'm not hiding, I just have to pee, she told herself. To fit in the room, she lifted her skirts up high so that they surrounded her. Stupid costume, she said, half falling out of the stool, her hands swatting viciously at the raised layers of fabric. Men wrapped women up in stays and skirts to imprison them. Break things off. Squeezing the stupid layers out of the privy, Eliza strode to the wooden chest at the end of the broad bed to find stacks of trues, tunics and woolen hose, and a leather captain's coat. The coat was heavy and smelled of beck. Clean man, fresh sea air, leather. Damn Scotsman! She ignored the warm sensation that trickled through her like a waterfall thawing in the spring. He must be furious about what she said in front of his family. Ashamed of her, Eliza's face burned. She had no idea that Adam had warned him off of her. Damn meddling brother! What happened between her and Beck was their business only. Except when you tell everyone in the Great Hall about it. She pressed cool palms to her cheeks. Nay, she said out loud as if the word could stop remorse from settling in. She would never let someone pile more shame on her, not Adam or Drosten or Beck, and especially not a waspish, tactless woman like Cecilia. Eliza had enough regret about her character as it was. Reckless, unthinking, selfish, and oh, so stupid when she got mad. She pulled out a set of trues and a tunic. In minutes she had tugged off her petticoats, bodice, stays, and smock. After donning the trues she found a rope that could hold them up around her narrow waist, and the tunic was wide enough to accommodate Beck's broad shoulders and chest, so she tied the extra fabric in two places to keep it closed. Eliza headed out the door to the mainmast. As on the devil's blood, with each push against the iron rung to lift her higher, she felt like she was rising above the chaos and pain in the world. Higher and higher she climbed, feeling the sway of the ship enhanced by the height. She inhaled the sea breeze like it was clear, cold water, and she was dying of thirst. The cool air was a balm to her flushed face. The enclosed top castle was perched near the very tip of the soaring mast. She climbed within and leaned back against the encircling side, her legs straddling the opening around the mast. Gaze stretching out over the glossy water, she felt the pressure of loss again, and pinched the brooch through her linen tunic. What should I do, Mamma? she whispered. There were so many problems. What to do if she couldn't find John? What to do about Beck and his family? Lark had said she could stay on Wolf Isle, but Adam wouldn't want her here unless she married his brother. And if Beck wanted to stay away from her, she'd just shown his entire family how stupid she was. I would travel on to surrounding isles looking for Captain John, she said to the sky. Should she return to Ellen Moore and wait? She'd left a note for John there, scratched into the wall of the chapel, pointing him to Mull. Eliza scanned the entire horizon that she could see from her perch, leaning around the thick mast. Damn you, John, she whispered. You left me landlocked. Landlocked with a brawny, enticing Scotsman who was planning to break things off. The thought pressed on her heart. I won't give him a chance. Eliza? Beck's voice shot up to her, and she ducked. Are you hiding? Bloody hell, I don't hide any more. She straightened, her fingers curling around the taut sail lines. What do you want, Captain Macquarie? To know what you're doing up here. Finding some peace. Are you wearing my clothes? She could tell from his voice that he was standing directly below. I cannot climb up here in petticoats. 
No fretting. I will return them. I'm not a thief. He cursed. I didn't believe anything Cecilia insinuated, he said, his voice gruff, making her look down the sturdy pine trunk that had been polished and planted in the centre of the calypso. His head was tipped back, and she studied the pinched lines on his tanned face. The crow said I was a thief. Crow? Overbearing preened black feathers, always squawking and easily attracted by sparkly things? He snorted. Cecilia is jealous of ye, and not a very nice person to begin with. So she had accused her. Another flame of anger licked up inside Eliza. Apart from helping Captain John acquire items for the children and women captured at sea, she did not steal. Below her, Beck gripped the iron rungs and began to climb. Before she left, I told her that she'd end up with her hair cut off or herself stabbed, if he heard that she was repeating anything you just said inside. She could feel the mast shake under Beck's weight the higher he climbed. Should she let him know what she'd overheard? You don't want people to know you were teaching me about tupping. He came level with the bottom of the small top castle where she stood, ducking to poke his head up through the hole where the mast soared. Do ye? he asked, his one brow raised high. Looking down, she shrugged. It makes no difference to me. I won't be seeing them. Nonchalance was her best defence. He frowned and tried to climb higher, but his broad shoulders would have to squeeze together for him to make it through. Why didn't he come down? I will when I'm ready, she answered. Did you like the tarts? He blinked, pausing at her switch in topics. Aye, very much. A slight grin grew over his frown. Especially if you made them for me more than the others. She looked back out at the sea. I told you that I like to learn things, throwing daggers, at a swive or tup or whatever you call it when on land, and, she looked back down at him, how to bake tarts. She swallowed as they stared at one another, the fading light making his grey eyes look dark and roguish. I doubt very much you would take money for your lessons, so I decided to pay you in your favourite tarts. Bloody hell, I would never take money from you for tuppen. He looked so angry at the thought that her stomach relaxed a bit. Like I said, I will pay you in tarts. His hand reached up and wrapped around her bare ankle. She'd left the useless slippers below, using her toes to help steady her on the climb. You will not pay me anything, Eliza. Now come down. The rough skin of his hand slid around her ankle in something of a caress. How could a simple touch of skin on skin and a few words spoken in his burbling northern accent send warmth through her? Eliza looked away, shaking her foot free. I don't think your future wife would like you teaching me to tup. Perhaps we should not have any more lessons. Oh, he said, his tone even. But a wife is quite far off in my future. She stared down at him, her brows pinched, the anger curling tighter inside. Your brothers certainly expect you to wed soon, to help them break the curse of Wolf Isle. Damn, he murmured, his lips pinching. That has nothing to do with us right now. She could no longer play this farce. Didn't Adam tell you to stop whatever this is with me? Her voice exploded. Because he knows I won't wed one of his brothers and start breeding to populate the isle. Her arm flipped around to encompass Wolf Isle, as if she were depositing squalling babes everywhere. Bloody hell, Eliza, he said, his teeth clenched together. Did he see that to you? Her hands gripped tighter to the wall of the top castle. I just figured I'd save you the trouble of breaking things off with me. Come down. I'm fine right here. It was a place he could not reach her, and she could not reach him. For if she could, she might do something dreadful. Like kiss him. It might be the last time. She looked back out over the water so that she wouldn't keep noticing his generous mouth and remembering what he could do to her. You need no advantage, Beck Macquarie. You have a mission to marry and breed, and I am a troublesome woman who might condemn your isle. Damn it, Eliza. The mast began to shake, and she looked down to see him pressing upward. What are you doing? she yelled. You can't fit up here. The hell I can he? he said, pushing one arm up through the hole until his shoulder appeared squashed against his head. The second shoulder and arm followed, and he shifted his large body upward until it engulfed a small space. Eliza pressed her back against the curved barrier. There was nowhere to retreat with his muscular body pressed against her. It was all she could do to arch her back so as not to smash her face into him. Eliza, look at me. She kept her fierce frown, but met his gaze. What did Adam see to ye? he asked. The heat from his body permeated the tunic she wore. It drew her like the damned sun on a winter's day. 
she swallowed, staring him in the eyes. I overheard him and Drostin talking. Adam said that he'd talk sense into you this morning, while I was stupidly baking tarts. If I had known that you'd been amenable to his warning, I wouldn't have— She flapped a hand toward the castle. I would have found a different way to shut the crow's mouth. Eliza. Beck's hands came up and gently rested on her stiff shoulders. Damn his strong, warm hands. She fought not to turn her cheek into one. For a moment she closed her eyes until she remembered that she'd sworn never to close them again when cornered. She snapped hers open to meet his beautiful grey eyes. What? I didn't agree with Adam this morning. I listened to his concerns. Then what did you tell him? He frowned. Nothing. So he thinks you agreed with him, she said. Beck looked to the side. I'll talk to Adam and Droston. And what will you say? Your brothers apparently believe in this curse, and you are sworn to help end it. She shook her head. I will not agree to marry any man, and your wife, whether it be haughty Cecilia or Anna or some other— I'm not wedding anyone any time soon, he shouted. Why, you are, she shouted back, and smacked her open hand on his chest. Nay, I'm not. Your brothers say otherwise. I do not fucking care what my brothers say. I'm not marrying anyone. Aye, you are. Stop saying that, he said, his gritted teeth coming closer to her. You cannot stop me from— Beck's mouth crashed against her lips, completely stopping her from speaking. For a moment she pushed back angrily, wanting to punish him. But then her arms wrapped around to the back of his head, holding him to her, and their lips slanted eagerly against each other. Smashed together in the top castle, there was no space between them— but still Eliza pressed into Beck as if they could become one being. I want him always. The thought surfaced like a boy to grasp in an angry sea. Even if she lied to herself, in that moment the thought was so intense that it was truth. Beck's mouth moved to her ear. I want no one else, he whispered. Did he too lie to himself in that moment? Eliza didn't care. It sounded like truth, and she clung to it, her hand sliding along his broad shoulders. She tried to reach under his tunic. I need more room, she said, breathless, her face tipped to the darkening sky as he kissed along her exposed neck, plucking a line down to the core of her. The wind blew, making the mast sway. Come down, he said, the words deep and full of promise. She nodded, and he slid down her body. The stroke from her neck to her legs left her breathless. Her toes grasped around the rungs as she descended right behind him. As soon as he leaped to the deck, he grabbed her around the waist, lifting her down and into his arms. He kept her against him as they moved to the side facing the sea, twilight growing the shadows there. Wildness erupted between them, hands and mouths touching. Within minutes their tunics were off, and her ridiculously loose trues were pulled at her feet. Only the wrapping around Beck's hips and his boots remained. She shivered, and he pulled her into him. We can go to my cabin he whispered as he trailed warm kisses down her neck, his hand cupping her full breast. Nay, she said, I want you here. She moaned as he found the ache between her legs. The sand of the lapping water drew her gaze, the last glow of sun fading below the horizon. She turned toward it, backing into Beck so his two hands could find her easily. You're so sweet, he inhaled against the delicate skin of her neck. She rubbed her bare ass against the hard jack behind her and heard his heavy kilt and belt drop to the deck. His large hand gripped her waist and she arched into him. Beck's other hand played her inside and out until her breathing grew rapid. Beck, please, she called into the night, her words travelling out across the water. He played with her one breast as she squeezed the other, her breath catching as she felt him slide between her splayed legs. She tilted forward, her hands grabbing the lines before her that soared up from the rail. Arching back, she felt him seek her. She spread her legs farther, and he thrust up inside, making her gasp at the fullness. I, she moaned, and heard his answering groan at her ear. Arms pulling her into his chest, he thrust long and deep as his fingers stroked the skin of her abdomen down to rub her. Skin slapped against skin as they found their rhythm straining together in wild, primal need. Could he feel how her body tightened inside, the ache that coiled tighter? God, Eliza, Beck breathed at her ear as he thrust. Reach for your pleasure, lass. His hands grabbed hold of her hips, his strength dizzying as he pounded into her. Aye, she yelled, the darkness shattering with a great pulsing of ecstasy. She held his arm against her as wave after wave of pleasure rolled along every muscle in her body. Jimma, 
he rasped against the side of her face and pulled back. She felt his body tighten and his release start, but she didn't let go of his arm. A laser, he groaned, his body straining as he exploded inside her. Chapter 12 Swallow it down would have to do with what I did to you the other morning in your cottage, Eliza said. But instead of you spilling outside, you spill in my mouth? She asked, a grimace in the tone of her voice. Aye, right, Beck answered as he held her against him with one hand, his other raised to hold the back of his head on the pillow. The two of them lay curled together, naked in his bed in the captain's cabin on the calypso. Is it palatable? She asked. The vehemence in her question made him smile as he looked at the planked ceiling. I don't know, have an answer for that, he said. I will ask Luck. He turned his face toward her. Nay. Why not? Tis no a question ye go about asking someone. It is improper in society. She rolled her eyes. Society is fucking complicated. She smiled wickedly for using the crude word that she favoured. He chuckled. Aye, it is that. For the last half hour she'd been questioning him about all the things she'd heard the crew of the Devil's Blood talk about after they'd gone whoring in ports. It was helping to distract him from the thoughts that had whipped through his head upon waking that morning on the Calypso with a glorious siren in his arms. She could be with child, a bastard born to a Macquarie. I didn't believe in a curse. How can I convince her to wed me? I can't let her leave. They'd come together two more times, through the night, each time just as explosive as the first. However, he'd managed to spill outside her during those two. No bastards. The words echoed in his head. Words he'd heard from Adam, Drosten, Rabbi, even fun-loving Callum. I'm a fool. You were worried, she guessed, pushing up out of his arms. Twas just once. The odds are with us. She leaned in to kiss him, and he tried to give her an encouraging smile, even though he had no idea what to hope for. If she were not with child, she would leave. Fool. Even if she were with child, she would leave. She wore his tunic and the brooch around her neck. He caught her between his fingers to stare at the wild cat etched on it. He always wear this. Tis important to you. Her smile turned sad. Twas my father's, and he gave it to my mother. Tis the only thing I have left of her, so I, tis important. Tis the Wentworth crest, he asked. Gems were locked in the setting. It was probably why she kept it hidden down her bodice all the time. She shrugged. I just think of it as a piece of my mother. To her it was very important important enough to give to me for hiding when the pirates boarded. Her smile faded and she lowered again to lay her head on his chest. Who were her parents? Wentworth was a well-known name in England. Tor said it was connected to royalty. Shivers ran through him, his jack twitching to attention, and he looked down his chest. The tip of Eliza's finger drew swirls along the taut lines of his abdomen. If he keep that up, school will be back in session, he said. She laughed, pushing up on her elbows. I can now see that riding a woman has nothing to do with a horse, she said, and all thoughts of heritage dissolved as one of her full breasts peeked out of the gap at the untight neck of her tunic. Eliza caught him staring at them. She parted the neckline, letting the tunic drop low, and scooped up both breasts, lifting them like pale sweet buns. And these would be what wretch calls two plump partridges. Uh, I suppose so, but I've never met Wretch, so I don't know, he murmured, lifting his mouth to draw one of her rosy nipples between his lips. Even her skin tasted good. Eliza's fingers tangled into Beck's hair, holding his face to her as she made a sound very much like he did when he was sampling tarts. And taste her honey, she said, her voice breathy. Is what you did to me before we came together the first time. He lifted his head, his hand expanding against her lower back to pull her in closer. Aye, would you like me to show you again? She looked into his eyes, her smile spreading into a mischievous grin. With her wild curls lying in hues of gold around her shoulders, and her gaze full of promise, she was the most beautiful sight he'd ever seen. Aye, Scotsman, she said, her voice dipping to imitate his brogue. She slid her hands up to hold the sides of his face and lowered her mouth to his, kissing him as she slid her naked body to lie completely on top of his. Somewhere in the distance Beck heard a noise, but he was too drunk on Eliza to care. Rap, rap, rap. Eliza broke the kiss, her head tipping. Someone is on the ship. Beck, you in there? 
Blast it, tis Adam, Beck said. Neither of them moved. Rap, rap, rap. The knocking had moved to the cabin door. Go away, Adam, Beck yelled. Tis too early. If Eliza's in there, ye two need to get dressed and come out. We have visitors. It better be the bloody king, Beck murmured when Eliza pushed up off him and turned to grab her incredibly rumpled dress. Give us a moment, Beck called as he unfolded from the warm, fragrant sheets. Eliza glanced at his stiff jack and she smiled. We are definitely picking up where we left off. Just her mischievous look made him want to grab her to him. To hell with Adam and his visitors. But Eliza threw on her smock and stays, yanking the front closure tight, the round brooch sitting outside over her breasts. Ah, oh, but her breasts called to him. Beck groaned as he snatched up his tunic and wrap, cursing under his breath. Morning alone tested his patience, but this was beyond simple annoyance. Eliza opened the door and her hand went to the dagger that still lay in the pocket tied around her waist. Beck's brother stood with another tall Scotsman and a shorter man dressed in an English sea captain's uniform. They created a semicircle before the door as if about to take her prisoner. Beck's hand landed on her shoulder, pulling her back slightly into him. You're more than Chief McLean, he said. Adam? The third man was older, about the same age as Chief McLean. His eyes were grey and haunted, little white lines cut outward from the corners, etching his tanned face as if he too spent most of his days squinting against the sun. It was the look of a sailor, a military man, not a pirate, because he was clean-shaven, his hair clipped and his uniform clean with the ridiculous ruff that English sailors wore. The man studied her. You have the look of Richard, he said, his voice heavy but precise with his English accent. His gaze dropped to her chest, and Eliza realized her brooch was still out, balanced over the rise of her breasts to fall across the stomacher. His hand rose toward it, but Beck stepped in between. Eliza stared at Beck's broad back, her fingers curling into the fabric. Richard? Her father's name had been Richard. Who are ye? Beck asked. Taking a full breath, Eliza stepped out from behind Beck. I will not hide. I am Captain Thomas Wentworth of King Edward's Royal Navy. My brother was Richard Wentworth, who wed Anne Tyrell and left with his two children for a station in Ireland back in 1535. They never made it. All this he said while staring at Eliza. And do you wear the Wentworth brooch? No one said anything, and the man, Thomas, took his hat from his greying head. When I inherited Richard's position, I joined the Royal Navy under King Henry to hunt for details about the murder of my family. One crew member from the Ireland-bound ship, the Rose, had pledged allegiance to the pirate who boarded it, sparing none. The turncoat alone survived, and I tracked him down to find out the name of the bastard who killed my brother, his wife, his daughter, and his unbreached son. Breath came haltingly as she stared at the man. Claude Chandot, she said, her voice but a whisper floating on the silence that sat between them. Thomas nodded once. I have been hunting him ever since, but the French bastard is slippery, and either down in the West Indies or hiding behind the throne of King Francis, acting like a privateer instead of the bloodthirsty pirate that he truly is. Thomas's face had turned red with his passion. Beck squeezed her hand and she leaned into him. I thought only to find Chandot and see him hanged but then I captured another vessel off the coast of Ireland. The captain said he was a privateer for King Henry, but I had never heard of Captain Henry Coxwaddle. The name shot into Eliza's middle. Captain John! She turned to Beck, her fingers curling into his tunic. He has Captain John! She turned back to Thomas. The only lie he told was his name. He worked as a privateer for King Henry. We've been waiting to hear back from King Edward. Thomas Wentworth scratched his forehead. Well... If the new king had an inkling that his cousin was alive and on the devil's blood, he may have responded sooner. Cousin, Adam said, and all eyes turned to Eliza. The man nodded. Aye, and of course my brother Richard, if he was still alive, are great uncles to the new king, his grandmother Margaret Wentworth being our sister. Eliza waved her hand in the air. Lineage was not nearly as important as her crew. Where is he? she asked. The king is currently at Whitehall. No, she snapped, frowning. Captain John Pritchett, who uses Henry Coxwaddle as an alias. She stepped closer as if to grab the English captain. Is he well, and ho, oh, and the crew? They are the same colourful mix of rabble I intercepted two weeks ago. I was sailing them from Ireland to London for trial when the captain told me about you, Elizabeth Wentworth, saying you were on Ellen Moore. 
I rerouted to the aisle, only to find it abandoned. But, he leaned forward, I found your message to Henry Coxwaddle etched into the wall, which led me to Mull and Chief McLean. They are imprisoned at Aros Castle right now. Eliza drew a ragged breath. Captain John and his crew saved me from Chandot. When I told them I had no family back home, he kept me, raised me as his daughter. Selfish and lazy, Thomas said, his face hard. They should have investigated. Nay, she replied, selfish would have been trying to ransom me back. She curled her lips inward, wetting them. You must free Captain John and his crew this instant. Thomas shook his head. Regardless of their role in protecting you, they are pirates without the backing of King Edward and his regent, Admiral Seymour. But they had the backing from his father, King Henry. Thomas shook his head again. There is no registered John Pritchard, nor Henry Coxwaddle. Believe me, I know the registration lists by heart. It has been my mission all these years to coordinate all the ships sailing in the Atlantic. I must see Captain John, she said, dodging around the men. Thomas caught her wrist, halting her. I just found you, Elizabeth. You even have the Wentworth seal about your neck. You are my only family, and I would talk with you, tell you of the life waiting for you back in England. She turned, meeting his eyes that had taken on the shine of emotion. We can talk later. Right now the only family I know is sitting in the dungeons at Aros Castle. She snatched her hand from his grip with a twist, yanked her cumbersome ruined skirts up in one hand, and stormed barefoot down the plank to the dock. Eliza, Beck called and caught up to her. She stopped, turning to him, her face set in granite determination. What was he thinking? What was she thinking? Cousin to the King of England? Raised by pirates? Uncle Thomas? What? she asked, her tone defensive. His face mirrored her own, hard and disturbed with a hint of astonishment. I'm coming with ye. His mouth relaxed the smallest demand. I have a need to thank a pirate captain for his obvious moral fortitude. He handed her the slippers she'd abandoned on the deck. She snorted, slammed the slippers onto each foot while balancing, and pulled him along toward the shore where the Macquarries kept their dinghies to ferry across to Mull. Moral fortitude. There were a number of things Captain John had done that definitely crossed the moral fortitude line, but he was a good man, one who had saved and protected those who were at the mercy of terrible men and women. Thomas Wentworth might call Captain John a pirate, but to her he was a father. He had saved her from terror she could barely imagine, and now she would do anything to save him from the gallows. Cousin to the bloody King of England? Beck held his tongue as they hurried through the bustling village on Mull, but he could not stop the revelations from Captain Wentworth from swarming through his head. What would all of this mean for Eliza? Would she go to London, don court clothes, live easily within Wentworth's obvious wealth? Would she marry? They hurried through the bailey and into Aros Castle. Eliza, Meg McLean said, rising from her seat at a table where she was breaking her fast. I've come to see Captain John, Eliza said. Who? Meg asked as her mother, Lady Ava McLean, walked in. So, his real name is not Henry Coxwaddle, Ava said and looked to her daughter. The pirate captain that Captain Wentworth brought with him. Her gaze slid back to Eliza, who is apparently quite important to Beck's friend. Lady McLean, this is Eliza Wentworth. Eliza, this is Chief McLean's wife and Meg's mother, Beck said. And I, Captain John, saved Eliza from the pirate Jean Do years ago and raised her on board this ship. Where is he? Eliza asked. And the crew? She looked to Beck. We do not know if the devil's blood sank. Nay, since he left Captain Wentworth behind. I thought I saw you arrive, Beck Macquarie. Cecilia's gratingly lyrical voice called from the entryway of the castle. Holy topping hell, Eliza said, breaking away from him. How do I find your dungeons? she asked Lady Maclean. This way, and please call me Ava. Ava waved her to follow, and Beck had to watch her go because Cecilia was still talking to him. Cecilia's gaze followed Eliza as she left the room. Lord, is that the same muddy gown from yesterday? She shook her head, making the glossy black curls jiggle. With her lips pursed, she did look a bit like a crow. She placed a palm on his chest, looking up at him with large eyes. She will not do for you, Beck. Cecilia, Meg said, impatience growing on her face, tis none of our affair. She can never be away for ye, Cecilia continued. Beck turned, striding away. As he neared the ramp down to the dungeons, Ava stepped out. Good, she said as he closed the gap. They are a rough group down there, and she is all alone. She grew up with them, he said. Ava shook her head. 
Brave girl. Is the key down there? he asked, wondering if he'd be run over by a horde of angry pirates running up the incline to freedom. Tor has the only key. Good. He strode through the creaky oak door that led below. I thought you were all dead, Eliza said as he rounded the corner to see her standing before one of the two cells that ran the length of the walls, her hands wrapped around the bars as if she would tear them apart. At least forty men of varying sizes crowded into the two enclosures. They all pushed close to her as if hanging on her every word. A sorry predicament, my girl, a middle-aged man said, standing directly before her. He had a coarse beard and tanned face. His nose was angular, giving him a hawk-like appearance with deep grooves cut across his forehead. His squinted gaze shot directly toward Beck. Eliza followed it. This is Captain John, she said to Beck, and the crew of the Devil's Blood. She rolled her eyes. He uses Henry Coxwallow when he's annoyed. The entire crew shifted toward Beck like a school of carnivorous fish, their eyes narrowing. And who the devil are you? Captain John asked, his voice as strong as a hurricane wind. Beck Macquarie of Wolf Isle. Captain John's gaze slanted back to Eliza. Friend or foe? He's my lover, so I suppose that would make him a friend, Eliza said in a matter-of-fact voice. What? The word bellowed out from a large, dark-skinned man, his hands shaking the bars with such force that dust fell from the mortar holding them in place. Our little girl is topping, another yelled. Lover, a smallish man with tattoos etched along his arms roared. You'll be covering your nose to your bollocks. A round of eyes followed. You worm-riddled bilge drinker. Blistering cur of a Scot, we will slice you all over and lower you overboard to draw sharks to chomp you to bits. Hang him by his randy jack and feed him his own bollocks. Beck's hand instinctively slid to the hilt of his sword. An extension of his arm, the blade could slice through one man, but not forty. Eliza's words rose above their tumbling threats. Captain John said I could choose, and I chose Beck Macquarie. There will be no stringing him up or slicing him open or spitting on him. Is he a rough bastard? the small man asked. Any good? Treat you with respect, and... Eliza held up her hand. Aye, all of that. Beck is a most attentive, talented lover, who makes me scream out in passion over and over through the night she yelled over their continual mumbling and conjecture. She pointed to the men. In fact, you all might need to be doing some of what he does to me to your ladies at port. They will welcome you back with open arms if you do. Behind Beck came the sound of someone clearing his throat. He slowly pulled in a long inhale as he turned to see Adam, Tor, and Captain Wentworth. Mochrach, he would never live this turn. I take it this is your Captain John, Adam said, his face caught between concern and humour. I, Eliza said, her gaze going to Captain Wentworth. He rescued me, and they have protected me for ten years. That certainly deserves a pardon for whatever crime you believe he has committed. Wentworth frowned, crossing his arms. He tried to commandeer my ship. Eliza snapped around to frown at Captain John and the whole crew. Take his ship? You were going after Jean Doe. I am sure he was flying the English flag. Captain John looked over her head. You and the children were off ship so I could take some chances. John O has forty guns. To sink him requires two ships. I am hunting Shondo too, Wentworth said, his face hard. If you had discussed your plans with me instead of pulling alongside firing and then swinging across because you are actually pirates, you might not be on your way to the gallows. And you would have jumped in to help us, the smaller man said, throwing in a graphic curse. Wentworth stepped over to the bars to stare accusingly at Captain John. You never even sought to help Elizabeth find her way home to England. If you were a man of honour, you would have taken her safely ashore instead of keeping her with— His eyes moved to the men behind the captain. These strangers, for abducting a member of the English royal family, and for shooting holes in an English ship which required extensive patching, you are charged and will hang. No, Eliza said. Beck stood next to her. Certainly there can be some clemency given the misunderstanding, he said. Wentworth stared directly at Captain John behind the bars. Would there have been clemency for my men if you and your murdering crew had taken the advantage? No one said a word, for anything that would have hinted at the pirate's mercy would have been easily seen as a lie. Wentworth stared with unblinking conviction while the rough crew glared back. The silence stretched until Tor broke it. Let us go back upstairs and discuss the details of these events over a meal. Then we can make plans. He met Captain John's gaze. And a meal for all will be brought below as well. 
Tempers flare when bellies are not properly filled. Eliza grasped Captain John's hand with both of hers through the bars. The man pulled her closer and bent to her ear, his lips moving quickly, and Eliza leaned in as if she wished to stay. The twisting between Beck's ribs tightened, and he came forward. I know it is he, John whispered to her. Eliza stared directly at her Captain John, and her eyes whitened, her mouth going slack as if what he said tore a hole through her. Beck stepped closer. Eliza? Tis a private conversation, Scott, the small tattooed pirate said. Eliza kept silent, letting Beck gently pull her from the pirate captain's hand to lead her from the dank dungeon. Eliza looked over her shoulder at the man who had been her father these past ten years. Damn! What would happen to her when they were all hanged? Chapter 13 I saw the boy I had been told about on Jean Doe's ship in the West Indies, so I had been tracking him north. He looks like you. Peter? Her baby brother was alive? How could that be? When her parents had been slaughtered before her, she'd lost track of her brother, lost him as she hid her face in her knees, doubled over in anguish and her need to vomit. She'd been rushed to Jondo's quarters, where her immediate response was to hide after seeing what the rough men had done to her mother. She hadn't dared to ask anything, not even about the fate of her baby brother. I abandoned Peter. All the shame from ten years ago washed down through her, opening wounds partly healed. But the scars bled fresh until she felt weak with bloodletting, leaning against Beck's sturdy arm as they rose from the darkness of the dungeon. That was why Captain Jean had been so adamant that they follow Chanteau North again, insisting she and the children stay on the Isle of Ellen Moore while he confronted her most hated enemy. I did not intend to tell you until I had won him. Captain John had squeezed her hand, whispering quickly, Use this knowledge with Wentworth to free us. He will want a male heir. I know it is he. Beck stopped under the archway that opened into the cavernous stone enclosed Great Hall in Aros Castle. Inside, Adam and Dor talked with Thomas Wentworth, her uncle. Eliza, are ye well? Beck asked. No, not if her brother had been tortured and kept prisoner for ten years while she lived the life of freedom. I... I do not know yet, she whispered and met his gaze. His eyes searched hers. My brother is alive. She opened her mouth for the words to roll out, but they stalled on her tongue, full of bitterness and shame. I need to ask Captain John more questions. About what? She blinked, taking a full breath. He thinks, Shondo, the bastard might have something of mine. What? She shook her head, unwilling to say the words yet. I need to talk to him more. Beck took her arm. Let us all get some food first, then I'll take you back then. She kept her spot, resisting his pull. Alone. I need to talk to him alone. The confusion made the lines of his forehead deepen. Aye, then. Did he think she would try to free her crew? Of course she would if there were a key anywhere about. Where would they go, anyway? Apparently the devil's blood had been crippled. Eliza, Beck said, his face serious. For went was to manage to capture and transport your captain and crew here. He has a battalion of Englishmen bent on bringing them to London. A battalion that obviously knows what they are doing if they detained a group of men who look very capable of resisting arrest. She raised her eyes to the stone ceiling and exhaled in a huff. I know! He squeezed her hand. We will try to reason with Wentworth, but if they have gone against the English crown he will likely not listen. With a new king he will be trying to impress him, and bringing in a ship of pirates could do that. Her gaze snapped to him with frustration. You're telling me nothing I don't already know. Use this information to free us. How the hell was she going to do that? Beck nodded. Then let us eat and figure out what to do. He spoke as if they were in this together, but they weren't. Eliza barely tasted the venison served. Cecilia had left, which was fortunate for her, since Eliza was feeling very much like punching someone. With each bite of the seasoned meat, she wondered if her brother had been made to live on the scraps left by Jean Doe's men. She felt Wentworth's gaze on her, but ignored him until he addressed her directly. Elizabeth, I would like to bring you back to England so that you can see your family home. She looked up at him. The one you took when my parents were murdered? His mouth tightened. I inherited it as there were no male descendants. How fortunate for you, she said. She sounded like a surly cur, but the man was planning to hang her family. That allowed her to be as ugly as she wanted. 
Wentworth did not eat much either, but he drank plenty. I have not lived in the house for some time, and very infrequently at that. I never married, choosing instead to dedicate myself to the sea and the duty of capturing pirates who prey on innocents like my brother and his family. He folded his hands on the table. Now that I know you are alive, Elizabeth, you are of course welcome to live at Wentworth House. It will be yours upon my death, as well as the annual income of fifteen thousand pounds. It seemed everyone at the table stopped moving for a moment as their gazes fell on her. I am your heir, she asked. Lord, Captain John could start a fleet of children saving ships with that much money, but not if he were dead. I had no children. Despite you being female, I can bequeath you the estate and monies from it. As soon as I return to London, I will have my solicitor write the contracts. You can live in luxury. I forfeit my rights to all of that if you release Captain John and his crew, she said. That is impossible, Wentworth said, frowning. She met his gaze without blinking. I expect that nothing is impossible when commanded by someone of your rank. I am not above the rank of king or regent, and both have recently requested that I return to London immediately to help secure the young king's throne against any enemies. The only reason I am still in Scotland is because Captain Pritchard told me you were alive. Faces all along the table volleyed between Eliza and Wentworth. Use the boy to gain our freedom. The words that she must speak did not want to come, not before all these people, not before Beck. He thought her brave and strong, yet she had been so frightened and weak before that she had not even asked what happened to her brother. What if we helped ye trap jean Law? Beck asked. He is currently in these waters. We do not know that for certain, Wentworth said, scratching his chin. He may have sailed south after you confronted him. Let Captain Jean know that he will not want to sink me until he's seen what I have to offer. Eliza's stomach twisted hard. Jean Doe spoke of a treasure, one she might want to trade herself for. Her heart hammered in her chest. He wanted to trade Peter for her. A shiver slid up Eliza's spine. He hasn't left the area, Eliza said, her words coming up from numb lips. She shook her head. Jean Doe's business with Captain John. Something he said he wanted to trade. Your Captain John does work for the French pirate, Wentworth said, accusation in his voice. Nay, Beck said, although he continued to look at Eliza, his brows bent in concern. It was quite obvious that Jean was at odds with the captain that the devil's blood would we met up with him. Beck finally looked away from her toward Wentworth. You could use Captain John to get close to Jean Aye, Aye, Adam said, his face deadly. Use the captain to get close to Jean Dor, and then we take him. Wentworth seemed to consider it, his gaze going to Eliza and then back to Beck. I have been requested to return to London immediately. We could hunt Jean Dor today, Beck said. We are due to go to Isla, Meg said from her place down on the end near her mother. For Camilla's wedding tomorrow. Rose won't let Cullen go out to sea for at least three days while the festivities are underway. A Scotsman came up into the great hall from the corridor leading to the dungeon. He had an empty tray in his hand. Across from Eliza, Adam straightened in his seat, his fist resting on the table as the man came close. Shite, Beck murmured next to her as if the sight of the man irritated him. Pardon, Chief McLean, the man said. He had a handsome face and his eyes darted from Adam to Beck and then to Tor. I, Liam. The prisoner John asks to speak with Eliza Wentworth. He says alone, outside the dungeon. Eliza stood before anyone said anything. Aye. And Captain Wentworth, Liam said. He fidgeted like he wasn't sure if he should run from the room or stay. Did Tor McLean treat his attendant so poorly? Wentworth stood, as did Beck, who seemed determined to stay close to her. Bring him up, Eliza said, but Liam looked to Tor. Tor nodded, tossing him the key. He motioned to several other McLean warriors to go with him. They can speak in the chapel, Ava said, pointing down another corridor. We've recently designated a small room for any visiting clergy to use while here. Thank you, Beck said, leading Eliza out of the room, Wentworth following them along with Tor McLean. The room was small, with chairs set in two rows with a table up front, a cross sitting upon it with a goblet. You will have privacy in here, Tor said. But we will be just outside, Beck added a frown over his features as they waited. Liam escorted Captain John inside the room, the stench of waste and sweat on him. Lord, how he must hate that, being as fastidious as she was normally. Otherwise her father looked strong and stern as usual. 
As soon as he walked in, she broke away from Beck, striding to John. His hands were bound with a thick rope, and she hugged around his arms. She felt him rest his chin on the top of her head. You are certain, she whispered against him. Aye. He glanced around the crowded room. We must speak alone. Beck stood behind her. I will be right outside the door. The door shut and silence followed. Wentworth met John's eyes. What do you wish to talk with me about? John stood straight and strong. Jaldo has something we both want, and if you free me and my crew, I will help you get it. I have been called back to London, and will have to hunt Jaldo later. John shook his head. He has your heir. Don't miss this chance to claim him. Wentworth's eyes drifted to Eliza and back to John. What are you saying? Wentworth demanded, his face tightening with anger. Shondo has Peter Wentworth, your brother's son, John said. Wentworth's arms fell to his sides. How is that even possible? He looked between them as if they were playing some cruel joke. Eliza's lips parted. I... I did not know. John's voice overrode hers. I keep an eye on Jean Doe's whereabouts to see if he's taken on more human cargo. While we were visiting the West Indies, my friend Claire said Jean Doe had been in asking the whereabouts of a woman who had something of his. Before we left, I went to see her. She was an older woman who was quite upset. Ten years ago, on the first day of the new year, Jean Doe had come to port with a toddling boy named Peter. Eliza held her breath. The first day of the new year would have been a week after the Christmas when Captain John saved her from the Bureau. Jean Do gave the boy into her keeping. Something pirates do if they feel they cannot sell a child until they are older and less difficult to care for. Over the years the woman came to love the boy like her own, and hoped that Jean Do would not return for him. But he did about two months ago. With his hands tied before him, Captain John walked up the short aisle to the altar. I know Eliza's brother's name was Peter, and I knew that I had rescued her as a girl on Christmas Day, a week before Peter was taken to the woman. Eliza cleared her dry throat. When I was convincing Jondo not to attack Beck's ship, Jondo said he had something that I would want, something I would even trade myself for. I will not remain in these waters for long, a week or two perhaps. Bloody damn, how long had it already been? John's bearded jaw moved left to right. There will be no trading. Jondo is a demon who must be cleansed from this earth. We will take the boy back and kill Jondo. Eliza fought to pull in a breath, her hands curling. He said he would only stay in the North Atlantic for a week or two. She looked to Wentworth. We must act now. It could be some other child, Wentworth said, and looked directly at Eliza. Was your younger brother not killed with your parents? I... Eliza's breath caught in her chest with the weight of her shame. I lost track of him. I did not see him. Because she had her face smashed into her skirts, wishing to die before the men tore her clothes from her too. Jean Doe did not tell you Peter was dead, Wentworth asked. I... She met her uncle's gaze. I did not ask. Her words were small, barely there on a shallow whisper. You did not ask? Wentworth repeated, his voice rising. She was a child who had just watched her father gutted and her mother raped before her throat was slashed. It is a miracle that Eliza ever spoke again, Captain John said, his voice firm. Wentworth shook his head, looking away from her. This is all hearsay. I have seen the boy, Captain John said. When we were leaving port, I saw Jean Do, my lad with him, light hair. He looks like you, Eliza. Wentworth rubbed his chin, pulling at his perfectly trimmed beard. He could already be gone. He would not have come all the way up from the Caribbean just to leave without trying to bargain for Eliza, John said, looking back at the Englishman. He is still here. Captain John stared at Wentworth. Jean Do will wait out of you near an oil where his men can gather fresh water in peat and hunt for fresh meat. Ellen Moore or Gometra? John stepped closer to Wentworth. This is your chance, Captain, to save your brother's son when you were not there to save him the first time. Wentworth met his eyes as if surprised that he knew what he was thinking. And since I am guessing that Eliza is not amenable to going to your estate in England, I think Peter would be. At twelve, you could still mould him into a fine Englishman, the heir you've always wanted. The Macleans, Macquarries, and Macdonalds are all in part of this wedding celebration, Wentworth said. In order to capture Jean Doe, we need two ships. He shook his head. And I have little time. 
With a new king, I cannot look like I delay in returning. I need to bring my prisoners on board my ship and set sail tomorrow morning. The devil's blood is unseaworthy right now, John said, his gaze turning to Eliza. That Liam fellow said your passionate lover is a ship with twenty cannons, small enough that a limited crew could sail it. Eliza's cheeks warmed. The Calypso. John looked back to Wentworth. With your English ship full of gunpowder and cannons, and with the help of a smaller carrick, John said, you could take the burrow. And I can save my brother. The torment that sat deep in Eliza's gut twisted. I must save him. The Calypso has twenty-eight guns, she said slowly. I can ask Beck. Nay, John stopped her. Do not let him know that you are going to take the ship. He might help, she said. And he might not, John said. If he denies you, it will be nearly impossible to sneak past him to seize it if he knows your plans. And if Wentworth here needs to go now and John Doe is anxious to sail south, we cannot wait until their festivities are over. Beck Macquarie is a good man, she insisted. Possibly, but how well do you really know him? Captain John asked. Better scoundrels, Eliza. I have taught you that from the day I rescued you. Most hide their darkness, their conceit and self-interest, especially to get a lady into their bed. Eliza's cheeks flamed hotter. She had chosen Beck. But did she know what was truly in his heart? Had he been willing to break things off with her when his brother asked? You would steal a ship to help me take Jean Dome? Wentworth asked, his voice lowered and his brows raised with disbelief. You, a woman. Irritation cut through the worry tightening Eliza's stomach. I, me, a woman. She obviously has sailing in her blood from you, John said, nodding to the Englishman. Eliza almost rolled her eyes at Captain John's attempt at sweet-talking someone. And a small carrot could be manned with as little as six people. Eliza began to tally the few people she could get to help her. And as Alice, Pip, would Muriel help, not Meg, she was going to the wedding. Who could she ask who wouldn't give her away to Beck? Beck? Her heart hurt at the thought of lying to him. They had been close, very close. But did she trust him with the lives of Captain John and her crew? He wants Shondo too. But enough to abandon his family at the wedding and go against his brother's wishes to leave her be. Eliza is capable, but if you let me and a few of my men join her, we will see Shondo dead and your nephew return to you, Captain John said. Wentworth shook his head. And I will never see you again. Eliza walked up to stand before her uncle. I can do it with a crew of my own. We meet on the west side of Wolf Isle. Once we come close, you can send a few of your crew over to help me maintain the sails. When he didn't respond, Eliza touched his arm. Tis a chance for you to win back your nephew, and in return you release Captain John, the crew, and the devil's blood. Wentworth stared hard at her, but she did not blink or look away. Do we have a deal? she asked. My help in capturing Jean Doe and retrieving my brother for the release of a group of men who are doing more good in these waters than bad. If we do not capture Jean Doe, the deal is off, and I continue to sail on for London with Captain John Pritchard and his pirate crews, my prisoners. What would she do then? Try to get Beck and his friends to rescue Peter? Would he even listen to her after she stole his ship? And Captain John, Edgar, Kofi, Wretch, and all the rest of the crew would be dead by hanging. She swallowed hard, her heart thumping, and nodded. Holy Lord, I'm going to steal Beck's ship. Chapter 14 Are ye certain you're well enough for me to go? Beck asked Eliza the next morning. She had refused to leave Marl and Captain John, so he'd stayed too, although not with her, since she'd shared a bed with Meg. Eliza nodded. He touched her pale cheek. I will not stay for the celebration, just the ceremony. I am well, you stay, she said, looking away. Tis my womanly time, her hand slid across her abdomen. It started last night. Beck frowned and lowered his voice. So you're not with child, then? She stared at him for a moment and then shook her head. He should have felt relief that their coming together hadn't endangered his island clan, but instead disappointment lurked in the tension around them. She wore a borrowed gown from Meg. It was a deep rose colour that cinched around her waist, raising her breasts high along the deep neckline. Hair brushed and pulled back in a thin crown of braids, she looked like a sad princess. Beck pulled her into his arms. She was stiff. He touched her cheek with his thumb. What happened in the chapel? he asked, his voice low. She blinked up at him. My uncle refused to listen. He is still taking Captain John and his crew to London. 
He hugged her closer, settling her against his chest. He heard her take a long inhale and kiss the top of her head. We will follow and petition the courts for his release. Would they listen to a Scotsman? Could Tor's contact with the English help? Could Beck pledge his support of the English throne for John Pritchard's release? Say he would work in their interests as a privateer? He needed to talk to Adam and Tor, see what they thought. He was a Scotsman through and through, but to save Eliza's family he might have to... sell his soul to the devil? Aye, whatever it took. He blew out a long breath. We will do everything we can to help them. I know you care for them. She pulled back. Care for them? Do you care for your brothers? I know. You love them, he said. She nodded, blinking back tears. The shine of them tore into Beck like talons. He never thought he'd see Eliza weep. She'd been through so much, had grown strong with her bravery and tenacity. And now she blinked back tears. Damn it, Eliza. I wish I could do more. She grabbed his hand with both of hers. Go after Chandon now, before Captain Wentworth can sail away, before Chandon can sail away. Trade Chandon for Captain John. There isn't a time before Wentworth sails, Beck said, and he had promised to be at the wedding of his mentor's daughter. Camilla was Cullen's princess. He would do anything to see her happy, which meant putting on a huge resplendent wedding. And Cullen had done so much for Beck over the last two years, helping him build the Calypso, teaching him how to sail in any condition, being a friend and mentor. How could Beck not attend his daughter's wedding? And ye said yourself that the Calypso alone can he capture the bureau. Beck slid his hand over the curls that she'd left down to drape over her shoulder. I will convince Cullen to sail with me tomorrow, or tour with his ship. Her lips squeezed tight into a thin line. Tomorrow. Maybe you will be feeling better then, he said, trying to catch her gaze. But she only looked at his chest. She gave a quick nod. Beck lifted her chin with his bent finger to bring her gaze up. What is it? Anger tightened her face. What is it? The only family I've known for the last ten years is going to London to be hanged. Do you not think that would make me irritated and sad? He dropped his hand. I, His chest squeezed. And here he was going to a wedding festival. No matter what, I will return as soon as I can and we will set off to find jean -Dou. She shook her head. Not good enough. The Calypso isn't strong enough to take on the bureau alone. He rubbed a hand through his hair. I will convince Cullen to seal with me. He pulled her into his arms. She resisted at first, but then gave way, pressing her face into his chest. Go then. Her words were mumbled with her lips pressed there. Beck kissed her for it. Wait for me here at Aros, or head back to Alva to be with the children. She nodded against him, and he dropped his arms. Beck, Adam called. Tor has the beast ready to seal. Aye, Beck said, his face tight. As soon as I can, he said once more to Eliza. Fare thee well, Beck Macquarie, she said. His gut tightened. It sounded like a permanent farewell. Adam grabbed his arm. Come along, Tor wants to sail with the tide. Beck looked back at Eliza over his shoulder. She stood alone in the middle of the massive great hall, seeming small, her arms hanging loosely by her sides. She was beautiful. She was sad. Mochrach. The sight of Captain John being forced to board the English ship, shackled so that he could not escape, was one that Eliza would never forget. Tall Kofi followed him, along with small angry Edgar, who spat every few steps, and the rest of her family of rough and tumble men who hid golden hearts. They saved lost souls far more than they plundered, and never killed anyone they considered honourable. With both of us rowing, we are nearly across, Liam McLean said, his back before her. He had followed her down to the docks after overhearing her last conversation with her very English, very follow-the-law uncle. I'll send word to Beck that you are stealing a ship unless you let me help you kill that bastard, Jean Do. The pirate ruined my life. Eliza threw all her worry and anger into the oars as they rowed. Her gaze drifted to the open sea to the right, but Tor's ship had sailed half an hour before with the tide, the wind probably giving them a quick trip to Isla Isle for the wedding. Damn it! She yanked on the wooden oars until they brushed blisters along her palms. He left. For a moment she had thought Beck would agree to forget the wedding and help her. Then she wouldn't have to steal his ship. But, nay, Beck had abandoned her to save Captain John and the crew of the Devil's Blood all on her own. How many do you have to sail the Calypso? Liam said over the wind. Tis a right large ship. I have you and me right now, she said. But I know that children will help, and Alice. Children? Help her to seal a three-masted carrack. 
The rocky sand crunched as the rowboat landed on Wolfile, saving her from having to give some confident comment that would be a lie. Raising Meg's dress above the waterline, Eliza jumped out, Liam on the other side. They hauled the rowboat up onto the beach. She turned to run up the path to Guylan Castle, and heard the man following. She didn't trust him, but what choice did she have but to bring him along? And he had two hands to help with the ropes. Laughter filtered out from behind the lowered portcullis. I'm back, she called as she ran over to the door, pounding on it until Anders pulled it open. Who is he? he asked, glancing behind her. Liam McLean, Liam said, a friendly smile in his voice. Are the captain and crew at Aras Castle? Alice asked, Hester on her hip. In the bailey, Muriel hurried over with her young girl and Pip. The cook, Jasper, stood behind, holding a hoop that the children could chase. In his large hands, with no smile on his face, it looked odd. He stared at Liam as they walked inside. They were at Oros, Eliza said, her breath coming quickly. But they have boarded an English ship. Pip gasped. To be hanged. If we don't help my uncle, the English captain, to capture Jondot, they will be. We have until tomorrow some time to find Jondot and help Captain Wentworth, or he's taking them all to London to swing from the gallows. Bloody hell. Alice said, and Hester hid her face in the side of her neck. So he is your uncle, Anders said. She nodded. Seems I'm related to English royalty, and... She took a deep breath, feeling the heat rise in her face. She looked at Alice, who had been with her since the beginning. Jodo has my brother, Peter. Good Lord, Alice whispered. Pip's hand went to her mouth. He wasn't killed, Eliza said. Jodo took him to port and had a woman raise him. Peter was just retrieved and Captain John saw him. And that's why the captain wanted to follow him north, Anders said, his face pale. Was he thinking that it could be him on board the Bohol right now, surviving the worst pirates on the seas? Eliza nodded. And left us on Ellen Moore while he tried to rescue him. But then Wentworth crippled the devil's blood and took our crew captive. But Wentworth will trade them for Jean and Peter, so we must help him before he takes Captain John and the rest to London. What can we do? Anders asked, his young face seeming to grow older with determination. Eliza took a full breath thankful that no one had asked her how she'd missed the fact that her brother had survived. We are to meet Captain Wentworth on our own ship on the west side of Wolf Isle. We will sail around Ellen Moore to see if Chanteau is there, and then down to Gometra Isle, if he is not. Why would they still be in the area? Liam asked. She looked directly at him. Because Chanteau is willing to trade Peter for me. She took a deep breath. Silence sat heavy in the bailey. So, Anders said slowly, his gaze shifting beyond the portcullis, we're taking the Calypso. As soon as I change into my sea clothes, she answered. But I need a crew, one bigger than Liam and myself. They all knew the dangers of getting close to Jean and his men. If they failed, they'd be captured, killed, or worse, sold into slavery, or kept on board for their sadistic pleasure. I'll not go near that monster again, Muriel said, her gaze resting on Liam, and I wouldn't trust that one not to give you over to him. Liam's face turned red. I made a deal with Jean before I knew what type of man he was. I was trying to protect my isle against the English by forming an alliance with the French. I didn't know he would try to take Ian Lark and the other girls. My life since has been full of... He ran his hands through his hair. I need to redeem myself to the Macleans and Macquarie's if I have any chance of living peacefully here. Eliza looked back and forth between Liam and Muriel. Regardless of Liam's past sins, she needed his hands on the Calypso. Muriel, could you watch Hester for us? Aye, Muriel said, relief in her voice. Eliza's eyes turned to Alice in question. Unless you don't, I am with you, Alice said, always. Thank you, Eliza whispered. I'm going too, Anders said. It could be me on that floating hill. And me, Pip said, looking far more serious than her eight years. I can assist with the lines and climb into the top castle as lookout if Anders is working below. Lord help them. She could not risk sweet Pip if there were any other way. Pip, it could be Captain John save me she said, her voice strong. I need to at least try to save him. Behind them, Jasper's voice came strong and deep, his accented words heavy with unspoken memories. I have known captains like this, Shondo. His face had hardened into the promise of death, and a chill ran down Eliza's spine. I will help you, Eliza of the Devil's Blood, and I know how to sail. That was six. Captain John said she needed at least six people to sail the Calypso. She could surely do it now, at least until a few of Captain Wentworth's men came on board to help. Thank you, she said, meeting each set of eyes. Alice handed Hester off to Muriel, kissing the little girl's cheek. We will be back tomorrow, she said, but she passed a look to Muriel. 
Muriel nodded, hugging Hester close. Hester will be one of my own until you return. She smiled, but her eyes were haunted. Muriel knew Jean Doe firsthand. If they didn't come back, she would become Hester's mother. Thank you, Eliza said, giving Hester a kiss too. I hear they have kittens at Gersel's place. Aye, white and black kittens, Muriel said, and clasped her daughter's little hand. We will have fun and bake some biscuits. Gersel loves biscuits. Eliza turned to her new crew, each of them watching her with stern expressions. She nodded. Everyone dress for sea and find your weapons. She looked at Liam. Perhaps Jasper can find you a dagger and sword. Jasper frowned but nodded. He turned to stride toward the castle, and Eliza waved at Liam to follow him. Liam looked unsure. She cupped her hands around her mouth. Do not kill him, Jasper. We need six sets of hands to sail the Calypso. I would try my best, Jasper said over his shoulder, making Liam glance back at Eliza. She shrugged. He said he'd try his best. She flipped her hand after him to get him moving and turned to Alice. Our clothes? Fresh and up in our rooms, she said. They strode toward the castle, Beck's castle, to ready to take Beck's ship. She rubbed her hand against the hollow feeling in her stomach. What would he think if he returned to see his ship missing? I might be back before then. Not if he returned on the morrow, but there was no helping it. She must do everything she could to save Captain John, her crew, and her brother Peter. Even trading yourself for him? Maybe. Beck threw his energy into pulling on the oars as questions and curses churned in his head. Why was Eliza rowing back over to Wolf Isle with bloody Liam? Wasn't she having her woman's monthly and not feeling well? He glanced at the packet of raspberry leaf brew he'd obtained from the apothecary on Mull when he disembarked the beast before it sailed. After snapping at his brothers over and over as they prepared to leave, Adam had taken him aside and basically thrown him off to a ship. I'll tell Colin you were detained. I need to be with her. I can tell we all can. I'm not breaking things off with her. I see that. No matter what the bloody curse says. Then go. When he couldn't find Eliza in Aros Castle, he'd walked back through the village and spotted her rowing with Liam across the narrow stretch of water. What the bloody hell is she doing? Muscles straining, Beck threw his weight into the oars, battling the choppy waves. It had taken him a quarter hour to find another rowboat to borrow. Maybe Eliza just wanted to return to Alice and her children with news about their Captain John, but Liam's presence worried him. Liam McLean had been shunned after his traitorous dealings two years ago. Why he remained on Mull was a mystery, but Liam continued to try to convince people that he was in truth honourable. Had he convinced Eliza to help him do something foolish? Ocean spray coated Beck's face as he rode through the white caps that had kicked up with the growing breeze. Stroke. Bloody hell. Stroke. Damn, I should have steed. Stroke. Did she lie to me? A small thought bored into him. Is Eliza leaving? Her farewell had sounded final. She is just going to Gailen he said, and the words made his stomach untwist somewhat. Captain John was on Wentworth's ship, and the devil's blood had lost a mast in battle and needed numerous repairs. Nay, Eliza wasn't going anywhere. He pulled in deep breaths as he rowed until he hit the beach. The power in his rowing propelled him high enough that his boots stayed dry when he jumped out, dragging the boat ashore. He jogged past the tethered Macquarie boat toward Guylan. The portcullis was down, and no one was in the bailey except for whiskey and her pups. They barked as he yanked open the unlocked door in the wall, nearly shattering the old hinges. The dogs ran on his heels across the bailey as if this were a game. Eliza, he yelled, running into Guylan. He stopped in the great hall to listen. Vacancy permeated the air as the dog's nails tapped across the stone floor. He took the winding steps two at a time to reach the floor where Eliza shared a room with Anders. Throwing the door open, he stared at the trunk, its lid flipped open. He closed his eyes and exhaled. She would have taken it with her if she'd left for good. After striding down the hall, he descended the stairs quickly. Eliza? Alice? Jasper? He called, his voice booming. But silence was the only answer. Where was everyone? Go after Jean now, before Captain Wentworth can sail away. Trade Jean for Captain John. Beck sucked in a large breath, his hands curling into fists. He straightened as Eliza's words caught at his pulse. Bloody fucking hell, Eliza, he said, his voice more like a growl. She was going after Jean without him, and she was going on the only ship available to her, the Calypso. Chapter 15 
Eliza jumped up to the upper deck of the Calypso. The Carrick ship was less than a year old and still smelled of new wood and polish. Bex pride and joy. She grimaced and pushed her remorse away. Must save John and her crew. They had taken her in, protecting her from the age of twelve when she'd swung aboard in John's arms, Trondeau snarling behind him. Kofi had immediately picked her up in his large, tattooed arms. His murderous face had made her nearly piss herself. But he'd met her terrified gaze with kindness in his eyes, the white around his irises seeming so bright in his dark face. I had a daughter once, he said. You are safe with me. From that day on, the large man had stepped between her and any man who wished her harm, and now Kofi, John, and the rest would swing by the neck because they'd sought Chanteau to find Peter. Peter, her baby brother. She'd abandoned him, and now they were paying for her selfishness. The cold spring breeze blew against the heat in her cheeks, and she was glad she had her long wool and leather captain's coat that John had given her last Christmas. She grabbed the smooth handle of the whipstaff that was tied to the tiller below deck, which in turn worked the rudder under the ship to steer it. Pip, up the ratlins on the mainmast. Liam, unfurl the mainsail, she called out, and looked to Jasper, who stood next to her. I need your strength on the relieving tackle to help me steer this beast from shore. It helped the rudder manoeuvre with better accuracy. Anders, she called, unfurl the foresail and raise it on my mark. Alice, untie the rope so we can raise all the sails when I say. And that was it. Only six of them would guide this ship away from the shallow surrounding wolf isle. She'd stood beside Captain John for years, studying his every move, believing one day she would have a ship of her own. He had even let her steer the devil's blood from time to time. She will be yours some day, he'd said. Her heart squeezed at the memory. But this was different. This was Beck's ship. And she must meet Wentworth and conquer Chandot to save everyone she cared about. Except Beck. She touched the pendant she wore under her tunic, the hardness of it reminded her of the strength she'd seen in her mother as she fought Chanteau's men to the bloody end. Chanteau, the devil himself. I will see you on the end of my blade, she murmured, watching everyone scurry to do what she'd asked. The wind had picked up, which was good, but it made pulling away tricky. Liam, raise the foresail and then the mainsail, Anders ran to help him. As the sails rose, she felt the ship tug under her, making her heart race. The dock ties were undone, the anchor raised, and the sea and wind were working together to pull the Calypso away from her berth. This is going to work. What the bloody hell are ye doing? Beck's voice boomed from the hatch behind her that led to the captain's cabin. She jumped, turning to see him already halfway out, using his immense arms to propel himself onto the deck. Ye are stealing my ship, he answered his own question, so she turned back to face the bow, despite not being able to draw a full breath. He'd come back from the wedding for her. Anders, raise the mainsail completely, she called. Nay, Beck yelled, coming up next to her. And ye stay right where ye are, Jasper, he said, his arm out toward him. Jasper kept his hand wrapped around the lines. Start, stop, all of ye, he yelled, and continued in a mix of heavily accented English and Scots Gaelic, his anger making his words warble together like the violent rush of water over the rocks. He grabbed her arm and she turned to face him. The sun breaking through the clouds made the grey in his eyes seem almost blue. Everything about his face was hard and determined. A drop of water slid down his forehead from his hair. You are wet, she said. Because I'd a fuck and swim to my ship that was pulling away from my dock. My ship! She glanced at the hatch. You came through your cabin. He shook droplets from his head. Up through the damn cheeks. Her mouth dropped open. He'd climbed up the side of the ship and punched out the hole that he pissed through. She was sorry, sorry for all of it, especially the hard look of betrayal on his face. But she couldn't give in to any of that now. She turned back. I have work to do, she said. He looked out where she was steering. And you're gonna run my ship aground. Then help me, she fired back. Beck drew a full breath through his clenched teeth. Anders, raise the mizzen seal, he called and looked to Jasper. Get ready to pull. We must get around the bulldoze up there just under the surface. Jasper nodded once and coiled the thick rope around his arms, planting his boots on the deck. Pull, he yelled, and Eliza turned the whipstaff as far as she could so the wind would catch and blow them out. Jasper pulled too, helping the tiller below deck turn as tightly as possible. Beck took off in a run, jumping down from the upper deck to help Liam and Alice unloop another thick rope. Raise the topsails, he yelled. 
He grabbed the lines, pulling with Alice and Liam to raise the higher sails that Pip had untied before sliding down. The wind snapped the sails over, pulling the calypso away from the land, the deck tilting at a sharp angle. All Eliza could do was work with Jasper to hold the tiller as far over as possible. She watched Beck run across the deck to look over the side at the water below. The tide had gone out farther than was safe. He grabbed a long, thick pole that lay inside the gunwale. Throwing it over, he aimed it farther up the ship. Liam, he yelled, and the man ran to him. The two of them pushed down against the pole, even rising up off the deck with their full body weights to push away from the rocks below. The sound of the ship's hull scraping against rock vibrated dread up Eliza's back. Damn it, she said, the word coming from between gritted teeth. Would she tear a hole in the hull, sinking the ship before she could even get out to Wentworth? Beck and Liam lifted the pole back up and placed it again, repeating the push. The wind snapped at the sails. Boom about, Eliza yelled, and Pip, Anders and Alice all ducked as the boom swung with the wind, catching it fully and making the ship list harder to the side. Everyone braced themselves. Haul on the line to the mainmast, Alice, she called to make the sail tighter. They were all working together. Even Pip was leaning over the rail, yelling to Beck about what she could see. Lord God, don't let me destroy Beck's ship. Time moved forward with a pounding of her heart, and the ship tilted away from the land, the bow pointing toward the open sea. West, she called, and continued to hold the whipstaff tight in its turn. Beck dropped the pole along the deck, his stride closing the distance between them. His face was red with anger, and he jumped back up onto the aft deck. You can let up, Jasper, she said, and the man uncoiled the tackle rope. As Beck stopped before Eliza, Jasper strode down to the lower deck, leaving her there with a fuming Highlander. You stole my bloody ship, he said, the words grinding out. You wouldn't help me, she said, looking past him. Help you with what? Saving Captain John? Aye, she yelled, her eyes flashing with her own fury. By meeting Wentworth. He stared at her as if she were mad for a moment. You said you were ill. You lied about having your monthly flocks. She stared straight ahead. Damn it, Eliza, are you with child? Her gaze snapped to him. How in hell would I know that? We were just together two nights ago. Mohrach, he said, his hands raking up through his hair to grab his neck like it pained him. He looked out to the water, dropping his arms. Where are we going? He said to meet Wentworth. For what purpose? Liam cupped his hand from below. To kill Jean Doe. Damn it, they could all hear their conversation. To catch Jean Doe and to trade for Captain John and the crew. Anders called right after him. Eliza turned her gaze to Beck. As if he felt it, he met her stare. Let him see the truth in her eyes. And to save my brother, she said. Your brother? The furrow between his brows deepened. He is alive? She nodded and looked back out as they followed Wolf Isle toward its end. Captain John found out that he still lives. Peter was given to a woman in port to raise, and Jean Doe has reclaimed him. And Wentworth wants him, Beck said, following the logic. More than he wants to take Captain John to London, she said. But if we don't capture Chanteau and save Peter, the deal is off and my family hangs. Chanteau will not surrender your brother easily. Nay, he won't, but there is something he wants more than Peter. She looked at the strength in his face. Me. Beck grabbed her upper arms, holding her there as he pinned her with his stare. I will never let that happen. The tone was fierce, like an oath, and she swallowed. I should have saved Peter when he was a babe. Instead, I did not even ask if he was alive. I let Captain John rescue me without mentioning that I had a brother who might still be on board that demon ship. You didn't know, Eliza. How could she? I bloody well could have asked, she said, yanking herself away from him to focus on the horizon and the end of Wolf Isle. Eliza, he said, his voice stern, but with a tinge of kindness that made the pressure of tears tighten behind her eyes. I'm going to right my wrong and save my brother and Captain John and my family, she said. I wish that I had not had to steal your ship to do so. She glanced at him. The wind ruffled his light brown hair around his rugged features. But I would do so again to save them. Sail ho! Pip yelled from where she climbed up to the main top castle. She pointed west. Eliza let out a breath in relief. Her uncle had kept his promise. Wentworth, she said, sliding the whipstaff to angle toward the English ship. It was large, a gunner for certain. No wonder the devil's blood had been crippled. We are not done discussing this, Beck said. Beck jumped down to the level below her to disappear into the captain's quarters. The sails caught the wind as they moved past the edge of the island, and the familiar feel of sailing fast with the wind made her inhale. The cool breeze free of gun smoke, 
free of the taint of land, was sweet. The ship crested and dipped with the waves as they cut through them toward Wentworth's ship. This was what freedom felt like to Eliza. Except now her freedom felt weighted down with remorse. His man is signalling to pull alongside, Pip yelled from above. If you see the bureau, get down, Anders called up to her. He was right. Nothing spurred Jondo's men to attack faster than seeing a beautiful child to take. Beck strode back out of his quarters, having traded his soaked Scotsman's plaid for sailor's clothes. He leaped up to stand beside her, but did not tell her how to steer his ship. Instead, he watched hands clasped behind his straight back, legs braced easily. The wind was steady, so she was able to guide the Calypso toward the English ship. Furl the sails, she called, and everyone on the deck scrambled to lower them. Beck joined them as she steered. His trues hugged his narrow hips, showing the tightness of his arse under a short leather jerkin that he wore over a white tunic. His short hair shifted in the wind, and he called orders to Anders, Alice, and Jasper, while Liam caught the mainsail below, wrapping it along the boom. Eliza felt the drag of the water as she steered toward where Captain Wentworth stood on his deck. Her breath caught as she saw Captain John standing next to him. They both watched her approach. At least ten sailors held poles ready to push the Calypso away if she slid into them but the wind cooperated to allow Eliza to guide the boat alongside, nearly end to end. Captain John gave her a small nod of approval, and her heart swelled. Your captain knows quite a lot about our mutual enemy, Wentworth yelled across, his face grim. He will be coming across to help you with some of my men while I hold the rest of the crew here. John would make this work. Wentworth's men swung across first, and then Captain John. His boots landed with a deep thud on the deck. Before the rope had even slid back, he strode across the deck toward Beck. John's fist came around. Beck! Eliza yelled. She stared open-mouthed as Beck caught the swing of Captain John's arm, throwing him back, his fists rising to defend himself. Younger by at least ten years, and full of muscle, Beck did not return the attack. What the hell? Eliza yelled down at John. This is between a father and a reputed lover, John yelled back, without taking his gaze from Beck. Eliza felt her cheeks bloom with heat. You said I could pick. I picked him, she called. Lord, all the people on deck were looking between them. Captain John said something to Beck, pointing at him, his face tight with anger. Beck gave one nod and dropped his fists. John pivoted on his boots and strode toward her, leaving Beck to talk with English sailors. What was that about? she asked as he stopped next to her. Captain John stood tall, legs braced like he did when he sailed the devil's blood his narrowed eyes forever searching the horizon. Young pup needs to know you're not some whore to be tricked, he said. He didn't trick me, she said. I asked him to. The best scoundrels make you think that, and then they use you. She ran a hand down her face. He was quite attentive to me. I may have even used him more. He glanced at her and then back out at sea. Will you stay with him then? His words hit her hard and she swallowed. She looked out to where Beck spoke with her uncle across the narrow divide between their ships. Wentworth nodded to whatever Beck was planning. I stole his ship, she said. Tis a betrayal. I do not think you would have me stay with him. The words were like small knives digging into her chest, making her inhale more like the flapping of an injured bird. There are different levels of betrayal, Eliza, John said, his gaze still outward. He had all his conversations that way, always watching the sea. It made speaking to him easier. She swallowed, her gaze following Beck where he gestured to sails and ropes, instructing the English sailors. He loves this ship. Built it himself. Captain John glanced at her. But the ship didn't choose him to bet her. She shook her head, not wishing to hope. Hope led to a deeper wound, and she already felt weak with the slices of the last two days. She inhaled. How did you convince my uncle to let you over here? John turned his tanned face outward again. I've fed him everything I know about Jean Lowe, and some things I've guessed. He also knows how loyal I am to my crew. With me here, we have a better chance of getting Peter and Jean Lowe. This time his whole body turned toward her. You know Jean Lowe wants you. She nodded, her eyes meeting his gaze. Inhaling to fill her words with conviction despite the tremor in her chest, she said, We can use that to get Peter. Nay! Beck yelled as he rose up the short ladder, his large biceps propelling him onto the upper deck as if his boots barely touched down. We will not. Beck's handsome features were darkened with fury and stubborn determination. Tis our brother, John said. 
and her choice. Do you know why she might choose to give herself to Jodot for her brother? Beck said. Anger bubbled up inside Eliza, muting the pain there. Hold your tongue. She hadn't actually told him she didn't want people to know her shame, but it should have been inferred. No one would want their dark secret out. Tis no one's business but my own. He continued anyway. Eliza's under a ridiculous notion that she is to blame. Stop it, she yelled in his face, her palms smacking into his large chest. It didn't move him at all, the damn mountainous Scotsman, for her brother being in Jordo's hands. That a frightened lass who had just watched atrocities committed against her parents should have saved her brother when ye rescued her from Jordo's ship. She drew her dagger standing before him and rested the point at his throat. Beck didn't even wince, but stared hard into her eyes, meeting her fury and dark shame with outrage and denial. I am responsible, she yelled. I left him. I said nothing about him. Tis my fault. The words were out. The poison that had sat in her heart for ten years had been spat forward. The cloying shame and sorrow had risen up through her with Captain John's words, Peter is alive. And now I am going to fix it, she said, the words coming out with such force it was like a growl. She stared into Beck's eyes, daring him to refuse her. He met her gaze without blinking, his lips pressed tight. She slowly lowered her dagger from the throat she had kissed in passion, and turned away, blinking back the moisture that had gathered with her anger and self-loathing. Raise the sails, she called, looking away. Mochrach, Beck said, his voice low and angry. Captain John cracked his knuckles and slid his fingers down his short beard. So you have tried and sentenced the one at fault to torture, rape, and death. Bloody fucking hell, Beck said, his voice even. Her gaze slid past Beck, who looked like he would rip Jodot's limbs off, to Captain John. I left a child, my brother, in the hands of that monster, she said. Her adopted father looked at her, his eyes without the judgment she felt she deserved. Nay, Eliza, John said. I did. Chapter 16 Beck watched the fierce gleam of determination in Eliza's eyes turn to confusion. You left Peter, she asked. You didn't even know he was with me. I said nothing. John turned his gaze back to the sea, clasping his hands behind him. Of course you said nothing, he said. When I took you over to the devil's blood, you didn't speak for two weeks. Not a word except a scream when those two bastards attacked you, and I made sure they would never touch a child again. You saw the lad, Beck asked, on the burrow. John nodded solemnly. "'Twas a choice I had to make. John Doe's men were swarming like hornets whose nest had been squashed. I saw the babe sitting next to John Doe at the helm, but I had just dragged Eliza out from his cabin. Scratching and fighting, Eliza murmured. Her face was slack, as if she were remembering the rescue. You have been a fighter ever since, John said, a hint of softness in his voice, even though he stared outward. To retrieve the babe, I would have jeopardized you. He glanced her way. And like I promised you, I was not letting go. Beck's chest was tight with the horror of John's words. A young Eliza kicking and clawing in panic, but the captain not letting go, since he knew what would befall her if he did. And then the choice of leaving a babe behind with a crew of devils, making a choice right there on the spot. What would he have done? Eliza stared at her adopted father, and Beck watched a single tear slide along the softness of her cheek, a tear she did not acknowledge. It was everything he could do not to grab her to him. So, John continued, you have no need to regret. You were a child who had been horrendously abused, even if you had known Peter live no fault should lie upon your heart. I am the one who left your brother behind. When I heard from Claire that he might have survived, and then I saw him on the burrow, I made haste to follow Jean Doe north again. You said nothing, she said, pain still in the tightness of her face. John looked at her, his face stony. I did not want you to have hope for something that was nearly impossible, partly because of the foolish thoughts of self-sacrifice I knew it would prompt. He looked back out to the sea, and Beck took over the rudder from Eliza to continue their course around the backside of Ellen Moore. The mixture of anger and sadness on Eliza's face said so much. After a long moment, her lips parted. Yes, of shame I felt, she whispered. Of which I knew not, John said, and I will not trade those years, and I will not trade your life now for the boy I already chose to leave behind. We will save Peter, or we will not, but your life is not part of the plan. Beck was liking Captain John more and more. 
Let him be the one to tell her that she couldn't trade herself for her brother. Either way, Beck could not allow it. If Jean had Eliza... The thought bored into Beck's chest like a pointed awl. Eliza turned away from John, angry tears in her eyes, and strode to the ladder leading off the upper deck. With John at the Calypso's tiller, Beck caught up to her when she stopped at the rail, her face turned to the wind. Beck stood in silence. She didn't need his words, his absolution. This independent woman, this survivor and fighter, didn't need his anything. But he wanted to give her so much anyway. Eliza. She cut off whatever foolish words he might have uttered by turning into him, her face burrowing against his chest. Beck wrapped his arms around her. He just held her, tracking the rise and fall of her breaths. Was she crying? Was it fury tightening her frame, or sorrow? Did she hate Captain John for his choice and his silence, or did some complex combination of all these possible emotions twist inside her? He felt her shoulders straighten before she pulled back, quickly wiping the wetness from her cheeks. She took a deep breath, her gaze meeting his. I am getting him back. You're too close to the situation to see clearly. Listen to Captain John. He has cared for ye for ten years. Her eyes narrowed, her soft mouth tightening. At the cost of my brother's happiness and right to live free. His fingers tightened around the rail. I would feel the same if it were one of my brothers. But that isn't a meek sacrifice in yourself the correct course of action. She turned away. I would also be saving Captain John and the crew. Beck grabbed her wrist, his mouth drawing close to her ear. I'll not lose you, Eliza. I will not let you go. Her head snapped around to him, questions on her face, questions he had no answer to. She had said she wouldn't marry. Adam wanted Beck to stop being with her if she couldn't commit to building back the clan with him. Those details mattered not. I will not let you go, he repeated. Sails ho! The words yelled from above broke their tethered gazes. Anders pointed. Tis the bureau! Eliza had been right. Chando had remained in the waters near where Captain John had left her and her wards. A small boat was rowing up to the ship from the island side, probably the crew holding fresh water or meat. Captain Wentworth's ship was still hidden by the isle on the southern side. He would sail around to the west, meeting the Calypso, catching the Bureau in between them. Beck looked up at the half-filled sails. They must catch the wind blowing south. He squeezed Eliza's hand. No treading, he said, before running to the middle of the lower deck. Eliza jumped up to the top aft deck with Captain John. Beck looked up at Anders. I need you down here. Send Pip up out to the free. The boy nodded, sliding down to take up a sword while the agile girl climbed high. Liam, Beck yelled, and ye there. He pointed to several of Captain Wentworth's sailors. Stand ready at the lines and make sure to have your weapons ready. If they swing across, strike with everything ye have. Do not let them take the children or ladies. I'll slice their jacks off before I let them take the children, Alice yelled, her hair wild from the wind. She looked like an avenging pirate bent on blood. Since their jacks will likely not be hanging out, aim for their hearts, Beck said, and she nodded with a wry smile. I'm not a child, Anders retorted. Then swing with everything you have, Beck said, and protect Pip. Anders nodded solemnly. Where is the English ship? Eliza yelled down toward the sailors. One of them lifted his gaze to her. Wentworth will come around, but he's lightly tacking into the wind. Mochrach. How much would the wind blowing against him slow down the English gunner? They needed his forty cannons. The smaller Calypso flew toward the Bureau, and Beck could see Jeanneau's crew scurrying around the deck. Glass glinted along the ship's gunwale as they raised the portals for the cannons. Damn! With children and Eliza on board, it was like going into battle with a chest of gold strapped to the deck that Jeanneau and his bloody crew could see and salivate over. Eliza stood bravely on the Calypso's top deck, she wore her long wool and leather seaman's coat over trues, a tunic, and high boots. Hair unbound and blowing about, she was a fierce warrior woman, like the pirate Grace O'Malley or the Celtic warrior Boudicca. Beck strode across to join her. The Calypso is my ship, he said to Captain John, and I will steer her into battle. Captain John gave one nod and stepped aside. What would you have us do then, Captain Macquarie? he asked, a slight hint of ridicule in his tone. You will speak with Jean Dau when we are within range. He respects you and will want to know where your ship is. Beck looked out at the nearing boat. Where was Eliza's brother? He saw Jean Dau in his felt hat commanding his men. 
We need to keep Jean-Luc talking and not firing until Wentworth manages to sail around the isle, and get him to bring Peter out. I will, Eliza began. Do nothing to jeopardise yourself, Beck finished. I would have ye stay up here with me. Nay, she said, I stand beside Captain John. There was no time to argue or drag her to his cabin to lock her within, and Captain John would probably have issues with him chaining her to the deck so she couldn't contemplate swinging across. Or maybe he wouldn't, but there was no time to ask. The bureau was coming around, cannons at the ready. Captain John, Eliza at his side, traipsed down to the rail, moving with slow confidence as if cannons weren't aimed at him. Drop sails, Beck yelled, and the crew released the lines, dropping the wind-catching sails to slow the calypso. Man the cannon, he called, and several of Wentworth's men hurried below with Liam to ready the guns, while several remained up top with lit torches, ready to light the top guns. The Calypso was built for speed, not fighting, but she could deliver quite a punch with her firepower. Beck slid his hand down the smooth pommel of the whipstaff. He had sanded it himself before setting it into the ship, connecting it to the rudder. The ship hadn't been out at sea long enough for the wood to weather into a grey to match the storm clouds that hung over the coast. He looked out at the devil ship pulling alongside. Perhaps it was time the Calypso earned some scars. I heard you wished to speak to me, Jean Doe. John yelled across. The lad with tawny gold hair was pushed forward from the middle of the deck. His clothes seemed too tight for his lanky body. It had to be Peter Wentworth. Even if not, the boy deserved a life of freedom from the horrors on Jean Doe's ship. Captain John Pritchard, Jean Doe said, and smiled. And the lovely Eliza. But where are your rabble and sheep? What is it you want? John asked. No welcoming platitudes, I suppose, Rondeau said, waving the boy over. When you were stolen from me, Eliza, you left something behind. How selfish of you to give up your little brother. I did not know he lived, she said, her gaze straight across to the two of them. Beck couldn't see her eyes. Did she plead with Peter for understanding? Was the boy filled with hateful poison now that Rondeau had retrieved him? Now you know, Rondeau said. He grabbed Peter's arm pulling him to the side of the ship, almost as if he'd throw him overboard. Eliza's hands curled around the top rail. What would you pay for his life, Eliza? To make amends for ten years of suffering. The boy opened his mouth, but then closed it when Captain John called over. Peter has lived with a woman at port, not with your devil crew, so there was no ten years of suffering. Jono kept his gaze on Eliza like he was salivating over a rich roast. It made Beck's empty hand slide to the hilt of his sword. Ah, but there will be a lifetime now, Jondo promised darkly. You've been hunting for me just to tell me something I already know, John said. Beck noticed he moved closer to Eliza, as if he worried that she might jump across. Mochrach, that was exactly what she looked like, ready to leap across, tear Jondo's throat out and grab her brother. But then the Moreau's vicious crew would surround them, seeking retribution in the worst way possible. Where the hell was Wentworth? Beck glanced past the Bureau to the back side of Ellen Moor, but there was no sign of the large English ship. If some of Wentworth's men hadn't come across, Beck would worry the man had abandoned them. Jordo pulled Peter closer by the back of the neck. He didn't resist, but stood stoically, staring out toward Eliza. Perhaps Eliza would like to see her brother get a chance at a life off the bureau, although he is welcome to stay and become a fine member of my crew. The men behind him laughed heartily. If he survives, Jondo said. Fuck him, bastard. Beck wished he could see Eliza's face. Jasper, Beck called down to where the large man stood ready. Take the helm. Jasper climbed quickly, taking the whipstaff. Keep us within shooting range of the bureau. The man nodded and Beck jumped down, only catching the end of what Chandot was saying. A fair trade? A lad you can raise to take over the devil's blood for the girl who is rightfully mine. No person is rightfully yours, Beck called as he strode to the other side of Eliza. Chandot slid his hooded gaze to Beck. The Macquarie pup, his brow shot up. Two protectors for Eliza and not a single one for her baby brother. He tisked. If the lady does not belong to anyone, then it is her decision if she wants to save her brother, something she failed to do before. There'll be no trade, Beck said. A pity that you think so, 
especially when you are sorely outgunned, Trondo said, looking squarely at Eliza. But I have not heard from the woman. Today will you save both your brother and the crew of the little carrack you have commandeered? Or shall we start firing and see where you end up when the smoke clears? Ye will hang for your crimes, Claude Chando, against the Wentworths, the Macquarries, and all of England, Beck said. As if it had been waiting for a cue in a theatrical play, the English galleon nosed out from behind the aisle. Its broad sails were snapping as it caught the wind, trying to sail into it. Sails ho, one of the Burroughs crew called. Ten sails and forty guns, Beck said, taking pleasure in the downturn of Jondo's mouth. Tis English, Capitaine, the crewman yelled down. Jondo began to issue orders in French. Beck knew very few words of French, but caught, Tire, tire, fire away. The first cannon exploded, sending a lead ball straight toward the stern of the Calypso. It hit just next to it, sending up a spray of seawater that reached Jasper on the upper deck. Beck's heart thudded at the closeness. His ship, the one he'd poured months of work into, where he had touched every plank and nail, was under attack. And without the wind helping to propel Wentworth's galleon closer, the Calypso would be demolished before he could reach them. Stop! Eliza yelled, and Jean Doe held up his arms, halting the next shot. If she could delay long enough, Wentworth's ship would make it, and Jean Doe would be caught between them. There is no time to dally, ma fille, Jean Doe said, his face ruthless. A trade for your brother, and I will leave this tiny ship in one piece. Your English ally won't make it here in time. Your visit with me for the lives of all those standing with you and your brother. Visit my heart. It would be a condemnation to hell. Nay, Beck yelled. You have no say in this, Macquarie, Rondo said, keeping his eyes locked with Eliza's like a snake hypnotizing its prey. He should have a say, if anything happened to Eliza. Feverish fury rose up in him at the thought. She is my wife, he yelled over, so I have a say. Rondo's surprised gaze slid to Beck's, and he could feel Eliza turn to him. Wife, she whispered. Aye, Beck answered loudly as if he spoke to Jean Doe. We're wed on Wolf Isle. She is a Macquarie and a Wentworth. Ye have enemies in England and Scotland ready to see ye swing until dead. Jean Doe stared at him for a moment and then shrugged. No matter. France is stronger than both. He looked to Eliza, the corner of his mouth, rising. And now I am curious as to what you have learned from your husband. The love of a Frenchman is far superior to the rotting bull of a Macquarie pup. He will die today, Beck said low. Wentworth can take his body back to London. Because he called you a rotting bull or a Macquarie pup? Eliza asked. He turned to stare into her beautiful face. There were too many emotions in the lines around her eyes and the tilt of her mouth that they seemed to mute each other, giving her a look of apathy. He dies because he threatens the one thing I care the most about. Her eyebrows rose. Your ship. Beck closed his eyes, his teeth gnashing tight. Ye, you damn stubborn siren. Ye, Eliza. The slightest of smiles softened her tight lips. If you threw in a fuck, you'd sound more like a pirate. Enough talk, Shadow called, and another cannonball flew across the gap. Chapter 17 Wed? He'd said they were married, and that she, Eliza, was the most important thing in his life. One statement was for Chandot, a lie. But was the other the truth? The idea tugged on her already twisted heart. The cannonball hit the Calypso's bowsprit, shattering the wood in a spray of splinters. Alice ducked and ran toward the middle of the ship, away from the flying shrapnel. The men at the cannons on deck looked to Beck for the signal. Wentworth's galleon wouldn't reach them before jean sank them. Eliza grabbed Beck's loose linen sleeve in her fist. I will go across as they send Peter over. Nay, Beck said, his face set in stubborn viciousness, lips pulled back to show his teeth. You will not. I will jump over the rail of the bureau, she said from between clenched teeth. I can swim and you will fish me out. You will not let go of you to jump, and the water is too cold. If you light your guns and start firing, he will let go, and I've swum in cold seawater before. Just watch where I go over. Trondeau raised his hand to signal a volley of cannons, but Captain John's voice made them all pause. Eloisa will come across. Beck pivoted to stare open-mouthed at Captain John. 
"'Tis too risky, he said. John glanced at him. "'Tis the best way to save my crew, her brother, and your bloody ship. jean smiled fully, his men readying to raise the sails as soon as she swung across on one of the many ropes they had rigged for boarding helpless vessels. Eliza's heart panted, and she concentrated on drawing air into her lungs, releasing it to stop the pinpricks of light from marring her sight. "'Send Peter and I will come!' Eliza yelled, the words sinking like daggers into her stomach. She was about to fly back into the devil's nest, the setting of all her nightmares, the Boreau and its swarm of stinking, rotten-toothed, black-souled pirates. They would surely rot in hell, but for now they walked the earth, raping, raging, and killing. You first, ma fille. Ye fucking devil, Burke said next to her, and she curled her hands around the rail to prevent herself from pressing into him. She inhaled fully. At the same time, she called back, steel in her voice despite the trembling she felt threatening to weaken her resolve. I will do this. I will save Peter and Captain John. But who could save her? Peck? Could he? Perhaps death would save her. Fight hard, my girl, Captain John said quietly, catching her gaze. She saw resolution, strength, stubborn commitment, and no remorse for what he chose ten years ago. Eliza nodded. I will, she whispered, blinking, and turned away to grab the long rope that one of Jondo's men threw across for her. She caught it and Beck caught her wrist. She turned toward him, and for the first time she let down her mask of confidence. Let him see her for once, maybe for the last time. Let him see her fear and need to risk it all to rid herself of the shame she'd felt all these years. Eliza, he said. I have to do this, she said, letting him see the tears in her eyes, the need in the set of her mouth. I have to do this. I will get ye back, he said, the words sounding serious enough to be an oath. She gave him a slight grin. If you want more of my tarts, you better. Disentangling her arm from his grasp, she stepped up onto the barrel of fresh water next to them, grasping the rope up high. She looked down at the tight lines on Beck's face, her stomach knotting with each rapid pounding of her heart. Watch where I jump and fish me out. I will wait as long as I can for my uncle to reach us. Not too long, he said. They will try to seal soon. Even if they do, jump. She gave a small nod, and he leaped up onto the barrel with her, pulling her into his arms. His lips came down on hers as his palm cupped her cheek. The kiss was perfect, warm and full of promise, but way too short. Trono's men called lewd remarks in French across the way. Beck kept his mouth close to hers as he spoke. I will not let go. They were the same words her adopted father had said when he saved her from Jordo's ship. Yet they felt different. They felt more intense. A lifeline that she would wrap around herself no matter what happened. She nodded, not trusting herself to speak, and looked across to the burrow. Peter stood opposite them, hoisted onto the rail, holding a rope one of her uncle's men had swung across to him. His eyes were wide as he looked down at the choppy water between the ships. We go now, or I revoke my trade, Jondo said, glancing behind at the English ship closing in. Aye, now, Eliza said. Un, deux, trois, Jondo counted, and Eliza launched herself into the air. Beck held his breath as Eliza sailed across the space between their ships, barely noticing the boy slamming into Captain John next to him. He watched Jondo's men grab Eliza from the rope. I will kill them all. His stomach hardened to stone as they touched her everywhere, yanking out her daggers and dragging her over to Jean Do. With a flick of the French captain's hand, the men left her there. Jump, jump a laser. But the ships were so close she could be crushed, and bloody Wentworth couldn't bring his ship around with the wind blowing in his damn face. It wasn't like one could row a goddamn galleon. Jean Do wrapped a hand around her wrist, shackling her to him. Ifren Chanel. You are Peter Wentworth. Captain John sat next to him, and Beck glanced to see the boy nod. Apologies for not rescuing you with your sister. I... I do not remember her, or any of you, the boy said. He looked thin and dirty, no doubt suffering from being on the bureau for two months now. He looked back over at the pirates who were raising their sails. She is very brave, my sister. The bravest woman I have ever known, lad, John said. His gaze met Beck's. Get her back. I swear it. Captain John gave a brief nod. Liam came up to the rail. What is the plan? His expression seethed with hatred for Jean Do. As soon as he gets his sails up, we will lose him. 
Beck motioned for Anders, Alice, and two Englishmen on deck to start raising the Calypso sails. If he could distract Chanteau from his plans of escape, Wentworth might manage to reach them. Order the men to fire on my mark, Beck said. Aim away from Eliza. Liam dashed off, and Beck looked to John. We can't let him get away with her. We fire, all hands. He glanced at Peter. Come, boy, John said, towing the youth along. Tis time to learn how to fire a cannon. Beck looked up to Jasper at the helm. Follow no matter what, he yelled. Jasper nodded, watching the large ship start to pull away. Sails up, Beck called. Ready? Fire, he yelled, dropping his hand. The cannons ignited the gunpowder, sending the iron balls flying across, hitting the stern of the bureau. He ran to the bow, his gaze on Eliza where she struggled against Jandot's hold, but the man wouldn't let go. As if the devil knew what was on her mind, Jandot ordered a crewman to tie a thick rope around them, binding them together. Dang it! The shots had started a fire on the bureau, but the men squelched it. Wentworth's galleon was still too far away to help them. All the bureau had to do was sail west and catch the wind blowing south. The Calypso could catch him, but if Wentworth gave up the chase, Eliza would be gone. Nay, I will not let that happen. A canny. He could live without everything in his life except for the one woman who had just sacrificed herself for her brother, her adopted family, and those on board the Calypso, including him. Beck's gaze snapped to the bureau, then to the Calypso, then to the dinghies, and finally to Eliza. Time slowed as his heart hardened. Eliza strained to meet his gaze. There was understanding in it, and he hated that. Damn it all, he would not let her be taken. A sacrifice it all for her. Boom, crack, the bureau fired upon the Calypso. The ball splintered into the side of the ship, the pitch-soaked shot starting a fire. Fire on port, Pip yelled from her spot on the mainmast. Come down now, Beck yelled. The windfield sails snapped and Beck stared with determination, his mind settling on a plan. The wind was changing direction, and he was taking advantage of it. Liam ran over to Beck and Captain John with a bucket of water to put out the small line of flames marking the deck with a black smudge. Nay, Beck said, stopping him. Let it burn. What? Liam asked, confusion over his sweaty face. Get pitch and whiskey. Break open the barrels and run it along the decks in ropes. Bloody what? Liam asked, his mouth hanging open. Beck turned to look out at the slowing bureau. With forty guns, it could blow the Calypso to smithereens, but the weight from all those cannons meant the bureau couldn't outrun his bonny Calypso, especially when there wasn't enough wind to fill its sails. Light the ship and get everyone onto their dinghies. You're sending the Calypso into the bureau? Liam asked. Make the fire infernally hot. I'm taking a flame in hell straight to jean -Lau. He looked back out at the pirate galleon. And then I'm sending jean straight to hell. Captain John grabbed up a torch. Liam started dousing the lines with pitch. The rope would be a path for fire to follow up and into the sails. Beck grabbed a long coil of rope and raced down to the decks below. Everyone off the ship, he yelled to the Englishman. There are dinghies tied to the leeward side. Get the children and Alice off too. The men, used to taking orders, didn't question his plan, and he was thankful. The plan to blow up his beautiful ship was not what he wanted to defend, even if it was a small price to pay for the life of the woman he loved. Loved? Aye, love. Beck ran down another level where twenty barrels of gunpowder sat. Hitting the other ship would make them explode. Once one went off, they would all blow. A floating bomb that would take out the bureau. He just had to make certain that Eliza was off it when it blew. Taking the ladder at a full run, Beck climbed onto the deck. Everyone scattered except Jasper, who steered the ship in an intersecting course with the bureau. He nodded down to Beck, having heard the plan. Bloody good man, Beck murmured, and ran back to help Liam and John finish dousing the lines and barrels on the deck with flaming pitch, its piney tang thick in the changing breeze. Beck looked up to Jasper. Tie the whip staff in that position and get on a boat. Beck turned to Liam and John at the rail. Ye too, get on the ship with Pippa Dandos and Peter. Make sure they get Alan Moore. Adam will figure out what happened if none of us return. Get her back, Captain John said. Beck met his squinted stare. It is the only thing I care about. John nodded, a look of respect in his gaze, and strode toward the back where the dinghies were being lowered and filled. Liam remained. I'm not leaving this ship except to jump across to the burrow and capture that bastard Jean Doe. Liam, go, Beck ordered. Liam shook his head. He stole my life, my family, my friends. 
I will make amends. I must. Then we will swing across together, Beck said, glancing upward at the dangling ropes from the yards above. You go for Jean Dou while I go for Eliza. Liam nodded, determination in his eyes, his lips pulled back in a silent snarl. Blast! Cannon struck the Calypso, jarring Beck and almost knocking him off his feet. Jean Dou must have realised that the lighter, swifter ship would catch him. Did he know yet that it would be a fire ship? The wind fed the flames, helping them to grow along the lines up into the sails. They crackled and popped with the moisture, but the flammable pine pitch carried it along, giving the fire the opportunity to feed and grow despite the sea spray, as the Calypso shot through the waves. His ship was quickly becoming a lit arrow, on course for Jean Dou's black heart. The Calypso was bursting into flames before Eliza's eyes as it sailed towards them. Her heart hammered at the sight of fire licking up the mast. Wicked hell! Had one of the cannonballs that Jean Dou fired hit something flammable? Didn't Beck have buckets of seawater standing about? You said you'd let them go, she yelled at Jean Dou, struggling against the rope tied around her waist like a dog's leash. And yet you fired on them again. They got what they wanted, Jean Dou said, and sucked on his front teeth. His black eyes turned toward her. And I got what I wanted. His hand rose to touch the bare skin along her neck. She couldn't pull away since they were tied together around the waist. The revulsion pulsed through her, making her stiffen. Let them go, she said, as his hand slid down her skin to cup her breast through her tunic. I said they could have Peter, but I didn't say they could stay alive with him. I have a reputation to uphold, he said. A reputation for rape, thievery, and murder, she shot back, no longer able to stand his touch. You rottish fly-bitten barnacle! She raised her hand and slapped him across the face, hard enough to turn his head. Jean Dou's face slowly turned back to her, death in the set of his eyes. He bent closer as she breathed quickly, her heart wild as she waited for his retaliation. If he killed her now, she wouldn't have to endure his touch. His hard face lowered to inches before hers, and she gasped as his hand dropped to her crotch. With a shove, he grabbed her between the legs, her trues the only layer between his hand and the intimate crux of her body. She tried to back away, but he was too strong, holding her there as if he could crush her bones with his hand. I will be sure to live up to my reputation with you, ma fille. She stood there, his hand still dominating her, and shook her head. What would your mother think, Claude Chando? She put all her loathing into her words, her eyes narrowed on him. How her son treats women and girls and children. Such shame you bring to her. She met his rat-like black eyes without blinking. Did he notice the slight tremble she could feel growing inside? His lips rolled back, showing white teeth. Ma mère thought of very little, and did very little but lie on her back and open her legs, which is something you will be doing as soon as I sink this annoying little carrick. Jean Dou dropped his hand from her crotch, his gaze turning to assess the location of the Calypso and the English ship. His jaw was concealed by the raised wool collar of the captain's coat, but she could see the tension in his forehead. The revulsion at Jean Dou's cruel anchoring had bubbled acid up in her stomach, she turned her gaze back to her one hope, Beck. Her breath stopped. Beck and Liam were running about the Calypso's deck with torches, not buckets. Her lips parted on a whispered curse. By the devil's bollocks! Beck was setting his ship on fire. She could see now that the rest of the small crew was gone from the decks, and the ship was sailing on an intersecting course. Un brûlot! one of the pirates yelled. Aye! she said. A fire ship. Fire ships were just like they sounded. Ships set on fire to be sailed directly into the enemy, a lit arrow with tons of gunpowder behind it. Eliza could barely draw breath at the sight. Beck was standing on a ton of gunpowder, surrounded by flames. What was he thinking, the bloody fool? I will not let go. Oh, Beck, she whispered, the words catching in her throat. He was using the only weapon he had left that could stop Jean Dou from taking her away, his beautiful Carrick ship that he had built himself. He'd poured everything that was strong and beautiful within him into it, and he was destroying it. I will not let go. It will hit, a crewman with a nasty scar across his cheek yelled. Jean Dou yelled orders in French. Cannons exploded, hitting the incoming fire ship. Did he think they could sink it before it reached them? Fool. 
There was nothing stopping the flaming arrow flying across the waves. The blazing Calypso was certainly going to hit. The question was, how would she and Beck survive it? Chapter 18 Smoke rose around Beck as plumes of sea spray doused him with each hit. The crack of his mainmast snapped his gaze up ahead. Watch out, he yelled to Liam, as the brittle, wildly flapping sail fell, spewing flames across the deck. Crack, another cannonball hit the side of the Calypso, jolting him. Get ready to jump, Beck yelled, shoving one of the long ropes toward the man. They scrambled up onto the gunnel rail, the wind whipping around them as if God's own hand pushed them toward their target. One, two, three. Just as the bow of the ship hit the side of the Bureau, Beck and Liam jumped forward, hands clasped around the tops of their ropes. The force of Beck's leap, combined with the thrust of the moving ship, sent him flying through the smoke. He hit the Bureau's deck boots first, the impact the same as leaping from a moving horse. The deck around him swarmed with panicked men as the Calypso spread fire to the ship, its bow ramming into the Bureau's port side. Beck ran for the stern, the last place he'd seen Eliza. He was hardly aware of Liam beside him, the two of them dodging pirates who were too concerned with saving their ship to notice. Beck drew his sword. The heft of it felt familiar, an extension of him that sliced through any who stood in his way of saving Eliza. The air, Liam yelled, and the wind shifted the billowing smoke so that he caught sight of her being dragged by Jean Doe toward his cabin. Not one to go back to the hell she'd endured as a girl, Eliza kicked and threw her weight to the deck, nearly pulling the pirate down with her. Trodeau spouted curses in French as he hauled her up, his strength superior to hers. She slapped his hands away. Shite. Beck could see the impact coming as Chanteau raised his fist, slamming it into Eliza's jaw. Nay! Beck yelled. But his word was engulfed by the yells and crackle of fire around him. Eliza crumpled under the punch that would have taken out a man much larger than she. Had he broken her jaw? Her neck? Beck leaped over coiled rope, pushing past two pirates hitting one with the hilt of his sword. Eliza, he yelled, and Jean Doe turned to see him running toward them. He drew the unconscious Eliza before him like a shield, her body slack. You fucking rancid devil, Beck yelled, death on his face. I will slice her throat if you come closer, Trado called out, halting Beck. His arm went out, stopping Liam from his forward run. Beck dragged in gusts of tainted air and Liam coughed on the smoke. Beck blinked against the scorching thickness of it. There was a rope tying Jean Doe and Eliza together loosely around the waist. Beck sheathed his sword and grabbed his own pitakachlish, his fist tight around it next to his side. Eliza, Lord, keep her alive. The shouting behind him grew, but Beck didn't take his eyes away from them. Jean Doe was watching everyone around him, his face grim. You're losing your ship, Jean Doe, Beck called. Leave the woman and help save your own life and those of your men. Jean Doe snarled, his face pinching into fury. If I die, my feet dies with me. Kaboom! The explosion behind Beck threw him toward Jean Doe. Splinters of wood hurtled through the air like arrows, hitting Beck's back where he fell, sprawled out on the deck. He pushed up before he could even decide what had exploded. If it had been the entire amount of gunpowder on the Calypso, they'd all be dead. He leaped to his feet, searing pain against his back. The new bright white tunic he donned for the Duffy wedding was stained and tattered and likely his death shroud. The wind blew enough to scatter the smoke so he could see that Jean Doe and Eliza lay only feet away. Jumping close, he slid his pitakachlish blade through the rope around Eliza's waist. Damn, Scott, Jean Doe said, grabbing for his boot, trying to trip him. Beck yanked his boot back and kicked the pirate in the chest, making him sprawl backward, where Liam jumped on him. But all of Beck's attention turned to the unmoving lass before him. He lifted her into his arms and held the back of his finger near her parted lips. All around him the world had turned into the brimstone and fire of hell, men yelling in panic, flames crackling in the bureau's helpless sails. Yet he waited to feel her breath. Eliza, he said. Eliza! Movement behind her eyelids allowed him to inhale. She was alive. Alive for now. Beck pulled her to his chest and dashed over to the rail. Pirates were jumping into the sea, and Wentworth's ship was barreling down on them as he attempted to pull to the side so as not to slam into his prey and catch a blaze himself. There were no dinghies tied there, but out in the water Beck saw the dinghies from the Calypso. Jasper stood balanced in one, waving both arms. Beck stepped up on the rail. Beck? Eliza asked, her voice strained. He looked down to see confusion on her face, 
her eyes opening to the smoke and chaos around them. He stared at the loveliness of her long eyelashes as she blinked, the smooth skin of her cheeks and her deep grey eyes. I love you, Liza. I love you now and forever. Love? she whispered, staring into his face, the words seeming to wake her fully. He could see the swelling along her jaw where it darkened from Jando's fist. We have to jump, no, he said. Together. She gave a little nod, pulling in a breath, which she coughed on. I, together then. He let her slide down his body until her feet touched the rail. Together, Beck yelled, as the first blast of the explosion blew behind him. It threw them forward toward the dark rolling water, their fingers entwined. Needles of cold made all the muscles in Eliza's body contract. The force of the entry into the sea had torn Beck's hand from hers. Shrugging quickly out of the heavy coat, Eliza kicked hard and used all the muscles in her arms and shoulders to swim upward through the dark water toward the brilliant red and orange light of the flames. Despite the debris hitting the water, she must break the surface, her lungs burning for air. Swim, keep swimming, just a few more feet. Breaking through the surface, Eliza gulped air and coughed on the seawater. Treading water, she turned in a tight circle. Fire raced along the remaining parts of the bourreau, consuming it like a beast eating its catch. Debris tossed on the waves where the heads of Jando's crew bobbed, several of them waving toward the English sheep. Eliza's head snapped around. Beck, she yelled. Beck, where was he? Had he been knocked unconscious by the blast or a piece of debris? Was he sinking into the inky depths below her? Without thinking, Eliza dove underwater, her eyes straining through the darkness. She took a breath and returned, another breath. She squeezed her fingers into her eyes, against the sting of the salt, and dove again. Where was he? Her arms and legs felt heavier each time. She startled as something grabbed her arm, yanking her up to the surface. Spitting out water, she snapped around, shoving wet hair from her eyes. Beck! she screamed, throwing her arms out to catch his neck, nearly pulling him back under as a wave bobbed them up and down. Eliza! he yelled. Damn, I thought I'd lost you. He hugged her close as they both kicked to remain afloat. She felt his warmth through the icy water, wishing to crawl farther into him. She looked around at the mayhem. I thought the plan was to fish me out of the water, but now you're in the same barrel, she said, her chin growing numb. It was getting harder to keep above the waves. His gaze whipped around. Hold on to me. She grabbed his strong shoulders but kicked to help propel them toward a floating piece of a ship's gunwale, broad overlapping boards held together. Hold on this side, he instructed, putting her hands on the edge. Can ye? She nodded and he slowly released her, watching her closely. If one of them slipped under, they would be lost forever. He swam around to the other side of the wooden raft. Try to kick your way up on it while I do the same. The two of us can pull each other out to the water, he said. He waited for her nod. One, two, three. Eliza kicked her numb legs, glad she had on trues. They both lifted, but she couldn't get high onto the board. Beck grabbed her wrists. Kick, Eliza! She took a deep breath, kicking with all her might, and he pulled her up onto the raft, the two of them face to face, breathing heavily. I don't think I've ever been this cold before, she said, her teeth clacking together. Makes me want to climb up into the fire. Beck leaned into her knuckles, breathing out hot air onto her fingers. We need to get to a port. Pushing upward, Eliza saw him look around. She needed to help more, but she was feeling so damn tired the cold stealing her strength. Pinpricks penetrated deeper, the aches spreading into her bones. Eliza, he called, and she blinked, opening her eyes fully. Then I fall asleep. I know, she murmured. I'm just so tired. Tis the cold. I know that. She tried to frown, but couldn't make her face muscles work. They would never make it to her uncle's ship. And that bastard punching you, Beck said against the lapping of the water and yells from the crew. His face was fierce. Where are the children, and Alice, Peter? On dinghies. Her blinks were getting longer. Make sure. Peter's to uncle, the crew. Her words were becoming garbled. Eliza. Beck tugged her hands. The wooden raft wobbled as Beck pulled himself up higher on it, and then pulled her higher. They were balanced on their stomachs in the middle. She felt his hands cup her cheeks. Eliza, don't you dare fall asleep, you hear me? I love you, lass loved her. He'd said that before they jumped, hadn't he? Her eyes opened to search his pinched face. Water weighed down his hair, and the wrinkles of concern cut in his forehead. 
but he was still the most handsome man she'd ever seen. And he loves me. He leaned closer, his warm lips touching hers. He pulled back slightly. I will not let go, Eliza, he said, his hands sliding to her numb arms, rubbing them. The heaviness of the cold water was still making it hard for her to speak, but she wanted him to know. She laid her head down on the planks. I love you, too, she said, unsure if her stumbling words were understandable. But when she opened her eyes, he was staring into them, joy mixed with determination on his face. He'd heard her. It was enough. Where is she? Beck asked, trying to keep his voice below a shout. He pushed up from his stomach where he had been sleeping, feeling all the aches in his muscles as if he'd been beaten. Fire scraped along his back, making him curse as he tried to look over his shoulder. She is safe and well, the woman's voice said low, its cadence nasal with a French accent. Colin and Tor took her back with her Captain John and his crew. Beck focused his gaze on Colin's wife, Rose Duffy, the Lady of Isla Isle. Her dark brown hair, with wisps of silver and her delicate features, belied the strength she knew the MacDonald chief's wife had within her. Jasper had fished Eliza and him out of the sea and onto one of the Calypso's dinghies. Wentworth had taken them all on board, along with the half of the crew of the Bojo that hadn't drowned or died in the explosion. The closest isle with help was Isla, so they'd sailed there, Beck holding on to an unconscious Eliza the whole time. Beck remembered Adam trying to take Eliza from his arms as he carried her down Wentworth's gangplank, but he wouldn't give her up. Once she was inside Dunnyveg Castle, he'd lost consciousness. Why am I still here? Beck asked. Rose Duffy pressed down on his shoulder, pushing him flat, her mouth firm. Because you are burnt on your back. You and Liam McLean are being cared for here at Dunnyveg, on Isla Isle, where I have access to snail slime to heal your scorched skin and the cuts and splinters embedded in it. That explained the flayed feeling across his back. Eliza woke and her Lady Alice, along with Lark, convinced her to return to Wolf Isle to help her family get settled there. He flipped his face toward Rose. She is unhurt. Rose smiled. We, oui. You kept her alive on the water, carried her to safety. She has bruises and sore muscles, but is well. Thank the blessed Lord. Beck closed his eyes for a long moment and felt Rose smoothing something cool on his back. The blasts from the Calypso must have burned him. His terror at trying to keep Eliza afloat and the frigid water had numbed his back. Liam was burnt too, he asked. Oui. Camille is taking care of him with the help of Beatrice. jean will suffer with his burns on the way to London. jean survived? Rose sniffed, frowning. Liam managed to keep Le Cellera alive? She made a face that looked like she'd tasted something bitter. I know much about French pirates, and Chandot is one of the worst. Her hand went to her neck, where there was still a faint scar from long ago. Beck had heard the rumours that she had once been the prisoner of a pirate. Rose wiped her fingers on a cloth. Liam kept him afloat and pushed him on a piece of wood over to Captain Wentworth. Chandot will be hanged from the gallows in London for his crimes against the people of England and Scotland. Young Peter Wentworth accompanied his uncle. I need to return to Wolf Isle. Beck repeated. No. Ton amour will wait for you there, Rose said. A smooth smile crossed her strong mouth. And you will heal here until you are able to walk to her without fever. Would you have her see you so weak? He frowned and only then noticed the chill bumps speckling his skin. Rose continued. Your fever is growing. Give yourself time to fight it. Eliza will not leave before you return. How do you know that? He whispered. What if she left with Captain John? She smiled. Because she loves you too, Highlander. He stared into her eyes, his brow tightly furrowed. She told you, he asked. She did not need to, Rose answered. She covered him gently with a blanket, the weight only tolerable because of the cool slime and bandages over his back. Rest, Highlander. Let the fever few I gave you work, and you will be back on Wolf Isle soon. Beck watched the door close. Eliza had said that she loved him as they clung to each other on the sea. Had she truly meant it? Damn. He must get to Eliza to ask her. Ask her what? She'd said that she would never marry. Could he make her change her mind before she left? Chapter 19 I could get used to this, 
Eliza murmured as she sank into the warm water of the bathing tub that she'd filled in Beck's cottage. Soon her brother Peter would be able to indulge in such luxury at his new estate in England. He said he forgave her, even though John continued to say that there was nothing to forgive. The boy was safe and thankful that his sister had been brave enough to steal a ship and go after him. Eliza cupped her cheeks and exhaled. Would Beck ever forgive her for stealing his ship? I love ye. She'd heard his words, but they seemed like a dream. After two days of rest and warming back up from her sea plunge, she'd been fit to help the men of the Devil's Blood move into cottages in the abandoned village of Ormeg on Wolf Isle. Many of the cottages still needed work, so she'd helped Edgar, Kofi, and Wretch patch roofs on their temporary homes. Captain John was invited to sleep up at the castle until he and the crew mended the masts and sides of their ship. With them all working on it, it wouldn't take more than a week. And then what? Eliza slipped deeper into the water, running the strawberry-smelling soap over her skin. Cullen's wife Rose had promised her that Beck would heal quickly under her care. It had been a week, and all Eliza had heard was that Beck had come through a fever. He'd carry the scars of the fire on his back, the scars that would forever remind him that he'd sacrificed his ship to save her. Eliza dropped the soap and cupped her face in her hands. She owed him her life because if Chanteau had stolen her away, she would have thrown herself overboard as soon as possible, hopefully before any of the bastards could rape her. Just the thought of that icy, life-stealing water made her shiver in the tub. She pulled her knees up to wrap her arms around them, resting her cheek there. Beck, she murmured. I am sorry. Eliza! Beck's voice rang out from the path beyond the cottage walls. It sounded like thunder cracking across a stormy sea sky. Eliza, where are ye? Voices outside seemed to answer him. Eliza thrust herself upward out of the water, making a wave surge over the edge. She was standing knee-deep, dripping and naked with her hair down around her shoulders, when the door slammed open. Beck's large body took up the whole doorway, blocking any onlookers from outside. I'm here, she managed to say. His gaze slid down her wet frame, her nipples, already hard with the coolness of the air, tightened even more with his perusal, as if he'd slid his hands down her skin. Beck stepped inside, and with a flick of his hands the door slammed shut behind him. They stood there opposite each other, he fully clothed in a clean tunic and kilt, his hair and beard clipped short, his muscles still large and straining against his tunic, and she still completely, unabashedly naked. Eliza, he said, the word like a deep exhale, as if he'd been holding his breath. Ye are here. Have been since your brothers brought us back, she said, stepping out of the tub on the side closest to the fire, letting the heat push away the chill in the air and dry the droplets on her skin. She still had fading bruises from the fight, but she wouldn't hide from Beck. He stepped closer, dropping his sheathed sword to the wooden floor. He was as solid as a mountain, the deep thud of his boots falling in cadence with her heart. His hands came up to hold her shoulders, then he slid them up and down her arms like he'd done in the ocean, trying to warm her. I came to find you as soon as I could. A small smile grew on her lips. You have found me. Beck untied his white tunic at the base of his throat and pulled it up and off over his head, leaving his chest bare. She could see fingers of red flesh peeking over his shoulders like a witch's gnarled fingers. Her smile faded. You are in pain, she asked her voice soft. I, from not touching ye. She stepped up to him, her bare feet inches from the toes of his boots. Then touch me, Beck, she whispered. Without another word, his mouth descended to cover hers, strong arms wrapped around her damp body, pulling her against his rugged frame, lifting her under her ass to mould her to his hardness. All thoughts of sacrifice, remorse, leaving, loyalty, and repaying her debt to him, melted away, leaving only want and some deeper emotion. I'm not letting go, she thought, her hands reaching up to capture his face. Beck woke with a start, his hand sliding along the bed. It was empty. Eliza? He sat up, scanning the vacant cottage. Pain flamed along his back, making him grunt. He'd just been dreaming that she had sailed away with Captain John and her crew. Mochrach, he muttered, rising from the rumpled bedding. He'd been home for three days and nights, and he wasn't any closer to asking Eliza to stay with him than he had been on Isla Isle, covered with snail slime. 
He stood, carefully stretching his back where the healing flesh was tight. He would always have a reminder of sacrificing his ship, but that was not what tightened his chest. He'd sacrificed for Eliza, for her life and freedom, and now he wanted to ask her for her life and freedom by marrying him. He scowled as he folded the long length of wool to wrap around his waist. She must know he wanted her to stay with him, for every time he tried to talk with her about her future she'd kiss him until he was speechless, or disappear until she caught him in the darkness, where the only words that fell from his lips had to do with making her scream his name in ecstasy. Eliza must feel obligated to stay with Captain John. Beck tugged his belt closed and tucked his tunic into the low edge. He needs to release her, he murmured, grabbing up his sword to tie it to his waist. Boots and garb in place, he quickly washed and headed out the door. Captain John was the answer. If only Beck could persuade the man to support his cause. Beck nodded to two of Captain John's crew who were working on a roof several cottages down. The man named Edgar, who had been so belligerent in the dungeon when Eliza had called Beck her lover, was planting some flower seedlings in window boxes at the schoolhouse Lark had started. He squinted at Beck and spat as he walked by. At the top of the hill, Beck spotted the masts of the Devil's Blood. It had docked just the night before, having been pulled and guided by Tor's ship across the narrow channel between Mull and Wolf Isle. The sides had been patched and the masts righted with new sails. Only the fittings needed to be secured, and she would be ready to sail again. Beck strode toward Captain John, who stood alone looking at his ship. Is Eliza aboard? Beck asked, a snap to his voice. Was she already moving her things back to the small cabin she kept? John raised an eyebrow. She's in the castle, teaching Alice and Pip how to bake tarts. Beck's shoulders relaxed and he bent forward, propping hands on his knees for a second. He straightened, looking directly into John's eyes. I want to marry Eliza, he said. John sniffed and turned back to his ship, hands clasped behind his back. She knows nothing of marriage. Beck huffed softly. That does no matter. I'm not looking for a usual wife. She wants to sail. She can sail with me once I rebuild the Calypso. Then ask her to wed, John said, still not looking at him. She'll not let me. Beck stared out at the water. Every time I bring up the subject of her future, or our future, she... He wasn't about to tell the man who considered Eliza his daughter exactly what she did to make him lose his mind. She distracts me, uh, disappears. Beck stood with his legs braced for battle. I think she has a notion that she will not give her up, that she saved her and she owes it to ye to stay with ye on the devil's blood. Eliza is free to leave whenever she wishes. Beck stepped before John to force him to meet his gaze. Tell her that, before ye leave all file. Beck glanced toward Guylan, but didn't see anyone except Anders talking to Gavin in the bailey. Would Anders sail with Eliza if she one day took over the devil's blood? Beck turned back to John. She does no need to take over your ship when you die. John took a step to the right and looked outward again. She is free to do whatever she wishes. Damn it, Beck muttered. Then tell her that, for she will not listen to me. Perhaps you need to be louder, John said, sliding his gaze to him, and stop her from distracting you long enough to talk. Beck crossed his arms over his chest. If ye would just order her to stop long enough to hear me out, you may have noticed that Eliza does not take well to having people telling her what to do, John said. Bloody hell. But I have your blessing to ask her, Beck asked. You will let her stay on Wolf Isle if that is what she wants. John kept his gaze outward toward the sea. Aye. Tis a start, Adam said inside the great hall and shook Liam McLean's hand. Tor McLean stood with them, as did Callum and Droston. I was an ignorant fool, Liam said, and I'm heartily sorry. I know Jean Dor will sail to England on Wentworth's ship to be hanged like the pirate dog he is. And then burn in hell, Eliza murmured, from where she stood in the dark archway from the kitchens. She'd left Alice and Pip there, along with two of the girls who were staying with Gersel on the south side of the aisle. Jasper was teaching them all to carve an apple to look like a rose. She strode quickly past the men on her way to the castle door. She wore her sailing trews and jacket, her hair pulled back in a simple tie. She'd snuck out of Beck's cottage before dawn to talk to Captain John, but he'd been busy inspecting the new masts of the Devil's Blood. Perhaps now he was free, for she needed his advice. 
Peeking out through the open doors of the keep, she saw Beck striding across the bailey toward her. With a tiny gasp, she slid up against the wall behind the open door and held her breath. Beck strode by, determination in the swing of his arm, his other one resting on the hilt of his sword. As soon as he'd passed, she ducked out, hurrying across the bailey past the half-dead willow tree that snapped its tendrils at her. She paused, glancing at the knife stuck into its trunk, sap leaping out darkly, as if it bled. Shaking her head, she kept going. Captain John, she called as she got close to where he stood, hands behind his back, staring at the devil's blood. He nodded to her. Eliza? Glancing behind her, she didn't see Beck. Good. She needed to talk to Captain John without him overhearing. She opened her mouth several times before anything came out. Are we to sail soon? Aye, John said. Perhaps on the morrow if the tide's in wind are right. On the morrow? She paused. Some of the men seem like they're setting up to live in Ormeg. Tis their choice. Eliza looked toward the village where the sounds of hammering had begun. And Alice wishes to remain. She has a fondness for Gavin MacLean. I think Pip and Hester will stay too, and as though we'll likely sail with the devil's blood. Captain John gave one nod and then glanced at her. And you? Her hands went to cover her face, slowly rubbing the tension there. I owe you my life, Captain. You and the crew. No one owes a life to anyone. I saved you as a girl. You saved me from the gallows. That Macquarie lad saved you from the ocean. John shrugged. Life is too short to give it away to someone because you think you owe it to them. He paused and exhaled long. You do not need to sail with the devil's blood. She dropped her hands. You would have me leave the ship. You said... You said you would not let go of me. She whispered, her chest squeezed, but she wasn't sure if it was from worry, sadness, or hope. Captain John turned his whole body toward her, his sharp gaze connecting with hers. If you wish to leave the devil's blood, I will survive. He allowed himself a subtle smile. Her brows pinched. I have always been part of the crew. He was letting her go? Beck had said he loved her when they were nearly drowning. She knew he wanted her to stay. Did she want to? Questions swirled around in her head, making her queasy. I don't know how to be anything else. Her words became whispers. You are you, Eliza. Just be you. And anything you wish to learn, you will. His eyes turned back to the ocean. Climbing, swimming, steering a ship, baking, throwing a dagger. Apparently tupping. He pressed a hard kiss on her forehead, and then stared down into her eyes, his hands cupping her shoulders. You're my daughter, Eliza, not by blood, but in spirit. And like other honourable fathers, I wish you well, even if that means you find your happiness elsewhere. The devil's blood will always be your home, and... He swallowed. Tis true I am not letting you go. In here, he said, and thumped a fist against his heart. Eliza swallowed, blinking past the tears she felt pressing behind her eyes. She threw herself into his arms, and her father held her tight, saying nothing. I love you too, she whispered and inhaled, finally stepping back. I... I need to think. A small smile cracked his usual stoic frown. Aye, you do. She turned on her boot heel to stride. Where? Toward the castle where she knew Beck was looking for her? or toward the forest to evade him again. She could feel Captain John's gaze on her back, watching her hesitate. Swallowing hard, she stepped toward the castle. There you are, Beck called as he strode out under the raised portcullis. She stopped, letting him walk up to her. By the devil, he was so rugged and wickedly handsome. Below his traditional plaid, which sat low on his narrow waist, she could see the muscles in his legs. His tunic was white and stretched across his brawny biceps as his arms moved along his sides. His usual smile was replaced by a look of frustration and intensity. She tipped her face up to meet his gaze when he stopped before her. They stared at one another. I spoke to Captain John, Beck said. I just spoke. Her voice trailed off and she frowned. Why? Because I wanted to make sure he knew I wanted you to stay and to ask permission to wed you. Her throat tightened, making it hard to inhale fully. What did he say? That it was up to ye. She waited, but he seemed to not know what to say next. 
Is this your proposal? I, nay, he said, his face tight. He grabbed the back of his neck. I dunno know what you want, Eliza. What do you want? she asked, her voice rising. Ye, damn it, I want ye, Eliza, his voice rose to match hers. They stood within inches of each other. I've been trying to tell you that for the last three days, but every time I tried to talk with you, you kiss me. You didn't seem to mind, she threw back. Yelling felt good. Fighting was something she knew. Well, I'm done with not talking, he said. Peck, one of his brothers yelled from the bailey, but he ignored them. Fine, she said. Then we talk. She crossed her arms. I am sorry you sacrificed your ship for me, but I don't owe you my life. Lives are too short to owe them to someone. His stormy grey eyes narrowed. I don't want you to owe me a life. Lord, Eliza, I want you to love me, not owe me, because I bloody love ye. Beck, you need to see this, her brother jogged out of the bailey. Beck held out a hand toward him, palm out, but didn't leave her gaze. He took hold of her shoulders. When he swung across to the burrow, Beck shook his head. Um, I couldn't breathe, Eliza. I thought I was losing ye. I gladly gave up the calypso. It would mean nothing without ye. His hand came up to cup her cheek, and she held her breath. He owe me nothing except an answer to my question. His voice lowered as he stared into her eyes. You will slay me with a simple knee. The warmth drew her as much as the emotion in his words. Ask your question, then, she whispered. Beck, come see. Ye too, lass. Rabbi wobbled up and grabbed Beck's arm. All of Beck's brothers came briskly up around them. Are you with child? Droston asked her. Eliza's gaze snapped to him. What? That was not the question she was waiting for. Callum tugged Beck's arms and Beg caught hers as his brother ushered them into the bailey. Glancing over her shoulder, she saw that Captain John followed. They headed toward the willow tree where Lark stood with Alice, Hester on her hip, Pip, Anders, and Gavin. She may not know yet, Rabbi said. Have you had your woman's flocks? What? she repeated. Are you two getting married? Adam asked, his sharp perusal on her. Well, they better, Rabbi all but yelled. It is bad enough we have a bunch of pirates staying on Wolf Isle, most of them bastards, but ye will not be making any. The man dropped his hold to hurry toward the willow tree. Might as well rename Wolf Isle the Isle of Bastards, the old man yelled back. My God, Beck murmured, his gaze on the dancing limbs of the tree. The little green buds that Eliza had seen on the dead-looking limbs had begun to open. The brothers and Rabbi, and even Lark, all looked bewildered. The buds are opening? Lark said, coming to her side. They haven't done that for a hundred years, since the curse was placed on the Macquarie clan. Eliza stared at her blankly, Lark smiling. The buds formed when Adam and I wed? It was just before you wed, Callum said. Lark squeezed her hand. I'm guessing that you and Beck have just decided to wed, making the buds open. Eliza shook her head. He hasn't asked me. Lark snorted. He has a million times in his head, no doubt. Highlanders have trouble with the words. Beck and his brothers had gathered before the tree. Adam wouldn't let them touch it, but he prodded a limb closer with his sword so they could all see the unfurling leaf. Lark leaned in. But it all depends on what is in your heart, she whispered near Eliza's ear. What was in her heart? Eliza owed Beck nothing except an answer to a question he forgot to ask. Captain John had said, I won't let go, to her long ago. Beck had said the same words to her before she flew across to Jean Doe, and now she had an answer. I won't let go either, she called out, looking to Beck. Faces turned toward her, but she only saw the intense grey eyes of the man she realised that she truly loved. I won't let go. Tis my answer, the one I owe you. To what question? About wedding? Rabbi asked, and Lark shushed him. You forgot to ask, Eliza said to Beck. As he stared at her from the tree, his mouth opened, but nothing came. She cleared her throat. So, I will ask, will you marry me, Beckett Macquarie? Will you marry me and not let go? As if breaking free from ice, Beck pushed through the small crowd. The crease between his brows smoothed when he stopped before her. His gaze was intense as he looked down into her face. I will never let go of ye, Eliza Wentworth Pritchard. The answer to your proposal is I... A smile grew on Eliza's mouth, and she laughed as a tear broke from her eye. She wiped it with a finger, and Beck pulled her into him. 
I love you, now and forever, he said. I love you too, Beck. Her eyes closed as he lowered his face to hers. His lips were warm and met hers with equal pressure. With her arms encircling each other, Eliza hardly noticed the Macquarie shouting, Huzzah! and the children laughing around them. All thoughts melted into one simple truth. She loved and was loved, freely and completely, and neither of them would ever let go. This concludes The Highlander's Pirate Lass by Heather McCollum, narrated by Timothy Campbell. Copyright 2021 by Heather McCollum. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Entangled Publishing, LLC, through Rights Mix, LLC, and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Thank you.